Well, good morning and welcome to everyone. Today we have a really exciting program of talks on different aspects of research on infection in Imperial. It's important to emphasize that while we've tried to represent uh, many different disciplines, by the very nature of such a multidisciplinary enterprise, it's impossible to include everyone in this first symposium. We are looking forward to holding not only the regular uh, weekly seminar, which is at one o'clock on Fridays, but a series of focused workshops together with other centers in Imperial, notably uh, climate change and the CMBI and other centers in order to focus the discussion on particular aspects of the interdisciplinary work. Just a couple of ha brief housekeeping notes. Please keep your microphone muted and make sure that you don't uh, have any pings or dogs barking or other off stage noises. Please put any questions you have in the chat and they will be moderated by the chair. There will be an, uh, maybe an opportunity for short questions at the end of each talk if time allows, but we have a full program, so uh, please keep them to a minimum. There will, however, as you see on the program, be a short uh, question and answer session, again, time allowing, at the end of each of the four sessions. So thank you again to the chairs and speakers for agreeing to take part in what we're really looking forward to, a very exciting day. And I'd like to hand over to Ramesh, who is chairing the first session. Over to you, Ramesh. Thank you, Charles, uh, and good morning, everyone. I am uh, very delighted to welcome you to the first session of what promises to be a very thrilling day filled with scientific talks showcasing the tip of the iceberg of infection research at Imperial. Now, our first, first speaker is um, Dr. Athenia Georgiadu. Um, Athenia is an Imperial College Research Fellow in the Department of Infectious Disease in the Faculty of Medicine. Um, and Athenia is a parasitologist and she works on pediatric malaria. Her particular interest is on understanding the role of hyperlactatemia um, in, in disease progression and death um, in, in, in pediatric malaria, malaria patients. And the title of her talk today is Understanding Malaria Pathogenesis. Um, so over to you, Athenia. Hello, everyone. Um, thank you very much for the introduction. Uh, so thank you also to the organizers uh, for allowing me to present today um, my work on our work on understanding malaria pathogenesis. So that's what I'll try and do in the next 10 minutes, give you a little taster of the different projects we work on. So first of all, uh, what is malaria? So malaria is an infectious disease caused by the parasites of the genus Plasmodium. It's transmitted to humans by the female Anopheles mosquito. Um, it still claims uh, more than 400,000 uh, lives per year, and that's unfortunately mainly children under the age of five. Uh, there are five species known to cause uh, human malaria, with Plasmodium falciparum being the deadliest one. So moving on to Malaria pathogenesis, which is uh, quite complex, uh, and it's due to uh, both host and parasite factors, and of course due to the interaction between the host and the parasite. Um, one of the main and um, most important features of the parasites um, leading to detrimental effects for the host is its ability to cytoadhere on the surface of the endothelium, and this is what we call sequestration. So sequestration together with uh, microvascular obstruction, uh, hemolysis, endothelial activation, excessive local inflammation and tissue hypoxia can all lead to uh, multiple organ dysfunction, including organs such as the brain, the lungs, the liver, the kidneys and the spleen. And there are three main uh, severe malaria syndromes, uh, which are cerebral malaria, acute respiratory distress uh, or hyperlactatemia, and severe anemia. So what we did to try and understand why do people die? So why do some people get severe disease while others get uncomplicated uh, malaria? Uh, was to use a transcriptomic approach. Uh, so using whole blood RNA sequencing uh, from Gambian children who either had severe or uh, uncomplicated malaria, uh, we identified a really strong neutrophil signature associated with severe disease. Uh, and this was after adjusting for variation in the leukocyte proportions. 
So neutrophils are a really important cell type. They are the first responders uh, when the host gets um, an infection. Um, they have all these different ways of trying to tackle any pathogen from phagocytosis to degranulation to netosis. And one would think this sounds fantastic for the host, right? Uh, and yes, they would be right. This is usually the case. Um, however, sometimes uh, neutrophils can also act like tiny hand grenades uh, and cause excessive um, damage to the host together with the pathogen. So I will show you briefly three different scenarios, one good and two bad scenarios, where in the first good one, uh, actually neutrophils help the host. Um, so combining uh, mathematical modeling and transcriptomics to identify correlates of protection, we found cathepsin Z and MMP9 and their encoding proteins uh, do actually inhibit parasite growth. And they do this uh, following different mechanisms. So MMP9 can directly inhibit parasite growth, while cathepsin Z um, is able to cleave uh, most of the known receptors on the surface of the red blood cell, which are really important for the parasite invasion. Uh, following to the uh, bad scenario where neutrophils weren't that great for the host, uh, we had uh, the fantastic opportunity to work with people from the University of Liverpool and University of Malawi and get access to this uh, fantastic cohort of uh, post-mortem samples from uh, Malawian children who had um, uh, fatal plasmodium falciparum uh, cerebral malaria and uh, their comparators which had non cerebral malaria. Um, and what we found was excessive netosis um, in the cerebral cases. And as you can see here on the right, um, we have a 3D reconstruction of a tiny capillary from one of the cerebral cases, um, where you see nets appear as a glue-like formation, trapping uh, parasites, which are able, you're able to, to see, uh, sorry, as a blue dot. Um, so you can imagine this capillary probably doesn't offer the optimal blood flow for um, the host. Following to the next one, we use the same samples. And in this uh, case, we examine these for uh, matrix metallopeptidase 8 expression and other neutrophil uh, protease. Um, and what we found was um, significant um, expression of MMP8 in the retinal capillaries of the cerebral cases again. And this was strongly associated with fibrinogen uh, leakage and so vascular um, leak. Um, and staying on the topic of uh, vascular uh, leakage and um, endothelial activation, I should briefly mention a project we do on endothelial glycocalyx. So this is a structure made of um, glycoproteins and glucosaminoglycans, uh, and it's found on top of endothelial cells. It's there to protect them from the circulating components. And we thought this is really interesting because recently um, the breakdown of glycocalyx was associated with severe disease and fatal outcome in uh, plasmodium um, fast pyro malaria. So together with colleagues from other departments, um, Dr. Adrian Aker and Professor Molly Stevens from the Department of Materials and also Professor Jake Baum from Life Sciences, we got a collaborative grant from Imperial to work on this uh, collaboratively with LKC School of Medicine in Singapore. Uh, so we would like using uh, this grant to understand what's the, um, what's the association between glycocalyx breakdown and uh, pathogenesis, and also try to restore uh, the damaged glycocalyx using nanoparticles. So to do that, we would of course need a, a model that actually shows glycocalyx degradation similar to what we see in humans with uh, severe malaria. And uh, thankfully, we were able to identify that mice infected with um, lethal uh, plasmodium ulei uh, rodent strain um, do actually get um, quite severe loss of glycocalyx compared to uninfected control mice. And before I finish, I should say a few things uh, about my ICRF fellowship, for which I'm focusing on hyperlactatemia, which, as I mentioned at the beginning, is one of the uh, most severe syndromes seen in severe malaria. And high lactate is one of the strongest and independent predictors of death in both pediatric and adult cases. 
The problem until now was um, trying to understand the syndrome. There wasn't any uh, available animal model for this. So I screened uh, five of the most commonly used um, mouse models in malaria and um, Excitingly, um, we found that uh, mice infected with the lethal Plasmodium uelii 17XL strain not only develop really high lactate levels, similar to what we see in human um, hyperlactatemia, but also are the closest mouse model to the human uh, hyperlactatemia phenotype at the transcriptomic level. So the cause of hyperlactatemia remains unknown. Uh, although there are a few different mechanisms that could be involved, such as parasite load, uh, reduced oxygen delivery due to microvascular obstruction and or anemia, and immune metabolic shift of host immune cells uh, to aerobic glycolysis, and also uh, failure in the clearance of lactate. Um, so with this fellowship, what I would like to do is to understand what leads to high lactate, how is this associated to pathogenesis? Uh, can we do something to reverse this? And ultimately, is this is actually high lactate a simple consequence or is it the cause of death? So to briefly conclude, uh, malaria is still um, a disease of um, public global health um, importance and it has a really complex pathogenesis. So what we have crystallized out of the, these different projects I showed you today is that following an interdisciplinary approach is actually key to try and understand uh, such diseases. So I think it's really exciting to be part of the new Institute of Infection because I think this is really going to catalyze uh, a lot of collaborative and interdisciplinary uh, work. And with that, I should thank everyone um, in our group, Dr. Aubrey Cunnington, everyone else uh, in the group, lots of who did uh, bioinformatics analysis, uh, all the lovely students we've had in the past, um, everyone else involved um, as internal and external collaborator, and of course you for listening. Thank you very much. Thank you, Atenia. Um, so we have about uh, three minutes left for any pressing questions, um, which if you have, um, please put them put them in the chat. Um, but uh, very briefly, m maybe I, I can I can ask a question to Atenia. We, 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 we heard about um, the discussions yesterday. Um, there was there was there was there was um, I, I believe uh, Wendy and, 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 and Charles brought up this point about genetic predisposition for 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 infections um, starting with COVID. So, with respect to um, uh, uh, hyperlactatemia in 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 pediatric patients, is is there any kind of genetic predisposition to, to towards severity of disease? Thank you very much for the question. I think it's uh, what a lot of people in our section do actually. Um, so. What we found is that there is a really significant neutrophil uh, signature coming up, and this is after adjusting, as I said, for the variation in the leukocyte proportions. So with this RNA sequencing, we didn't just do uh, just follow an expensive way of showing that you get an upregulation of uh, neutrophils. It is actually indeed an upregulation in the transcription of these genes. Um, but I think this varies between different diseases. In malaria, this is the main finding that we had. And this also, just to briefly mention, because I didn't have time to explain more about the uh, mouse versus human host uh, that we have done as well for malaria, trying to identify what is the appropriate model. Uh, we do see the same um, really strong signature um, in uh, the mouse model that I showed was the closest to most of the human um, severe phenotypes actually. Thank you. Thank you, Athena. So I'm, I'm sure there'll be, there'll be plenty of questions um, later on um, at the end of this end of this session. Um, so with, with that, uh, we'll move on to the to, 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 to our next speaker. Um, our, our next speaker is um, Professor Crystal Donnelly. Um, Crystal is based um, in, in the School of Public Health in the Faculty of Medicine. Uh, her interests um, lie in the development and application of um, statistical and, and biomathematical, bi biomathematical um, methods to analyze the epidemiology of infectious diseases 
and she has done so in the context of um, uh, Ebola, TB, uh, MERS, um, influenza, to 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 name the few. Um, from the title of um, from the title of her talk, I, I believe today she will be telling telling us about how she has applied expertise to understand the COVID-19 epidemic in the context of, of the REACT study, um, which for those of you who don't know, this is a, a Department of Health and Social Care uh, Commission study to understand the prevalence of COVID-19 um, in, in, in the population and, um, and advise the government um, uh, uh, decisions and policies accordingly. Um, hence, um, Crystal's talk is today's understanding COVID-19 epidemic uh, through the lens of the um, REACT study. Uh, over to you, Crystal. Thank you very much. Yes, so um, although I'm one person speaking today, I'm really representing uh, a massive uh, effort and, and team uh, that are behind this. So there are quite a few people at Imperial, uh, but also more widely we're interacting and working very hard with Ipsos Mori, who are um, organizing a lot of the logistics that have to um, go on. And as I explain the study, you'll see the scope of what it is. Um, this is, it, we have, um, some funding by NIHR that helps uh, fund some of us through grants, including the HPRUs, but co um, REACT specifically, as you mentioned, is funded by the Department of Health and Social Care, and it's in support of the NHS and the government more widely. Uh, in terms of scope, um, this is focused on England, so all of the things that I'm going to be talking about are within England. Um, obviously, it would be great to have this uh, throughout the UK, but that's the scope of the REACT study as it currently stands. Um, so there's this website which will tell you even more than I have a chance to today about the REACT study and all these different aspects. So when pulling this talk together, I realized very quickly that I couldn't cover um, anywhere near the breadth of what we do. Um, or I'd be talking way too fast. So I'm going to focus on what's called the REACT-1 study mainly with a few mentions of other aspects, but do feel free to um, go to this website and learn more about the different studies that are ongoing. So REACT-1 is a, an assessment of community transmission in the form of um, testing for swab positivity. So about, uh, more than 150,000 people across England are approached and asked if they want to take part in the study. And then um, if they say yes, then they're sent out a swab kit. Um, the exact methods of, of handling of the swabs has changed a little bit uh, a couple of times over the course of the study, uh, but predominantly what happened was the it's all self-administered. So the swab is self-administered or for children, um, a parent or a carer can do it. Um, and then it's kept in the refrigerator. A courier would come and collect it and maintain the uh, cold chain as it went to the lab. And then the samples are tested for uh, by PCR for virus. So we're um, looking at testing to see what the prevalence of infection is. There's there's another component, mainstream component of REACT, which is REACT2, and that is also a self-administered test, but this is a lateral flow immunoassay, so it's testing for IgG antibodies, and so this is self-administered so that it's a finger prick sample of blood, um, goes into this, and the person gets a readout of whether or not um, they're found to have these um, SARS-CoV-2 antibodies. And so the estimate was for the sensitivity of that was about 84 percent um, and specificity of over 98 percent. Now the um, 84 percent was in uh, healthcare workers that self-administer it, but there's very clear instructions uh, both written and with a video that people can watch on both aspects of this um, research. Now this is um, a separate, well it's run in parallel, but there are separate rounds of REACT-1 and REACT-2. They're not going to the same people. So um, they're independent samples in that case. Um, and we have a number of rounds that take place across England. So it's, people are sent information. They can go on the web, see what's going on with the study. There's uh, also um, helplines and things that they can ask questions of if they have questions. So I'm going to focus now on REACT-1. This gives you an indication of the massive scale of this study. So 
um, adding all these together over the course of 13 rounds, which is how many uh, we've had the results published from, we've actually undertaken sampling for a 14th round, uh, watch this space for results. But if we focus on rounds one to 13, it was 1.9 million tests. These are um, swabs that have been tested. Out of those, about 8,300 positives. And so that gives an unweighted um, prevalence over the course of that of 0.4%. But if you look over the range of these um, different rounds, and you can see the dates there on the right, um, this peaked uh, with the highest uh, prevalence that we saw just after Christmas, and we had a round, that, so we missed um, the, the Christmas period in um, 2020. But just as New Year started, then we had um, this eighth round, and we found the prevalence um, unweighted overall was more than 1%. Um, that's only twice that we've had prevalence estimated to be over 1%. But then, we, of course, you know, we have so many samples, then we can look at how this varies over um, both over time within rounds, between rounds, and also with different subgroups. So this shows um, the react swab positivity over the course of 2020 for the rounds that we did. So you see here that we have seven rounds over the course of 2020. The first react one uh, round started in the beginning of May 2020. So as we were coming out of the first uh, wave of COVID-19 within the UK and England specifically. And so you can see that we get a clear um, downward trend in that first round. Then we had low prevalence throughout the summer. It, you know, then we had in August, it was eat out to help out. And then we had people going back to school. Um, and then we saw the second wave of uh, prevalence increasing. Now, what's brilliant about um, being able to look at these trends within React, although we do have gaps between the different rounds, is that we can look at the trends separate from test seeking behavior, separate from availability of tests. And you know, now it's test twice a week, then it was test only if you have symptoms and so on. So it's regardless of that, this is going through the same protocol of taking a random sample across England um, and looking at their prevalence. So yeah. it should be comparable across this course. Now, um, I mentioned then we had, you know, we saw in the very um, end of the year, then we got this sudden upturn. Um, we then have a gap where we don't have any React samples over the Christmas period. But then if we look over the past year, so we see again this upturn um, in the end of November, beginning of December, then we have a gap. But even this is when we had that highest prevalence where it was over 1% both here in January and back in uh, the end of October. Since then, it's come down to we had um, low prevalence in uh, through April, May, June, and now um, we've seen it start to pick up um, through July. Now, within this we can look as you see within rounds because I pointed out that first round in May 2020 we saw a very clear drop. Sometimes we look at specific rounds. So this was through round um, 13. So sometimes we look at trends, look at the growth rates, for example, across the last two rounds where we saw a clear increase in both rounds 12 and 13. But we can also look at other details. For example, the positives are sent um, for sequencing to try and determine uh, what uh, if we have any variants or if it's the um, wild type, and we see very clearly here um, an increase in the, you know, until almost completely delta uh, by July. So we see the increase um, across here in April, May, June, and it's just, you know, a sudden shift from having relatively little delta to having a lot of it across England. One of the key comparisons we can do is to look at not just the um, positivity within the samples, but also how they compare to deaths. And this was looking, so the deaths are shown, these are on log scale, so the scale is shifted, but you can see that with the red line, that shows um, a scaled and shifted by, in this case, 26 days. 
um, the deaths in England compared to the prevalence in React. And you see quite a remarkable um, following of the same trends, except that here we see now the deaths are um, lower. And so this the suggestion is that that would be um, due to the effectiveness of vaccination, in particular the rollout of vaccination first in the highest risk groups. Um, we see less of a difference uh, below when we do the same thing with hospitalizations, although the best shift for that is 20 days as opposed to 26. Um, but it's quite striking that even in this uh, method, this sort of indirect way of looking at vaccine impact, that we can do that. Uh, we look, can look at heterogeneity by age groups and okay, so um, geographically. It's one minute left. Thank you. Okay. Yep. And so then I wanted to, um, yes, so there's heterogeneity that we can see across there. I wanted to thank um, the many people that I work with. So this is the authorship of the round 13 final report. So drawing out it, people who played key roles at Ara Darzi, um, particularly in helping us get this whole thing off the um, on the road, um, Paul Elliott, Stephen Riley, and many colleagues that you see here. So, uh, with the time allowed, I haven't been able to explain everything, but you can find out more here. There's an um, and also a React long COVID study. So React one and two are the main ones, uh, but there are more. So you can find out more there. Thank you very much. Thank you, Crystal, uh, and, and there'll be um, op opportunities at the end um, to, 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 to discuss uh, and ask Crystal more, more, more questions on, on this topic. Um, on that note, can I, can I please remind um, the audience that um, any questions um, can be posed via the question and answer um, tab um, on, on your browsers um, as opposed to the chat button, which is, which is, which is different. So, so if you have any questions, please, please put them in, on, on, in, the, in the question and answer, on answer um, tabs. Right. Um, our next next speaker is um, Dr. Anna Bernard. Um, Anna is a Work and Trust um, Sir Henry Dale Fellow in the Department of Chemistry in the Faculty of Natural Sciences. Um, she's a chemist by training, and her research um, focuses on the on the on, on the use of chemical tools to probe and inhibit protein protein interactions in key biological um, reactions. Um, today, I believe she'll be talking about how she'll be using uh, expertise to study and disrupt the interaction between um, a toxin and its cognate antitoxin, um, which are prevalent in bacteria and, and they're implicated in how bacteria escape antibiotic therapy and uh, perhaps also um, uh, evolve antibiotic resistance. So um, the title of Anna's talk is Chemical Tools to Study um, Toxin Antitoxin Interactions. Over here to, over, over to you, Anna. Anna, you're muted. Oops, where's my presentation gone? Okay. Sorry about that. <laughs> so thank you very much for, for the introduction, Ramesh, and the opportunity to speak to you today about some of the work that we've been doing in my group um, to develop tools to study um, toxin antitoxin interactions, which are implicated in um, the development of uh, persisters within infectious bacteria. And this is a method that bacteria can use to survive antibiotic treatment and environmental stress. So when you have a, a population of replicating bacteria that's then exposed to an environmental stress, including an antibiotic, then they will generate a small um, dormant um, phenotypic variant known, a uh, small population of phenotypic variants known as persisters. And in these persisters, um, key molecular mechanisms which govern um, rapid replication are switched off, which means that they're able to survive quite extensive antibiotic treatment. And crucially, once the environmental stress or the antibiotic is removed from the system, these persisters can uh, revert back to a normal growing phenotype and re-establish the original population. And this um, is one of the underlying causes of, of recurrent infection. And this also necessitates repeat courses of antibiotics to clear what is essentially the same infection. And this contributes to the development of treatment failure through um, the development of genetic resistance. 
So as our group focuses on protein-protein interactions, we're particularly interested in understanding um, the protein-protein interactions that are thought to govern the formation of persisters, which occur between um, toxin proteins, which uh, switch off key molecular mechanisms within the bacteria, and their natural inhibitor proteins, the antitoxins. So in response to the environmental stress, the antitoxin is either um, not expressed or degraded, allowing the toxin to generate uh, this dormant phenotype. So we're interested in salmonella bacteria, in which there are 14 different toxin-antitoxin pairs, and work by our collaborators, uh, Sophia Lane's group, showed that when you knock down the toxin-antitoxin pair that occurs between the toxin DOC and the antitoxin PHD, you see a significant decrease in the number of persisters within salmonella. So we were interested in studying this protein-protein interaction initially. Um, and the way that this um, acts is that DOC is a toxin and it's, uh, it, it's a, a kinase and it phosphorylates an elongation factor, EFTU, which switches off protein translation to initiate that dormant state. And it's inhibited by the antitoxin PHD. So what we wanted to try to do was to see if we could study this interaction using um, some antitoxin mimics uh, made from peptide fragments, see if we could understand this interaction in a bit more detail, uh, its role in persistence with ultimately the, the idea of, of developing chemical tools that could um, inhibit or reverse persistence in salmonella. So in order to do this, we had to have access to the proteins that are involved in this process. And expressing and purifying toxin proteins is extremely challenging. And DOC is no ex exception to this. When we overexpress um, the toxin in E. coli, then we switch off bacteria growth and we're unable to um, access, access significant amounts of protein. We can knock out the histidine that's responsible for the kinase activity, which gets us back to normal growth conditions. But unfortunately, this protein is completely insoluble. We tried many different things to be able to access toxin protein. And in the end, the solution that we came up with was to exploit the natural mechanism by which DOC um, acts as a toxin. So what we do is we overexpress DOC at the same time as overexpressing an EFTU mutant, where we knock out the phosphorylation site with either an alanine or a valine. And this, after a bit of a lag time, gets us back up to um, the same kind of growth that we have with no uh, expression at all. This means that we see um, DOC overexpression for the first time in, in our gels, and we can monitor the phosphorylation of EFTU just using an alpha phosphorylene antibody. In order to um, purify the protein, we had to optimize the procedure a little bit because we found using all of the normal steps for uh, recombinant protein expression, we still expose the bacteria too much to, to the kind of leaky toxin expression that we see at the beginning of this growth curve. So what we've done is removed a lot of the steps and we just go straight um, from the competent cells to a large scale expression and purify from there. And this gives us um, a very reproducible and um, reasonable yielding expression system for isolating active toxin protein, which is quite important for the experiments we want to do that I'll show later. So we then wanted to characterize the interaction in a bit more detail. So this is a crystal structure from um, a related complex in bacteriophage P1. And from this, we built a homology model using just the C-terminal domain of PHD that interacts um, with DOC to look at the salmonella interaction. We made a series of um, of peptides based on this uh, C-terminal domain in order to study the, the interaction in more detail. And the first thing that we did was to, to measure um, the stability of the complex um, when it's formed. So we, we did this initially using um, melting curve um, measurements, where we measure the melting curve of, of DOC using um, differential scanning fluorimetry to be about 45 degrees. And in the presence of the C-terminal peptide, we see an enormous melting curve uh, shift of almost 30 degrees. And this is, was indicative to us of an extremely high affinity protein-protein um, interaction. It took us a while to be able to actually measure the KD because it was such high affinity. And, if, and we were able to do this ultimately using SPR, where we immobilize the dock onto a surface and flow over um, peptides corresponding to the PHD uh, C terminus. Um, we fit this using single cycle kinetics and we've uh, got for the wild type interaction a KD of about 70 picomolar, which is incredibly high affinity and it is certainly the highest affinity interaction that I've ever worked with. So we wanted to, to characterize which of the amino acids were responsible for this extremely high affinity. 
So we carried out an aniline scan where along this sequence of 23 amino acids, we exchanged each amino acid sequentially for alanine to look at the impact of, of each individual amino acid. And we see examples such as this leucine, where once we change that to um, an alanine, we see a significant decrease in the binding affinity. And this is what we would characterize to be a hotspot. And um, along the PhD sequence, we have six hotspot residues, and you can characterize these into two categories, really. We've got the kind of uh, medium hotspots, um, these three, which cause an order of magnitude decrease in binding affinity. But then we have these three that cause us even further decrease in binding affinity where we're getting down to double digit nanomolar affinity. We can replicate uh, this with our melting curve analysis where we see some intermediate um, shifts in um, the stabilization, which is quite nice to see. And also we can validate our homology model in that um, all of these residues point towards the binding interface um, with DOC. Um, so that was quite nice. But uh, Kind of binding affinity is not um, everything and we wanted to be able to exploit the fact that we'd isolated active toxin to measure the activity of, um, of each of our peptides and see what the influence was um, of each of the residues on the neutralization ability of PhD. So we compared um, initially the activity of the full length recombinant antitoxin with our wild type peptide sequence. And we do this using a dot blot assay where we're just blotting for uh, phosphorylation of, of EFTU. And we see that we see the same um, neutralization for the full length protein as we do for the peptide, which is um, a nice validation of using peptides to measure um, this, these parameters. And when we looked at um, the ability of, of our alanine mutants to neutralize um, the toxic activity of DOC, we found that um, actually the affinity doesn't really correlate with the activity, which is something we weren't expecting to see. And in particular, we see that this phenylalanine and this leucine, which are the kind of um, C and N terminal um, hotspots, if you like, um, are responsible for. Anna, to be one minute, please. Okay, a lot of the activity um, of the the peptides. So we see um, significant loss of activity when we mutate these, whereas some of the um, residues that are responsible for more of the affinity um, have less of an effect. And what's really nice is we can replicate this uh, when we express these peptides in salmonella bacteria, where we see exactly the same effect with these um, residues for the, um, in salmonella. So to conclude, we, um, toxin antitoxin um, interactions play a role in bacterial persistence, and we've been studying a particular um, interaction doc PhD. We've developed a novel method to express and purify the wild type protein. And we've used this to characterize the interaction for the first time, demonstrating an extremely high affinity. And we've also characterized the impact of each amino acid residue on both affinity and toxin activity, and found that these don't necessarily correlate. And some residues are important for picomolar affinity, and others are really important for inactivation. We're working on developing novel types of uh, PhD based um, inhibitors of DOC and I'll be speaking about that um, next month as part of the Institute of Infection um, series. So it just remains for me to thank all of the people that are, have been involved in this. Um, I'm really lucky to work with a very talented and diverse group of people and um, the names of, of whom are listed here. I'm grateful to my collaborator Sophia Lane and these organisations for funding and then you for your attention. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Anna, and I'm sure there'll be plenty of opportunities for questions at, at the end. Um, so we will move on to our um, next speaker. Uh, our next speaker is um, Dr. Rongjun Chen. Um, Rongjun is, is based in the, in the Department of Chemical Engineering in the Faculty of Engineering. Um, the activities of his laboratories are, are broadly focused on um, intracellular delivery of therapeutic payloads. His particular interest lies in generating um, virus mimicking liposomes um, containing either antimicrobial or anti-cancer cancer therapeutics. And um, the title of Rongjun's um, uh, talk is Bio-inspired nanoformulations for healthcare applications. Always you to, to you, Rongjun. Thank you, Ramesh, for your kind introduction. Good morning, everyone. It's my pleasure to give you a brief introduction of three bio-inspired nanoformulations we have recently developed for healthcare application. The first example is to develop some sequence-defined polymers. In nature, DNA 
RNA and the protein molecules, they have precisely defined the sequences, which determine that they are specific three-dimensional structures and also specific pro properties. However, synthetic polymers, they are usually statistical with random sequences, um, poorly controllable structures and unpredictable properties. There is unmet need to develop sequence controlled polymers for various healthcare applications. In collaboration with Professor Andrew Livingston in my department, we have recently invented a, a new method for synthesis of sequence-defined multifunctional polyesters through liquid phase synthesis with molecular sieving. Briefly speaking, in each chain extension cycle, protected building blocks are coupled to a three-armed hub. This is followed by membrane purification to remove excessive building blocks. The chain terminus is then deprotected followed by membrane extraction. The limitation of this invention is this method would require several intermediate purification between successive chain extension steps, and this makes it difficult for large scale production. To address this limitation, my research group has recently invented a new polymerization method called Q-Oil ROP. Using this method, the conversion rate in each chain extension cycle is quantitative, which is nearly 100%. So there is no need for any intermediate purification procedures between successive chain extension steps. This new polymerization method is much simpler and easier for large scale production of not only polyesters, but also polyesters with precisely controlled sequences and functionalities. We have demonstrated uh, they are used for delivery of drugs, proteins, and the nucleic acids, cell engineering, vaccine adjuvants, and also other applications, including the development of heat-stable RNA delivery formulations, which I will talk about later. The second example is the development of viral peptide mimicking pseudopeptides for cell therapy applications. Cell-based therapies have an enormous medical potential for the treatment of various diseases. There are two bottlenecks to wider up uptake of cell-based therapies, including cell engineering and cell preservation. The standard method for cell engineering is the use of viral vectors with safety concerns and also costly production. The standard method for crowd preservation of cells is the use of toxic DMSO reagent. We have invented a, a library of, of pseudopeptides to mimic the structure and the, the function of influenza viral peptides to release endocytosed materials from the endosome into the cytoplasm. Upon a slight reduction of pH, the pseudopeptides can build up on the cell surface and control the cell membrane thickness, membrane curvature, and the cell surface roughness. This leads to efficient delivery of wide range of small molecules and also different sized macromolecules into cells, three-dimensional spheroids and organs for the engineering purpose. In nature, some creatures can survive under extreme conditions because their cells can produce bulk protectants such as chihalos. We have successfully utilized the membrane permeabilizing polymers to deliver Chihalos into cells, ensuring the presence of chihalos not only inside cells, but also outside the cells for favorable bioprotection of cells. This DMSO free method has been shown to enhance the cross survival rate of red blood cells up to around 90% and the retain cell function by prevention of the hemoglobin oxidation. And this method has also been extended for crop preservation of immune cells, such as T cells, and the crop preservable human mesocamal stem cells were successfully trans um, implanted into human body uh, in the pre preliminary work, showing the significantly improved cell function compared to, D to DMSO method and the extracellular channels only. The third example is our recent work on the development of virus mimicking polymer enveloped lipid nanoparticles abbreviated as PELNPs. Influenza virus has the complex of protein capsid and RNA in the core surrounded by viral envelope. In our system, the lipid nanoparticles made from ketonic or ionizable lipids 
are designed to have a compact structure to mimic the capsid RNA complex. The compact lipid nanoparticles present high surface area for favorable RNA loading and improved RNA protection. Multiple compact lipid nanoparticles are surrounded by the unique polymer envelope, and this polymer envelope can improve the physical and the chemical stability of the system. And the peculation of the envelope surface can enhance the lipid drainage and uh, lead to the improved uh, internalization by dendritic cells. The polymerization methods which are just introduced have enabled us to invent the novel virus mimicking PELMPs with a unique polymer envelope. The production of PELMPs is very simple and scalable by simply mixing the RNA solution with the polymer lipid solution in a few minutes. The CrowdTM images confirm the presence of polymer envelope surrounded, surrounding the multiple lipid nanoparticles with the favorable uh, particle size around 100 nanometer with, and uh, monodispersity. This compact uh, structure enables a high encapsulation efficiency of Professor Robin Shattuck's self-amplifying RNA vaccine up to around 95%. Like how viruses work, the PNPs can facilitate the endosome escape of, viral, uh, of the RNA payload into the cytosol. The PMPs had a high transfection efficiency in cells through manipulation of the MP ratio and the polymer to RNA ratio. Compared to conventional positively charged lipid nanoparticles and the complexes based on PI, our, our PMPs with the unique polymer envelope can show enhanced transfection efficiency, but also um, improve the compatibility with negatively charged serum proteins. The efficient in vivo protein expression was uh, in mice was visualized using sRNA vaccine, uh, in, uh, sRNA uh, encoding loose protein after intravascular injection of two doses of influenza of sRNA vaccine provided by Robin Shuttock group. The high antibody production was observed and the mice survived the influenza challenge without significant loss of the body weight. We then tested the RNA stability of our PNP formulations after storage in aqueous solution at a room temperature without adding any stabilizing molecules. It was encouraging to see no significant decrease in the transfection efficiency after three weeks of storage at a room temperature, and that was due to the unique nano structure with the nano confinement in the system. Built on our knowledge and expertise on cell preservation, we have developed PENP formulation with coexistence of chihalos, both inside and outside the nanoparticles. The lifelized PENPs can ensure stable storage of RNA at 4 degrees Celsius, but also excitingly at 40 degrees Celsius under tropical conditions without significant decrease in transfection after several weeks of storage. And PLNP is one of the three IPs we have recently developed for not only in efficient intracellular delivery of RNA vaccines but also, uh, and also therapeutics, but also stable storage at uh, ambient temperatures. So far, um, the optimal formulation could achieve stable storage for at least four months at room temperature 20 degrees Celsius and also under tropical conditions at 40 degrees Celsius. This is really encouraging. We have ongoing work in this field. Finally, I would like to thank my group members and the collaborators for their contributions and also thank many, many thanks to those funding bodies for their financial support. And thank you very much for your attention. I'm happy to answer any questions you may have. Thank you very much. Thank you, Rangjun. Very okay. exciting. So, um, in the interest of time, uh, we will move on um, to the final speaker of, of this session. And um, as always, if people have questions uh, for, for Rongjin, please post them in the Q&A um, tabs. So um, our final speaker is, uh, is, is Dr. Fadil Bidmos. Um, he, Fadil is a, is a MRC Korea Development Fellow in the Department of Infectious Disease in the Faculty of Medicine. Um, his research has focused or focuses broadly on bacterial vaccines 
Um, Fadil's current interests are centered around um, monoclonal antibodies, however, uh, as therapeutic agents um, against bacterial infections. And he has developed methods to harness knowledge from um, monoclonal antibodies to discover um, new um, vaccine targets or epitopes um, in, in, in bacteria. Um, hence, Fadil's talk uh, today is on approaches for enhanced discovery and design of bacterial vaccine antigens. Over to you, Fadil. Uh, thank you very much, Ravish, for that introduction. Um, as you have rightly said, I'm an MRC Career Development Fellow, and I'll be sharing uh, some of the research I'm, I'll be doing as part of my fellowship, which in which I'm going to be applying some approaches for the discovery of bacterial vaccine antigens. Now, the um, disease I currently work on is mainly is bacterial meningitis, and the first major cause of bacterial meningitis is Neisseria meningitidis. Now, this is a bacterium that is a gram-negative diplococcus, um, exists normally in nature as a commensal and is strictly host-specific. However, in some instances, which is quite rare, but quite significant as well, um, you can get the bacterium crossing the epithelial barrier into the bloodstream leading to septicemia, and then can also cross the blood-brain barrier leading to meningitis. Now, the demographic that is mostly affected by this disease are the 6 to 24 months old, and this is because of the overlap between um, uh, the waning of the maternal immunity, which is passed on to the young infant, and uh, the underdeveloped immune system of the infant. And so vaccination is considered a crucial control measure for this um, uh, disease. Likewise, the second uh, bacterium that's also a very big cause of this disease is Streptococcus pneumoniae. Unlike the meningitis, it is a gram-positive cocci and exists in chains, also strictly host-specific and also exists in an asymptomatic phase known as carriage. Um, this is where the bacterium, just like we have with COVID now, is, um, uh, you know, exists asymptomatically in the nasopharynx. And of course, as well, 6 to 24 months old are particularly susceptible. Um, so vaccines exist for both uh, against to, ta to tackle the disease uh, against both pathogens. However, these vaccines do not provide full coverage. And of course, we also have to worry about vaccine escape mutants. So there is a continuous need to uh, identify new vaccine antigens. Uh, the method that I am using, uh, which I've developed a lot of data uh, for in Professor Langford's lab, is reverse vaccine OD 2.0. And this is where we exploit the human immune system to identify immunogenic antigens. Now, the first step of this is to isolate um, antibody producing cells from the blood of infected individuals that are convalescing from disease. And this antibody producing cells could be either plasma blasts or memory B cells, depending on the um, uh, application. Uh, and the method we use to isolate these antibody producing cells are fluorescence, is fluorescence activated cell sorting facts. And what we do is we isolate each cell uh, into wells, uh, individual wells of the 96 well plate. So what that means is that each antibody we clone from the plasma blast are monoclonal. And uh, to clone the antibody, what we really do is to just clone the variable region, the gene fragments coding for the variable region, which is the antigen binding region, and then clone that into an expression vector that already contains the constant region of uh, human IgG heavy chain. Uh, once we've successfully done that, we screen all of these uh, molecular antibodies against the target organism using flow cytometry or the ELISAs. Um, Antibodies that are reactive are then taken forward to um, check for functional activity. And we can use serum assay, for example, or the optional phagocytic assay in the case of the focus. The serum bacteriocidal assay is very useful in this sense because it's the major correlate of protection for meningococcal disease. Now, once we've identified bactericidal antibodies or optional phagocytic antibodies, we can then try to identify what the targets of these functional antibodies are. And we use a variety of approaches here, uh, namely classical immunoproteomics. We can also use mutagenesis, and we are also developing panproteomic microarrays to identify the targets of these functional antibodies. I'll just quickly run you through an example of where we applied this. Uh, this was there was a patient that came into St. Mary's Hospital, a nine-month-old baby, and uh, the first step was to identify whether there was a functional immune response to the 
managed focus that's caused the infection. Now, the, in this case, the managed focus is the M14 strain there on the left panel, and we uh, purified IgG from this patient's serum and then performed uh, the serum bactericidal acid. Why did we purify IgG? That was to bypass the interference that would have been caused by antibiotics that was given to the patient. And as we can see here, there was a targeted response, functional response to the patient's strain. Next, we went ahead to isolate the antibody producing cells. In this case, we isolated plasma blasts uh, characterized by high expression, high surface expression of CD27 and CD38. Next, we cloned the antibodies and were able to clone eight antibodies. This is quite a laborious process, but we did achieve some success with cloning antibodies. Um, eight antibodies that broad, broadly reacted with um, the patient strain. And in this case, we found three anti three of those eight that were bactericidal. We can also then determine via Western blotting whether or not the antibodies recognize a linear epitope or a conformational epitope. In this case, with the SDS page, we were able to find that they uh, recognize linear epitopes and that the epitope was at about 35 kilodalton in, um, in size. What we're also doing now is with funding from the NIH, uh, to you develop a panproteomic microarray to give us the unequivocal determination of the ant identities of these uh, antigens. Now, following the discovery of vaccine antigens, which we are we're doing, um, the next step will be to produce these antigens uh, in glycoconjugate form. Now, we know that glycoconjugate vaccines have been very effective against curbing the incidence of both meningococcal and pneumococcal disease. However, one, one thing we also know is that these glycoconjugates are very expensive and do not reach the places in the world where the burden of disease is highest. I mean, similar to what we're seeing now with COVID. As we can see from this graph here, this was published in 2009. You can see that the main areas of the world, mostly the LMICs and vaccines don't get that because they're really expensive. Why are these vaccines expensive? That's because of the complex chemical conjugation methods that are being used. And this really leads to the high cost of the vaccines. So what can we do is to try to um, develop a new technology that will allow us to produce cheaper glycoconjugates. Now, this is in collaboration with Brendan Wren at the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine, and they've come up with this fantastic approach where you can conjugate a capsule or a polysaccharide to a protein in E. coli, which means then that I can make liters and liters of my vaccine in the lab, and that is going to cost something like tenfold reduction in the vaccine costs eventually. Now what happens here, we have an equalized strain that has the machinery for the production of the polysaccharide. So we then have our polysaccharide operon on an entire plasmid, an acceptor protein, which might actually be one of the vaccine antigens that we're discovering. And then we have the, uh, the enzyme that is going to then catalyze that coupling, and that is Pigo B which is uh, an oligosaccharide transferase from Campylobacter hejuni. Next, we express using our normal in vitro expression conditions in the lab. And then in the E. coli stream, we have PIGO-B expressed, we have the acceptor protein expressed and polysaccharide. And then we allow PIGO-B to just work its magic. And then it brings both the polysaccharide and the uh, protein together via recognition of that sequence. That is just uh, on the bottom of the slide there. This is an example of one of the um, uh, gels I have made in the lab using one of the managed cocoa uh, surface proteins. This is a hemoglobin acquisition protein. And we can see on the uh, second, well, apart from the ladder, we can see on the second lane there uh, an equalized strain that does not have the pigle B. So in there, I've got the acceptor protein and the polysaccharide, but no pigle B. And on the right lane, we can see that very beautiful laddering where we have different polysaccharide chains being coupled to the HPUA protein. Now, both of these have gone into mice, and I'm currently accruing data on the immunogenicity of the two different uh, proteins. Now, this is what I expect to then take forward and um, apply to the other vaccine antigens that I'm discovering with my monoclonal antibody technology. Um, I'm just going to stop there now and say a uh, massive thank you to um, all of my collaborators, the Imperial Group, um, GSK in Italy, we are collaborating on with uh, the Manchukuo vaccine antigens, 
of course, Brendan and John Kuku at LSHTM, Jeremy Brown, who is helping us with passive protection experiments with the pneumococcal antibodies and uh, antigen discovery for the pump proteomic uh, work. And to all the funders as well, the MRC and the NIH and the Perot College. Thank you very much. I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you. Th thank you very much, Fadil. Um, and thank you very much to all the speakers in, 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 the, in the first session. So um, now um, I, I declare the Q&A um, and the discussion session to be to be open. Um, I, I, th I think I, I think the breadth of talks we heard this morning uh, um, nicely illustrates the collaborative ethos of, of, of the IOI. Uh, and, 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 and what's really exciting is, is that um, it, there are so many opportunities to, 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 to collaborate just among the few speakers we heard, 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 heard this, this morning. So on that note, um, despite, despite having a um, few questions on, 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 the, on the live Q&A session, let me, let, me start with, let me start with a question, question of, my, of my own um, to perhaps, perhaps some of you. Um, in, in, um, in Anna's talk, we heard about um, a, a new ways to, 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 um, to mitigate bacteria from, from acquiring um, antibiotic tolerance. Um, and and then um, and, and we talked we, we heard about vaccines um, and new ways of delivering vaccines in Rongjin's talk and Fadil's talk. So 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 I was I was wondering. Um, so maybe I can start with Anna actually. So what what is the way of of delivering your 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 peptides if they are you know as they are proving to be somewhat um, anti anti antimicrobial or antibacterial um, in terms of waking those persistent bacteria, making them sensitive to antibiotics. But what what would be the way to deliver them and um, is there scope perhaps to liaise with um, Ron Jun, for example, with his with his PE LNPs um, to to do so? What what's your what's what's your what's your view on that? Um, yeah, I would say you, you've hit upon um, our biggest challenge really in in this project is is getting things inside the the bacteria, and then um, of course the the infectious bacteria are not just on their own; they're often inside macrophages when they're they're acting. Um, as infectious agents. So it is, it is a really big challenge for us. And I think, yeah, at the moment we're um, exploring different strategies within our peptide sequence to kind of modify the sequence to get them inside. We're having some success with that. But I think certainly, yeah, looking at um, across the board at different delivery strategies is something that, that we'd be very keen to, to do, yeah. So in, in terms of using using this um, these the, the, the peptides as an as, as an anti antimicrobial agent, there is a question um, in 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 the Q and Q, Q and A um, session, and and the, the question is from um, from from YouTube um, mm -hmm. um, uh, from an anonymous person, I assume. Um, what the question is: What is the contribution of toxin and toxin modules in virulence, and can they be put? Can can there be a potential perspective targets for novel prophylaxis and therapy of therapeutic approaches that are urgently required to, to deal with antibody resistant mm -hmm. bacteria? I, th I think your talk addressed it, but perhaps you can you, you can you can comment on th their, their particular role in virulence. Yeah. So I think um, the role of tax toxin antitoxin interactions in general, in terms of, of of dormancy and and persistence of bacteria, and is it's kind of un up for debate at the moment, really, in in the field. So there there are a lot of papers that, that show that they cause this um, dormancy and then tolerance to antibiotics. But then there are a lot of people who who are not convinced by this yet. So I think that's what at the moment what we're trying to do is develop these chemical tools to be able to study that because I think that that would really help um, us to understand exactly what their role is um, in things like um, virulence and other aspects of of persistence and, and antibiotic resistance. So yeah, I think that that's what we're trying to understand at the moment, I think. Thank you. Uh, and there are so many questions about about their biology, which which are which are up in there at the moment. There's a much debated yeah, field. So, so it's exciting, yeah. exciting, exciting, exciting area area of that. So on on the on on, on the note of um uh, um and and antibacterial so there's a question um again from you to YouTube to Fadil uh, um, what's the best method for overcoming issues of reverse vaccinology, um, such as diversity of target antigens in, in the context of your tools? Uh, well, I mean, as we've seen with, um, we're going to use the COVID example, I mean, there isn't really any 
will bypassing diversity. I mean, that's the way these the pathogens also try to evade the immune system. And that's what necessitates the continuous um, search for pathogen antigens. But at least in the initial instances, we can try to, which is what we are doing, is try to screen for those epitopes that are broadly conserved. And that is one method. Another method that has been used previously is to use multiple antigens in the same vaccine preparation. So that's uh, um, another approach. One that I'm really interested in taking forward now, which is really not novel, but will be really exciting is because we are making monoclonal antibodies and that's the power of this approach we're using, is that we can identify um, single epitopes and we can uh, arrange um, multiple epitopes on the same protein backbone. Uh, and then that will even extend the breadth of our coverage. So um, that's that's the way uh, to go really. Um, and then just continue searching for novel antigens that are broadly cross um, protected. Th th thank you. So, 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 so your argument would be that to make, make kind of multiple payloads um, targeting a simple uh, targeting a single single bacterium. That yeah, sense. because because these epitopes are going to be on different antigens. So rather than having the whole antigen, we can actually have different epitopes that we already know elicit bactericidal antibodies. And we're very um, uh, well. We're fortunate to have been able to identify lots of linear epitopes. So in terms of the structure of the protein, that should also be something that's too much a big problem as compared to if it's a conformational epitope. Thank you. Um, so you 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 mentioned mentioned COVID, which is which is kind of a keyword for me to kind of prompt prompt me to the next next question. It, it's about the P P L and P's, um, Rongjun. When when you when when you when you were um, uh, talking about um, the data you you obtained with 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 um, Robin's Rob, Robin's um, self amplifying RNA. Um, there are a few questions um, in the Q and A, but 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 the, but the question I have is is kind of prompted by Fadilis. Can you can you load multiple um, RNAs, and is there a limit of how many how many RNA payloads we you can put onto um, these PLNPs or or, or or the viral mimicking um, liposomes? Thank you, Ramesh. The the short answer is yes. Um, we can load the different types of payloads into the the core of the formulation. We can also have the surface loading, say kind of inside out. We can load the payloads on the surface, it depends on the needs. Um, this is kind of platform technology it can be uh, applicable for delivery of different uh, payloads. And so far we have tested for the RNA payload, we have used the SARNA vaccine. Uh, we also have used uh, uh, mRNA. And we have the code delivery of the stabilizing molecule and uh, RNA. We can also potentially have the code delivery of RNA with other so different types of RNA or RNA with other molecules. That's 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 okay. Yeah. And um, this is this is a question um, relating to the delivery of 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 PEL and P's um, from um, from um, from Marco Brion. Um, and uh, Marco asks, in which part of part of the mice um, where, where in mice the PEL and P's um, accumulate once they have been delivered? Uh, we have not done detailed work on the bio distribution, but we looked at uh, lymphogenage. So the, using the, the formulation, we can have the enhanced lymphogenage, uh, and we can actually have enhanced intracellular delivery of RNA vaccine. Um, we are doing some some further work to to actually visualize the the bio distribution in the body. Yeah. Thank you. Um, so I would like to stick to the COVID-19 theme and vaccine, vaccine. But before that, there's, I think there's a technical question for you, Rongjun, um, in, in the Q&A. Um, and, and the question is from a, from a, from a, uh, from from the YouTube, and, and it goes: uh, Since different methods are used to make scaffolds, such as solvents, solvent casting, gas forming, freeze drying, and electro spinning, are there any issues of graft rejection uh, as well as challenges of nanofibers in different sizes, shapes? As well as ionic charge, it's something very much specific to you, I think. Um, I'm not sure if I, I I can answer this question because we don't work on nanofibers, whatever. Um, but we do have different uh, uh, polymer-based and lipid-based systems using different uh, ways of production. 
Um, but we don't we have not done any work on nanofibers yet, but this is maybe something we are we are actually considering like so you use the polymers we have developed to prepare some some nanofibers, but we have not done any work on that. Yeah. Thank you. Um, uh, there are three questions for, um, for, for for Crystal um, in the chat, but I, I have a, um, I have a, maybe I'll start with a question of, of my own, really, if you don't mind. Um, yesterday in in the in, in the discussion, um, we, we we heard about uh, there was a question about misinformation about vaccination, and 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 Peter mentioned that that's, uh, it is it is very much a difficult question. It sounded like a straightforward what's the what's the source of vac vaccinology, and, and and Peter's answer was quite telling that it is it's a complex complex um, situation I, I was just wondering when I was listening to your talk you know th this react study works by um, it sort of works on a voluntary basis people have to participate uh, you can reach out to people who want to participate um, is there an arm of a study um, or, or which kind of questions why people do not want to participate perhaps in in, in, in such studies which will ultimately inform um, an important epidemi epidemiological phenomenon? Uh, well, it's difficult. We, so we have had we had uh, quite high um, uptake very originally. It was higher, and that was partly because at, at the early stage in May um, 2020, this was the way somebody could get a test. I mean, obviously, it was right. yeah. you know we wanted a random sample of people, not just people who suspected they might have COVID. But um, I was actually randomly received one of the invitations and was quite excited because it was the first time I'd had a COVID test, which was seemed quite novel. The difficulty is, of course, that if people, you know, say no to participating in this, then it's you know we're not free to then cut contact them again and say, well, why didn't you take part? And we don't want to hassle people. But we are able to look at demographics to see how representative people are. So we're able to um, adjust for um, these demographic characteristics by region and, and, and demography. And that's why we have weighted estimates of prevalence as opposed to unweighted. Um, right. yeah. But we're limited in what we can do. If people just say, no, they don't want to take part, then we can't actually sort of pursue them to find out why not. But there there are other contexts in which people are trying to to get uh, feedback from from what motivates people to take part. But we found, you know, we had more than 40 percent, I think, um, sort of uptake it originally, and that has gradually dropped over the, the 13, 14 rounds. Um, but still, you know, it's on the order of a third, which is remarkably high for this this sort of thing, because it is it does require some cooperation and the person to actually do it. Uh, but it, obviously we'd like it to be higher, but we want to, you know, it still appears from the way that we've been able to compare it to other um, patterns, both in deaths and hospitalizations, that we are getting the right sort of trends, but we can't ever claim to be completely representative when we don't, you know, it is voluntary. Um, the, the reason I was asking is because COVID-19 was clearly an, an acute uh, um, situation but um, uh, in yesterday's discussion there was a mention of, about, about about kind of the one one else health approach and in that context a human behavior plays a place 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 plays a plays a significant role um, same with the climate change you know there are elements of human behavior which 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 will affect uh, the epidemiology of infection so um, hence you know in, in such studies participation and information one does not get from not participating might, might be significant in in in, in, in understanding this is progression. Um, Certainly. So the the question um, from 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 YouTube for you, um, Crystal, is 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 um, is what is the positive predictive value of self-reported new impairment for COVID nineteen in populations of patients um, with with cold with flu like symptoms? Um, oh, <laughs> I think I'll have to look that up and and put that in the chat. I don't have that um, immediately to hand, but. Um, yeah, and we've we have looked at these different patterns of um, people who have symptoms and not, but this is um, I don't have that off the top of my head. Thank you. Um, moving on from virology to 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 to, to parasitology, um, uh, Athena, there are there are there are some 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 questions questions for you in 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 the chat. 
And um, one of them is, is about um, something we, we kind of touched upon when, when we were talking about your your, your RNA transcription transcription data and and the, and, 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 the, and the mouse models. And the question is, um, does the whether the mouse mouse model um, or the mice models you, you, mouse model you, you use replicates all stages of infection of malaria or, or only the interaction between the parasite and and, and the glycolytics? Thank you. Um, yeah, this is a great question. I wish I had time to actually show you in the presentation um, that this mouse model is actually uh, one that shows multi-organ um, dysfunction. Um, we do get signs of dysfunction in the brain, uh, lungs, definitely liver. Uh, actually, the sections I was showing with the glycocalyx uh, being completely uh, cleaved from the infected mice uh, were from liver. Um, so, yeah. We, we do see different organs being involved in the um, pathogenesis of this particular one. And of course, I was really interested in this also for my fellowship because it does uh, reach this extremely high lactate level, similar to what we get in um, human severe hyperlactatemia. So on the note about uh, following up from that, that that's, that's a further question um, from from Ben. Um, and, and Ben asks, um, whether the damaged endothelial glycolyx um, in the malaria model would lead to altered immune recruitment to the liver? Um, this is something that we will look into. Uh, we've just started working on this project, but if I was to guess, I would probably say uh, it definitely will play a role in this uh, because removing the glycocalyx lining from the endothelium, uh, it definitely leaves um, the endothelium exposed to at least the leukocytes that do circulate um, to be able to attach to it and cause damage. So definitely this is something that we will be looking into. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Athena. And and the final question I have um, I have here is is from um, it's from Charles. Okay. Um, Ch Charles asks um, Rangjan about uh, about specificity of those um, uh, uh, your delivery vehicles, the, P the PE, LNPs, and 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 this quest question is um, presumably the surface loading of PE, LNPs can be used to direct the delivery of um, of the payload to specific cell types by ligand interactions or similar um, uh, with cell surface molecules. So, would you like to comment yeah. on that, Long John? Yes, indeed. So we can um, we can coat the surface of the nanoparticle with targeting ligands. So, it's using the specific targeting ligands, we can deliver. The, the payload to specific cell type to the specific uh, part of the body. Yeah, so this is the uh, this is the purpose of the uh, of the nano formulation. Yeah. Thank you. Um, so that um, that that concludes the Q and A session with 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 five minutes extra left for the, for the for the, for the coffee break. Um, I would like to thank um, all speakers. Um, uh, for, for the exciting talks and, 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 and showcasing um, some of the research which is going on in, in the Institute of Infection and, and also uh, highlighting opportunities how the collaborative research could, could grow. Um, uh, just, just, by just looking at the six, six, six talks we looked at, we can see how they can cross-fertilize each other uh, and expand. Um, so with that, I, I thank all speakers and, and, and I th thank you for, um, for, for, for your attention and see you, see you soon. Thank you. Thank you.
Muting on my desktop. So, Sam, can you hear me? Um, I have a feeling this isn't working actually. Um, we, we can hear and, you. And this is and this is working fine. Thank you very much for joining. Uh, we can okay. hear you loud and clear. Uh, and uh, yeah, I think we're almost ready to go. Um, uh, so. Yes, so the only problem, just so that you know, is that I can't get you, the teams on the phone. That's that's not a problem. Don't worry. Um, uh, as you're not presenting with slides, I think you'll be able to uh, follow through. It's fine. I will. I'll put you forward now and take us away. Uh, Right, sorry. Um, <laughs> so, so I'm not seeing any chat line either. So what should I should I be clicking on the show conversation? Because I'm not seeing a Q&A chat line like I was seeing when I was watching the earlier one. Um, if you I think at the top, you should see a single speech bubble with two lines on it. Uh, yes. Yes. Exactly. If you click, if you click that, you'll find the back of house uh, private chat. Oh, I see. So yeah. where will I see the questions, though? Uh, those will come to you from uh, Al and Melanie and team. Uh, Al. But they will be on the same chat line, will they? Because the I I understood, but maybe I misunderstood uh, that there was that I will be seeing the Q and A chat line on my desktop, and on the, my phone I would see the private chat line. Um, you can toggle between the chat line and the Q and A. So the double speech bubble at the top with a question mark is the Q and A. Oh right. Yeah. Oh, okay. So you can toggle between the two. Um, oh, okay, yeah, okay. If, if we can't get it on your phone, that's, that's yeah, what we'll have yeah, to do. Okay. Yeah. That makes my life easier, actually. Cool. So, no, is all this being recorded, by the way? So, if yes, it is, it is. are you able to delete it all? I will try. Um, <laughs> so, yes, please do. Uh, if you Are you happy now to proceed? Uh, or, yes, yeah, now, now that I realise I'm going to okay. on my main desktop, I'm just going to forget the phone. That's absolutely okay. Yeah, yeah. Brilliant. I'll leave it to you. Okay, lovely. Thank you. <laughs>
Um, Anne, can you hear me? Uh, yes. Yes, uh, if you'd like to turn your video on and please let's start um, by introducing Chris and we can take it away. I think we're at the we're at five past eleven. I thought I thought we were starting to eleven twenty for Chris. My schedule says. Oh, 11, sorry. I 11. do apologise. I do apologise. I've misread. I do apologise. Stay where we are and everybody listening. I do apologise for the interruption. Uh, we're now live. We, we are starting eleven twenty. Yes. Yes, we are. I do apologise. Okay, I'm just going to pop off for a cup of coffee if all this is being recorded. Yes, sure it's being recorded. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.
Good morning, everyone. Welcome back to the day two, session two of the Institute of Infection launch. I am delighted to be chairing this session. Uh, for those of you who don't know me, my name is Anne Dell and I head the Department of Life Sciences in the Faculty of Natural Sciences. Um, my uh, research area is glycobiology, so I just want to say how much I've enjoyed firstly listening to all the talks in the first session, but also seeing how many times glyco was mentioned, glycoconjugates, sugars, etc. So that was lovely. So for this session, we're continuing the theme of showcasing the amazing diversity, uh, breadth and interdisciplinarity of infection research, uh, translation, uh, etc. at Imperial College. And I'm delighted to say that we have four outstanding speakers. We're beginning with uh, Professor Chris Chu from the Department of Infectious Disease in the Faculty of Medicine. Chris is a uh, professor of infectious diseases and his research focuses on pathogenesis and human protective immunity in respiratory viral infections, uh, RSV, influenza and SARS-CoV-2. Uh, today, as you will see from the screen, he is telling us about human respiratory virus challenge to understand pathogenesis and protection. Over to you, Chris. Thank you very much, Anne. Um, can I just check that you can see this? OK, thank you. I'm, I'm really delighted to be here at, at the launch of the Institute of Infection, and um, I hope that I'm going to be able to inspire you with some of the, the work that we've done. I'm going to be focusing on the human infection challenge and specifically some of the work we've been doing respirat with respiratory viruses. And uh, I really don't think that I need to highlight the importance of respiratory viruses these days. Um, not only do we have the, the ongoing impact of, of SARS-CoV-2 and COVID, but also we have the global problem of uh, respiratory viruses such as respiratory syncytial virus and, and influenza, which cause millions of cases every year and hundreds of thousands of deaths. And of course, influenza also has pandemic potential. And I think as you've heard from some of the earlier speakers and, and also as the focus of, of, uh, of my group's research, the, the, one of the key questions in, in much of infection research is what determines the outcome of an infection event? So following a, a virus exposure, many people develop no symptoms at all and, and completely resist infection, whereas others develop uh, some element of viral replication. And um, a proportion of those will develop life-threatening disease, while many will remain asymptomatic. And if it's possible to understand the factors which uh, determine one outcome or the other, we can improve the interventions that we develop to drive more towards the left-hand side of this schematic. So you'd think that after many decades of research, uh, like particularly in influenza, for example, that we would uh, we would sort of know this already. But surprisingly, we don't. There's a lot of things we still don't know about the determinants in humans of clinical outcome. Obviously, we have a lot of understanding of what happens in mice um, and the, the control that we have has allowed us to really dissect the immune determinants. And we also have a lot of observational data from patients and uh, humans who particularly have been hospitalized. And, but these two ends of the spectrum often are difficult to reconcile with, 
with difficulty translating from the mouse to the human. And many confounders in observational studies, such as virus strain, dose, exposure, that really make it very difficult to interpret those data. So human challenge is, is designed to interface these, these two ends of the spectrum. So what is human infection challenge? Well, it's the deliberate inoculation of, of volunteers. And in this way, we can uh, use defined pathogens and select participants in particular ways so that we can design a controlled experiment. And with influenza, these studies were first conducted in the 1930s. And for a long period during the 20th century, um, there were programs of research using this experimental method. And particularly, I wanted to highlight the work of the Common Cold Research Unit, which was in existence from 1946 to 1989. And these are pictures from those, those studies where they were really instrumental in defining the effects of different virus strain, the effect of different doses, uh, the route of delivery. Here you can see uh, a, a transmission experiment where, where participants were, um, were uh, asked to play cards with each other. And they really started to define the determinants of protection. And the key strengths of human infection challenge are that you can really define the viral strain and dose so that all participants get the exact same stimulus. And you can, to a certain extent, control the homogeneity of the study subject themselves. And this leads to a very reproducible infection rate in the model and also allows us to study the very early pre-infection and pre-symptomatic periods, which are really not things that you can study in natural infection studies. Um, these studies can be very small and the longitudinal analysis therefore increases the power to uh, identify statistical differences. So we have been applying these types of experimental medicine models uh, over the last 12 years or so uh, and build on those studies from the Common Cold Research Unit, but applying um, the most cutting edge up to date technologies to better understand host factors involved in these different clinical outcomes. And you can see in the summary slide, um, these are some data from um, a flu challenge study where you can see that a proportion of people get infected and a portion of those get symptoms, very much like the schematic I showed. And you can also, because these studies are controlled and, and performed in exactly the same way, compare the results of different uh, viral challenges. So in flu, you get this very rapid development of symptoms, which correlates with the viral load. But in RSV, you get a three day incubation period, which we know is immunologically active. And when we study, we can um, define immune responses happening in this period, but really these can't be detected uh, from a clinical point of view. So the, the reason that human infection challenge is becoming such a growth area is because we recognize the traditional uh, pathway to developing vaccines and other interventions is increasingly difficult, costly and risky. And this is the, the traditional schematic of a, of a development pathway. And uh, historically, most of the work with human challenge has been targeted towards discovery and validation of mechanisms and correlates of protection. And one I wanted to highlight is hemagglutination inhibition, which was really defined using the flu challenge model and is used to license uh, seasonal flu vaccines now. And in our hands, we've done a, a number of studies here looking at the role of antibodies in the nose, the T cells in the lung, and also discovering entirely new mechanisms of susceptibility and protection. Here uh, in this paper, we identified neutrophils as being a potentially a key determinant in those early events during that incubation period as I was talking about. But of course, these models can also be used to more rapidly test products. And I just wanted to highlight this one recent study um, conducted by one of our collaborators, HVivo, which del delivers these studies as a service. And here with only 27 people in each arm, you can see a significant difference in people who are vaccinated with this adenovirus RSV vaccine um, compared with those who were not 
in terms of reduction in viral shedding, which I think is a really powerful demonstration of, of a very small study being able to give really definitive, clear results, which has then uh, allowed the upselection of this product um, to go on to phase three trials, which are obviously more likely to succeed because of these early success indicators. So it's on the basis of these uh, studies and these, these features of these models that the Vaccines Task Force in the middle of the pandemic last year convened uh, a group of academics, commercial partners and other funders uh, to develop SARS-CoV-2 Human Challenge as a model to both understand COVID better and to uh, accelerate the development of new interventions. And we led on this, uh, this first program of work. And uh, to cut a very long story short, I, I'm just showing you some very preliminary results. We manufactured a D614G containing pre-alpha challenge virus to GMP last summer. And earlier this year, we challenged 36 participants who were aged 18 to 29 um, otherwise completely healthy and seronegative. Uh, about half of these individuals became infected and we quarantined those people for over 14 days to make sure there was no onward transmission. And this is a picture of one of the individual rooms at the Royal Free Hospital, which was collaborating with us on this project. I'm very happy to say that there were no serious adverse events. And although we didn't, didn't design the study uh, to, to read out with clinical symptoms, mainly because we didn't want to risk uh, pushing more serious, the risk of serious disease, most people did develop mild upper respiratory tract and systemic symptoms with some spread in that, which will allow us to um, correlate with immune factors. So the plan is to um, really study these mildly symptomatic uh, or asymptomatic individuals in, in much greater detail. And, and these are obviously the, the people who are driving the pandemic now, since the majority of at-risk people are vac vaccinated. Um, and using our really granular data from uh, of the viral load, the incubation period, period and kinetics, we will be able to correlate these with the immune responses to better understand the impact of immunity on the course of disease. In the medium term, we're going to be able to, uh, we would now have a platform for comparing vaccines and antivirals head to head. And we will also, we hope, be able to provide efficacy data in these models as phase three studies become less and less feasible as the pandemic is better controlled globally. So our vision uh, for human challenge at Imperial, now that we have these three, uh, three established models, is to, is to really be able to accelerate the development of interventions and diagnostics. And we aim to do that through expanding breadth and building capacity. So through support from the Wellcome Trust and uh, the EU and IMI programmes, we are developing a Delta variant for a new SARS-CoV-2 breakthrough infection challenge model, and also new influenza and RSV models to expand the possibilities with those uh, those studies. Um, I'm very pleased to say that Malik Gavani is supported by Welcome for Welcome Trust to develop a new non-typhoidal salmonella study uh, model. We have obviously rhinovirus outpatient studies which are ongoing led by Seth Johnston and we have the facilities for malaria and other bacterial uh, models which we are hoping to develop. One minute please. Thank you. Um, and in terms of building capacity, I think the, the key limitation that I think everyone recognises is the lack of um, clinical research facilities, particularly inpatient facilities for these types of studies which require quarantine. And so we're working with, uh, um, with the DHSC and uh, the BIS, Wellcome Trust, NIHR, uh, NHS partners and other institutions to really build this capacity. So my last slide is just acknowledgements. My group, uh, present and past, um, our collaborators at, at Imperial and the, a very large number of other collaborators and thanks to my funders as well. 
Thank you very much indeed, Chris, for uh, capturing what is an amazing breadth and depth, obviously, of research with so many people involved and, and keeping to time. So thank you very much. Can I remind participants to put questions on the Q&A uh, line? So uh, we will have a Q&A session at the end. So we will move directly to the next talk of the meeting. Um, and uh, unfortunately, the original speaker for this session, uh, which was a designated PhD slot, Tabison Hagigi, has had a uh, family emergency and had to pull out at the very last minute. So I'm very grateful on behalf of the organisers that Adrian Naja, a Sir Henry Welcome postdoctoral fellow, uh, jointly between Molly Stevens' uh, group in materials in the Faculty of Engineering and Jake Baum's group in uh, Department of Life Sciences in the Faculty of Natural Sciences has stepped in to deliver a talk which I understand is going to be similar to but perhaps uh, grafted additional uh, of the work of your own Adrian. So thank you very much Adrian. Adrian uh, it, his research focuses on nanotechnological approaches to fight infectious diseases and the title is on the screen so over to you Adrian. Great, thanks very much for giving me the chance to talk to you. Yeah, it's a slight change in topic now because I'm presenting, but I will mention Tabson's work just at the end very briefly. So as you said, I'm integrated in two groups, which tells you I'm, I'm working at the interface of two different um, uh, topics, which is nanoengineering for malaria applications mainly. But recently we've also tried to employ my nanoparticles for antiviral applications. And where is the link between those two things? So if you look at malaria, um, the use or the parasite uses heparin sulfate to interact with the host cell and that's kind of the case for most human pathogens. So that's usually the first interaction point that the pathogen makes with the host cell. So what I'm doing is making a nanoparticle that mimics heparin sulfate and so it should have a very broad spectrum applicability against many different uh, pathogens. So in case of malaria we're aiming to inhibit merozoites from entering red blood cells and in say, case of SARS-CoV-2, this would be somewhere in the respiratory tract where we would uh, inhibit infection of the host cell as well. And to give you kind of a screenshot of how these particles look like, that's an electron micrograph shown here. Uh, down here, so the particles are about 30 nanometers. And if you want to have a comparison, the virus is about 100 nanometers, so about half the scale bar. And the parasite is about the size of the image of this whole thing here. It's about one micron in size. And to directly jump into the data we got with these particles in terms of inhibiting pathogens, I will start with viruses. So just before the pandemic, we started looking at HSV2 infection of host cells and try to inhibit them with, with the nanoparticles that we've designed. So it's kind of a schematic shown here on the left, which shows you how the particles are aimed to, this, uh, to bind to the surface of the virus and then uh, stop the virus from infecting the host cells. And we do this typical dose response curves, giving different particle concentrations and looking at host cell infection. And you can see we found uh, different particles that have different um, potency against the virus. And some of them, uh, as shown here, have actually very, very good activity against the virus. So we only need about femtomolar concentrations of these particles to in inhibit uh, HSV2 which is really fantastic if you compare it to other types of particles that have been tested in the past. And if, really, if we can integrate a virucidal mechanism of action for these particles, that would be amazing. Because we've tested that, we didn't design the particles to do that. So that's the virucidal test over here. So at the moment, they do not yet destroy the virus itself. They just inhibit uh, infection of the host cell. So we're working with collaborators at the moment to try and introduce that activity as well. And that would be really, really interesting to have as, as a particle uh, for the future. But of course, once the pandemic started, we also wanted to test uh, the particles against SARS-CoV-2. And we teamed up with Wendy Barclay's lab to test that. And the good story first, so we do get inhibition with these particles, as you can see with, with these curves here. So it's the same particles as shown up here. The only issue is that we need much higher concentrations to get that effect. If, if you look at the concentration scale here or at the EC50 values, and we're still debating why this is the case, but I, I want to draw your attention to, to heparin. So usually heparin is used as a gold standard in these assays to, to um, inhibit these viruses. 
And this works really well against HSV2 as well. It's it's around here if you if you test it with heparin. Uh, but for SARS-CoV-2, we don't get any inhibition at all in our hands. And this is up to very high concentrations. And this is still a debate in the literature. So some people show activity, others show it doesn't really work. But so if you have this in mind, the particles, so having a multivalent particle is still much better than just a simple polymer, which is really exciting for, for future work. And yeah, we're just showing that we're still at ranges where we're not toxic to the host cells with the particles, which, which is great as well. But yeah, the particles were designed initially for malaria because we don't need to disrupt the, the parasite membrane because parasites are known to lose their infective potential very, very rapidly. So after a few minutes, the parasites are known they're not able to infect the host cell anymore. So if the particle binds to the pathogen, uh, we only need to inhibit it for a few minutes and the job is kind of done. Uh, so it's these particles at the moment are much more suited for an anti-malarial application. And that is shown on this slide here. It's just kind of uh, a schematic showing what happens in vitro. So we take healthy red blood cells, infected late stage red blood cells, and then once the parasites come out, the particles to bind to the surface of the parasite and inhibit invasion of healthy red blood cells next to it. And to cut a very long story short, the particles we've designed work really well against Plasmodium falciparum. We tested many different strains that use different uh, infection pathways as well, and they work against all the different types. And importantly, also against the different species. So we, we test uh, Plasmodium nolazi as well, because it's starting to become much more of a problem because they start to infect uh, humans as well. And yeah, we see here, we can also inhibit these uh, completely different species of parasites as well. And to give you kind of an image how this looks like in reality, so that's a high resolution image we've made uh, with storm imaging. And you can see red is the major surface protein one of the parasite. So you can see it's about one micron in diameter. And in Zion, you can see all these nanoparticles sticking to the MSP1 layer on the outside, and that inhibits uh, infection of the next cell afterwards. And we just went on to show that in uh, very initial studies with Plasmodium burgii in mice, and we could show we could also inhibit uh, merozoite invasion in the, in the mouse model. So we get about 75% uh, inhibition of, of merozoite invasion in this model. It means we cannot block all the parasites with this strategy, but that was never really the idea. Because if you imagine what we really want to do, but it's a lot of work that we have to do, is using this as an immunostimulant. Because if you imagine blocking these parasites like this in the bloodstream during a natural infection, we might be able to get a stronger immune response against the extracellular pathogen. Because you have these particles on the surface now, and we could of course load them with uh, various molecules in the first place to try and guide the, uh, the immune response that we get. And so that's really exciting work we can do because we now know we can get this kind of inhibition uh, to work in a mouse as well. And I just want to share a video to show you how this actually works. So we can video that to see how these um, particles function. So you can see healthy red blood cells here. Those are late stage infected red blood cells. It looks like grapes because the parasites are ready to really burst out of the cell and then they're trying to invade the neighboring red blood cells. And if you look in the red channel, once I start the video, uh, you will see now it's all very diffuse. The particles are way too small. You don't see them. But once the, the parasites egress, you can see how they light up in red because the particles bind and accumulate on the surface. I hope this works now. And so it's kind of the mechanism of action. So once they burst open, I mean, some of them completely burst. You will see this one now. Um, some stay agglutinated if we do this static assays, but some of them burst open like this and you can see all the parasites, they become red because the particles accumulate on the surface and they can't enter the neighboring cells anymore. That's kind of the way how these uh, particles work. And just if I have a, a final minute, I want to jump to a completely different application which uh, Tabasom was supposed to present. So being embedded in Molly's lab, we have really exciting opportunities to use there are technologies they've already developed uh, in the lab for completely different applications. So Molly's lab made a fantastic lateral flow test uh, with ultra low sensitivities. Um, so you all know how these lateral flow tests work, but now what, what they're doing is doing a color reaction at the test line. So you get much lower sensitivities with these tests. And me being embedded in Jake's lab, of course, we could just combine that and try to make an anti-malarial test but we didn't want to do just another uh, rapid diagnostic test for malaria disease, but a completely different one. 
So can we detect people who transmit malaria? So making a test to see who can transmit malaria back to the mosquito, because that's a very different story. So if you're sick, you don't necessarily have the transmission stages, which are highlighted here. Or if you take a drug, you might still have these stages in the bloodstream. Or if you're asymptomatic, you might also have lots of these gametocytes in the bloodstream that are actually responsible uh, to infect mosquitoes afterwards. So making a test like this would tell us if someone is an active transmitter of malaria and we could give drugs to these people uh, specifically to try and block transmission back to the host, uh, which is really an exciting technology. Yeah, so that's just uh, the final thing. So it's, we have lots of data on this. I'm not going to show anything. Uh, this will have to come at a later point, but I can just say we're already at the point where we're testing patient samples and it's, it's looking really exciting that we can get a test for transmission competency. And I just want to finish by thanking everybody who has been involved. It's really already a, a huge collaboration between lots of different groups within the Institute of Infection. And I see really lots of opportunities to do more of this type of research at the interface. So thanks for your attention as well. And thanks to my funding from the Wellcome Trust as well. Thank you. Thank you very much. And, and I'm not sure whether I did mention that Adrian is a Sir Henry Wellcome postdoctoral fellow. Um, so thanks uh, uh, again for stepping in. And also, I, I think your final slide just again epitomizes why we have an Institute of Infection launched today. OK, so again, questions in the Q&A line, please. And we move to the third speaker of the session. Uh, this is Dr. Alvin Tiangwe, who is in the Department of Life Sciences, Faculty of Natural Sciences. Calvin holds a Sir Henry Dale Fellowship, which is a uh, prestigious Royal Society Welcome Trust Fellowship for scientists who are developing their independent careers. Um, Calvin's interested in understanding a pathogen which I don't think we've had so far, so it's great that uh, Calvin is able to tell us about some of the work that's happening at Imperial Fund for the eukaryotic pathogen that causes African sleeping sickness uh, in humans and Naga, na, I think that's right, I hope, in, in cattle, and that is Trypanosoma brucei. So Calvin's uh, title is on the slide. Over to you, Calvin. <clears throat> thank you, Anne, for the introduction and thank you to this organizers for giving me the um, opportunity to speak here today about African trypanosomiasis or African sleeping sickness as it, as it is commonly referred to. So we are interested in African trypanosomes or African trypanosomiasis because my slide is not changing. Okay, we are interested in African um, trypanosomiasis because it causes disease both in humans and infects a variety of livestock and game animals. There are about 60 million people at risk in sub-Saharan Africa. It is transmitted by an insect vector, the tetsi fly shown here on the right. And the distribution of these flies seems to coincide with um, um, disease incidents. So shown here in yellow is the distribution of the fly. And these red dots and blue dots that you can see on this map is um, are hotspots of the disease. Now, because trypanosomes not only infects humans, but also infects livestock, it imposes a huge socioeconomic burden to affected populations. Now, when beaten by an infected um, fly, the parasite is usually in injected into the bloodstream. So here's a scanning electron micrograph, a fourth colored one of a trypanosome in mouse infected blood. And to survive in this kind of environment, trypanosomes must achieve two things. The first is that they must evade host immune attack, and trypanosomes are fantastic at this. They do this by process known as antigenic variation. The second is that they must obtain essential nutrients, and two nutrients relevant for our research are iron and glucose. Now, an elaborate mechanism for um, evading, uh, for limiting pathogenicity pathogenicity by host cells is known as nutritional immunity. So our lab is interested in how trypanosomes overcome iron deprivation during an infection. Now, in addition to the bloodstream, trypanosomes also infect a variety of tissues, the most important of which is the brain. But what this means for an infection is that they would encounter um, nutritional challenges in, in each of these tissues. And so trypanosomes are a good model system for understanding host pathogen interactions. 
Now, most of the recent technology, for example, CRISPR-Cas9, can be applied to trypanosomes. They are highly manipulable. We can cultivate them in the lab. And in collaboration with my child in the Department of Life Sciences, we have been able to barcode trypanosomes and we can track the infection dynamics of a trypanosome infection in each of these tissues. What we are really interested in is the adaptive processes that um, trypanosomes undergo during um, infection, specifically how they respond to changes in iron levels in a host cell. And I list here two processes that iron um, is important. So 70% of all the iron in your body is available in blood, in hemoglobin used to transport oxygen or in energy production. Now, what this means is that uh, different cell types have different ways of taking up iron from their environment. And in the simplest iteration shown here in this diagram is that iron is usually imported from the external environment into the cytosol, where it is either incorporated into the storage molecule ferritin or incorporated into um, iron dependent enzymes. A second mechanism is to take up hemoglobin through a dedicated receptor. And this is usually imported into a digestive vacuum where the iron is bro further broken down and transported into the cytosol. The third and most important mechanism is through import of iron from blood. So um, iron associated toxicity means that iron is never free in blood. It is bound to a molecule known as transferrin. You require a receptor, the transferrin receptor, to import iron. This is imported into the lysosome and eventually traf uh, traffic to the lysosome where the iron is released. Now, bioinformatically, we cannot identify most of the components in trypanosomes that are important for iron storage, iron import, or iron sensing, and trypanosomes cannot acquire iron from him. This means the main mechanism for iron import is through a transferrin transferrin receptor um, mediated endocytosis. So what our lab is interested in is in the regulation of this molecule and whether this can be targeted as a therapeutic for trypanosomiasis. Now, this slide summarizes and or gives you an overview of our research and how to um, understand the iron adaptive processes. So first, we're trying to identify novel regulators of iron um, in trypanosomes at the mRNA level using transcriptomics. In the second arm of our research, we're trying to look at um, the signals that are important for mediating um, an iron response in response to iron deprivation. And by this, we use phosphoproteomics. Now, overall goal is to um, is to integrate the regulators that we identify at the transcriptomic level and at the proteomics level to begin to define an iron network. So we are working here on the hypothesis that um, this iron regulatory mechanisms and signaling processes in trypanosomes would have diverged significantly from their host cells, and we can exploit this for therapeutic purposes. Now, because some of these um, whole genomics approaches at uh, can be prone to can be prone to 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 false positives. We have developed a CRISPR-Cas9 dual luciferase um, reporter system where we use CRISPR mediated excision and repair of a target gene and replace this gene with firefly luciferase um, with its cognate five prime and three prime untranslated region. Now we can modulate iron levels in vitro and then monitor the expression levels of the firefly luciferase to indicate um, the level of control. And what we are interested in here is uh, are the um, nucleotide binding um, pros, um, sorry, we are interested in the cis actin elements and the trans actin factors that mediate expression of this reporter. Now, um, this TFR molecule has been studied for over 25 years, and it turns out that it's significantly divergent from the host counterpart. Now, uh, between two studies, it's been shown that the sequence um, variants within the ligand binding domain of the, of the parasite receptor seems to confer either antigenic variation or is important for nutrient binding. Since these studies were done in vitro, we have decided to do some field work to look at these, the sequence diversity of, of TFR in a natural infection. So in Ghana, we're doing field work where we are harvesting trypanosomes from a variety of livestock and first, we diagnose them by PCR and feed back this information to the farmers where the animals can be treated. But what we are really interested in is to sequence the TFR variants in the field and ask the question whether this is um, important for trypanosomes to expand their host reservoir. Now, in collaboration with some partners in Kenya, we are trying to develop nanobodies that can tar target TFR as um, a drug target. 
So this slide summarizes, uh, gives you an overview of our research. So I've told you about the genomics and um, approaches that we're taking, cultural impact parasites in vitro, modulating iron levels, growing them in either low, medium, um, normal or high iron conditions. And here we're looking at both the mRNA and proteins that are important for iron deficiency in vitro. So secondly, also in the field, we're looking at the adaptation and the sequence variants of TFR and to, uh, asking the question whether it is important to enable um, trypanosomes to expand their host reservoir. Finally, we are also looking at the in vivo dynamics of an infection in a mouse model where we are um, treating mice with um, hepcidine and asking what are the infection, um, how, how the parasites adapt in this kind of environment. So I'm not going to go through all our collaborators here, but in Ghana, we're working with um, Teresa Manful at the University of Ghana for the in vivo dynamics work. We're working with Professor Matthews in Edinburgh and a variety of collaborators in Germany and the United States. So we, I have a, just one lab member who is, has been the backbone of the lab, Carla, who does most of the work. And here I've, we have a very small group, but we have relied a lot on the training programs at Imperial um, with a variety of master students who have supported our work. For the barcoding and in vivo dynamics work, um, we're working with um, Dr. Matt Child in the Department of Life Sciences. For drug discovery, we're working with David Mann and Professor Alan Armstrong, who synthesized small molecules and we can test these on trypanosomes. Um, our work is funded primarily by the Wellcome Trust and the Royal Society. Um, thank you very much for your attention and I'll be happy to take questions. Thank you very much, Calvin. Um, nicely to time. Um, and again, a wonderful example of how all of the imperial research is reaching right across the world. So it was nice to see how you're going from basic science right up to uh, field work. Uh, questions in the uh, Q&A line at the moment. So uh, we will cover questions in the general discussion session at the end. So thank you again to now, Calvin, for a lovely talk. And we move on to the final talk of the session, which will be given by Ellie, Dr. Ellie Sherrod Smith from the School of Public Health. Um, my screen has gone, I guess it's an aside, very different from what it was a little while ago, so I hope all is fine. Ellie is a, uh, holds a UKRI, a prestigious Future Leader Advanced Fellowship in the School of Public Health. Uh, her focus is on infectious disease in general, specifically on malaria. She co-leads the Malaria Network of Excellence and hopefully her slide title will go up in a minute because it's not on my screen, it may be on everyone else's, um, but I'll read it whilst it's going up. The title is Vector Control and Malaria, Challenges, Product Performance and Strategy. Thank you very much, Ellie. Thank you. I um, hope you can see the slides. Yes, all fine now. Thank you. Thanks. So yeah, I'm Ellie and it's lovely to round up this session today. Um, I'm really presenting on behalf of the Churchill Lab, which sits within Azogani's Malaria Modelling Group. Um, and really, we pr present this on behalf of a huge group of people because the strategy we've been taking is to do these sort of series of systematic reviews and meta-analyses um, to try and build the evidence base for um, the empirical data that shows how well vector control is working against mosquito populations. And then we use a mechanistic model which captures the transmission of falciparum malaria between mosquitoes and humans to understand how these vector control interventions can affect uh, the public health situation of malaria. So in that vein, we look at the population level of the data and we, we try and think of things in a kind of probabilistic way. So um, this is a sort of a simple schematic, the start point of, of what we're thinking about. So as a female mosquito arrives in an environment, she tries to feed. She might try and feed on an animal host or a, a human host. And she, she might do that indoors or outdoors and, and pass through to oviposit and complete her life cycle. And so what we can do is to try and mechanistically interrupt this transmission pathway to try and understand how these different interventions like indoor residual spraying might um, change her success of, of passing through this type of pathway. So 
are the main tools that we use to sort of understand that this the impact of these living interventions is the experimental hut. So this is a bioassay. Um, you can have six, six to twelve really um, in a in a habitat. Um, and what happens is a mosquito, wild mosquito, is able to fly into the hut. She might experience some intervention inside the hut, um, and then that changes the potential outcome. So for any given feeding attempt, we imagine that she might be killed by the intervention as she comes in and exposes herself to the insecticide perhaps present. She might be deterred and just put off coming in at all because of the presence of the intervention. She might come in and exit without feeding or she might actually feed. And so together, these sort of these different outcomes sum up to the total population or the, 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 the sort of probabilities all sum up to one of, of what she might what, what might happen to this mosquito as she tries to feed. The situation's becoming more complex, as Penny Hancock has shown, who's a, another member of our group. Um, this work was done at Oxford before she joined us. But the situation's more complicated because we have uh, this changing um, sort of phenotypic response to the presence of pyrethroid in the environment. So as you can see from these lovely maps, uh, in this first one in 2015, um, most of the mosquitoes are being killed and they're, they're being killed in an experiment called a, a discriminatory dose bioassay where mosquitoes are exposed to a discriminatory dose of an insecticide for three minutes and then monitored for 24 minutes and you can see how many die. So it's quite a simple test to try and understand uh, the local sort of ability of mosquitoes to survive. And as you go through time, you start to get these patches in sort of Mali and um, Burkina Faso or Cameroon, for example, of a much lower mortality. So many more surviving mosquitoes in these tests as we go through time. So one of the things we've been trying to do in this um, lovely review by Rebecca Nash and the group is to try and use this discriminatory dose bioassay to, to sort of explain these other outcomes of a mosquito feeding attempt as a mosquito passes through um, a, a scenario with different interventions present. So this is all data from uh, a, a systematic review of experimental huts um, and this bioassay um, experiment. Um, first of all, we associate the two mortality um, data points and you can see this is a very noisy um, relationship and we're actually trying to use different um, sort of metrics for this um, uh, approximation of phenotypic resistance in, in the local mosquitoes now, but for, for now we're using this discriminatory dose bioassay. Um, and then you can take this um, this experimental hut information and, and so this is now the mortality in the experimental hut associated with the um, different outcomes that we might expect. So either feeding um, or not feeding in out, as an outcome of that, that pathway through an experimental hut with the presence of a net. We can do this, this sort of um, characterization of different interventions um, in a similar way. So here I'm now showing a meta-analysis of a particular indoor residual spray called Aptelic, so Pyramethos methyl being the active ingredient in this insecticide. Um, and we can look at things like the mortality over time and see how that was performing in different experiments. Um, and then using those data and our transmission model, we can calibrate the transmission model to what was happening in a baseline for any sort of randomized control trial. And I'm exampling here Natasha Protopopos study from Tanzania. Um, and we calibrate the, the transmission model to the baseline and then we, in, we use our characterization of the, of the impact um, to, to infer what we think would happen, simulate what we think would happen going forward from that baseline point. So the red line here, that's just using mosquito nets on their own. And this yellow line is using the, the pyrethroid mosquito net with this actelic IRS sprayed once at this point here. Um, and so each of these lines represents a different study's sort of expectation of what we think would happen. And then we can look at our kind of most common outcome or our sort of median outcome given this uncertainty. Um, and then we can overlay the actual study um, cross-sectional surveys of prevalence that were taken and see how close we are to the actual sort of real result that was observed empirically. So what we've been doing lately is to try and uh, do a systematic review of all of these um, epidemiological studies um, and to understand the sort of efficacy of these um, indoor vector control interventions. And so this is this is sort of taking the data and just looking at the different efficacy against prevalence that you can get with these different interventions. So we're looking at pyrethroid only nets, pyrethroid with some IRS, the 
a, a second net that has a synergist um, project product that sort of recovers the impact of the pyrethroid for resistant mosquitoes um, and, and those in conjunction with an IRS as well. Um, and then what we can do is simulate each of those studies um, and show the sort of, and see how well the model prevalence um, is able to recreate the trial observed prevalence. And, and so this dashed line is the one to one line. So ideally we'd be having all of our points along that line. Um, and we can then look at the ones that are, are slightly sort of off that line and, and try and explain why we think we might have missed those particular points in those particular studies. So each of these um, cross-sectional surveys are taken at different sort of time lengths after the deployment of the intervention. Um, and then we can work out at those cross-sectional surveys some efficacy against the prevalence and we can see how well we're doing at predicting that as well. So we're reasonably comfortable that this process of taking the entomological data in these particular bioassays is able to predict the epidemiological event um, moving forward. Um, and this, this sort of framework can be used for many different other, uh, other interventions that are coming into play um, and, and we can start sort of tweaking those bioassays and, and, and sort of making them more, more specific for different interventions if they're not able to recreate what, what we think the mechanism is for the impact of that particular intervention. So there's lots of sort of future directions we can use with this type of framework. But for now, we're using it to validate um, the transmission model simulations moving forward. And so this model's um, being used by um, Azra Ghani and Pete Winskill and, and Patrick Walker and the group um, to, to provide information for the global technical strategy. Um, and it's being used for the high burden, high impact um, work to look at um, specific um, strategy options for countries um, for national malaria control programmes. Um, and we can start to say, you know, what, if, if you introduce different interventions at time zero, what's the different sort of um, situation that we might expect to happen? So in this situation, I'm just showing the efficacy of uh, different nets, the blue and the green being different nets, um, which are deployed every three years and comparing that to some long lasting indoor residual spray that's deployed every every year. So you can start to see that perhaps in the sort of later years when the net um, benefits sort of weared off, worn off, um, the IRS um, impact might, might come through a bit more strongly. Um, and then you can translate this into sort of cost effectiveness and stuff. Um, so we've been working on a interactive tool, so uh, encourage anyone to, to, to have a look at this to try and help sort of orientate around um, how the mechanism of, of malaria works. Um, and, and that's a live uh, interactive tool if, if you're interested. Um, and it just leaves me to thank a, a huge group of, of people who are involved um, in all of these trials and the data collation. And, and this is our, our sort of closer team. Uh, for the, the actual fellowship that I'm working on, we're working very closely with the CNFRP team to look at these sort of heterogeneities in the mosquito um, activities and, and, and understanding that in this mechanistic framework as well. Um, and thanks everyone for listening. That's me. Thank you very much, Ellie. Um, and thank you again for keeping to time. Um, and uh, absolutely wonderful talk. And again, uh, highlighting how much international work the the college is involved in and also highlighting the importance as I'm sure we don't need, to, I certainly don't need to say it to this audience, of modelling in infection. Um, so we will open up the Q&A. Everyone, um, it's nice to see you all live. There are, I'm not going to ask any questions unless we all dry up because I see there's a lot on the chat line, although I would love to ask some questions about heparin sulfate, but I'm sure the general audience won't be as interested as I am in heparin sulfate. Um, so what I'd like to do is to uh, semi-group the questions is if I could start with malaria questions, if the other two speakers don't mind at this point. Um, and I'll start with the very first question that I'm seeing here on the chat line, which I think can be directed, I hope, to both Ellie and um, Adrian, because it's a fairly general question. Uh, saying a comment was made yesterday on the potential for malaria as a vector transmitted infection to become, via climate change, a growing concern for developed nations. Do you agree with this view? And if so, what are the rapid research avenues that need to be explored? And obviously others can, uh, uh, Calvin might want to comment as well, even though you're not <laughs> researching malaria. So basically, do, do you think malaria um, they, is going to be a growing concern because of climate change? And 
what are the rapid research avenues that need to be explored that you think are not already? Perhaps if I could start actually with Ellie, but do you have a comment, Ellie, on this? Um, yeah, I'm happy to, to sort of put my two pence in. Um, I, I, I'm not, I don't see malaria being a disease. That, I think people have a really good understanding of how to eliminate and people are eliminating, you know, China eliminated this year. So there are um, templates of how countries can eliminate and can control reintroductions. And that's happening globally, I think, in lots of places. Malaria does come into, you know, even the UK and people do have um, cases uh, and then it is controlled fairly quickly at that point. I, there is, I think the, the sort of link with climate change links to the sort of change in the mosquito composition of, of more competent vectors moving into, into newer areas. Um, but I, I think I'd be more, more concerned about something like dengue where it's an urban infection with a sort of daytime biting mosquito as a competent vector and I think that type of infection is more, more challenging um, in developed. So I think malaria is a, a obviously a, a very serious infection to, to try and control in, in um, endemic places but I, d I don't think it's as, as, as risky. I mean I might disagree with others. Adrian would you like to chip in here? Yeah I can maybe I mean I'm not the person to predict uh, what is going to happen with, with the climate change and uh, how the, the vectors are going to move around. But in terms of what should be done, I can just say it from my perspective, uh, from engineering side, if you look at the numbers of papers and the number of things that have been tried for malaria, for example, in the nanomedicine field, it's very, very few things. So I really would, would urge people who work in, in that field to really employ all the things we make for cancer and, and other diseases and employ them for malaria and, and try because there's lots of opportunities to try new things because malaria is not going to go away that fast. I'm not convinced. So we definitely should use the, all the technologies we have and try to employ them for malaria as well. OK, thank you, Adrian. Calvin. <clears throat> yes, I'm going to be selfish and talk about uh, vector distribution and trypanosomes. Um, so if we look at the map that I showed at the beginning, you could see that the distribution, the geographic distribution of the fly seems to coincide with disease incidence. And what this has shown for a related um, trypanosome, trypanosome acrisia, is that it's not only present in South America, but it's now encroaching into the United States. And we think that this is due to climate change. So understanding and having vector control measures that um, sort of curb the distribution of, of these flies might also impact on, on disease incidents and distribution across the world. So climate change definitely has a, an impact on the distribution of the vector and the prevalence of disease. Thank you, Calvin. Um, Chris, I don't know whether you want to add to a question on malaria or I will wait for you to comment uh, for your own questions. So you're, you're okay, great. Um, right, so um, Chris, I think from quickly skimming down the questions, you've had a chance to see the questions, haven't you, relating to yours, because there are replies. Is, is that the case? No, there was just one in the chat which we thought we could deal with. Oh, right, OK, OK, OK. So I think I might just move in uh, order on screen. It's a little difficult for me to sort of assemble them all together if uh, you don't mind and the audience doesn't mind. I just want to comment that there is a question that someone has asked about React, and that was the first session, Speaker Crystal. So um, the I'm sure there will be at some point a, a chat line answer to your question. Um, so the uh, actually let me just read out the question and the, the the answer chris uh, when will you be publishing the results of the COVID human challenge characterization study please um and the answer on the chat line is drafting the manuscript now submitting in the next few weeks uh, that the correct answer that's correct yes um do you think the human challenge studies could replace phase three studies in the future and when do you think this might happen? Yeah, so so I, the simple answer is no, they don't replace phase three, three studies. Um, the reason for that is that the human challenge models, all of them are designed to, to cause mild disease in healthy 
individuals. And so these, these infections don't fully replicate natural infection. They don't fully replicate the high risk populations that that severe infection happens in. And so we wouldn't we really expect these uh, these types of models to replace uh, phase three trials in those target populations. Um, it, in addition to that, phase three trials are not only about efficacy, they are about safety. So it's so it's important to be um, giving large numbers of people for the, the intervention to make sure that it's safe. So I don't think that they're a replacement, but what their role is, is, is a, a sort of stage gate at an earlier stage during development. So phase three studies are extremely costly, complex. They, for respiratory infections, I mean, pandemics notwithstanding when you have extremely high incidence, but normally respiratory viruses, although they're common, the act actual event rate is, is quite low across the whole population. And so these studies have to be really huge. Um, and, and so you're investing a lot in, in, in the phase three study uh, to, to, to be able to establish efficacy as well as safety. And it's just not feasible to, to do that for all of the different candidates that we have in the pipeline going forward. So the aim of human challenge uh, from of all the different types of pathogen challenge that we have is to be able to triage those candidates at an earlier stage where the most promising candidates go through and the ones which really show no efficacy signal at that early stage can, can be discarded in favour of the ones which look better. OK, thank you. So uh, there's a question about ethics, actually, and um, how can this is uh, from a YouTube. Um, how, how can the ethical issues pointing and be overcome? And, and there's a little list of things like benefit sharing, limits to risk, right to withdraw informed consent, etc. And payment actually is also mentioned. Would you, do you want to just briefly comment on the ethics? Yes, obviously it's a very complex area and we could talk for hours on it and people do. Um, so uh, yes, there are some intrinsic tensions in these types of experimental medicine studies. But I would say that they are uh, similar in quality, if not degree, as any clinical trial. So any clinical trial, you are exposing volunteers to some potential risk, um, whether it's uh, an infection or it's an untested new drug. And there, the ethical principle is that there must be societal benefit, that there is a, a maximum threshold of risk for the individual participant that you, you cannot go over. And for a uh, human infection challenge, uh, in general, the, the infection needs to be either completely self-limiting with no long-term side effects um, or completely treatable with antibiotics or, or another treatment. And if you can fulfill those uh, basic requirements, then it's possible to consider the model as, as something to go forward with. And in fact, the WHO has a uh, working group which assesses and has been thinking about the ethics of human infection challenge uh, for quite a while and um, and they have a paper on SARS-CoV-2 challenge which was very comprehensive and, and helpful in in both informing us but also the ethics committee that independently assessed our study. Okay, thank you, Chris. So I'll move now to questions that have been asked of Adrian, but I think uh, will also be relevant to some of the rest of you. Again, sort of continuing this sort of theme, if you like, of safety and ethics. So the specific question that's asked here is um, the what, uh, and it was directed at Adrian. What are the safety and environmental concerns over the applied materials? How can the lack of comprehensive database, the toxicity and the conversion from research to industry in nanomedicine be overcome. And I was wondering whether, Calvin, you could follow up at Adrian's answer by, by actually saying how you see your basic research into your, your iron uh, sort of metabolism, if you like, um, being potentially translated and what might be the issues from the safety point of view, bearing in mind, as you said on your, uh, I think one of your very first slides, how, you know, we all need iron and it's not uh, obviously something that's specific to the pathogen. So sorry if I've talked a little bit to make you forget what the question was, Adrian, but it's to do with the safety and environmental concerns of using nanoparticles. 
Exactly. So we have to take a lot into consideration, of course, in terms of safety and environmental impact. So that the particles I worked with, they are designed to be degradable. So in the past, I've, I've studied lots of materials that are non-degradable. So that's really something I wanted to integrate. So they will already degrade in the body. And even if they're uh, secreted by the body, they will be um, degraded in the environment. So that's definitely a very important thing. But of course, a lot of uh, additional studies have to be done on a new type of material. And it's not, not an easy fix. You know, it, it depends on very small details if something is, is good or bad. And so in the end, if you have a, a good structure that does the activity you want, you need to do lots and lots of studies to figure out yeah, what the impact is. Okay, thank you. Calvin, is there anything you'd like to be saying from your perspective? Yeah, so I think, like I said before, iron associated disorders, at least in humans, if left untreated, you know, can be very um, lethal. And there has to be tight levels, um, tight control levels for both systemic and intracellular iron levels. And what I showed is that the main mechanism for iron uptake in trypanosomes is using this receptor on its surface. Um, the transferrin receptor. Now we have collaborators in, 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 in Kenya who have developed a panel of nanobodies which can specifically recognize the parasite receptor and not the human receptor. And so what we're planning to do, hopefully, is that if we can identify sequence variants that enable trypanosomes to expand their host reservoir, we can um, specifically take some of these nanobodies that recognize the trypanosome receptor and not the human receptor as a mechanism to um, target trypanosome infection specifically. So that would be one translatable aspect of our work. OK, thank you. Ellie, is there anything you'd like to add to what's been said? No, at this point, I think that you know, it's great, great answer so far. Thanks. Yeah. So are there any ethical issues associated with putting up experimental huts? <laughs> I mean, that would... yeah, yeah, so I, I mean, there's you could sort of go down the, the the route of you know, as as we need to start minimising our footprint, and and we're using billions of mosquito nets which are made of polyester or polyethylene product. You could you know could start thinking about um, what that as a waste management issue needs to be. Do, you know, do we need to have a recycling plan for those nets? Arguably yes. Um, polyester and polyethylene are two of the major plastics that go into ocean waste. So anything we can do to limit that so that's one thing there's also the issue of local um manufacture most nets are made outside of africa and so having um you know investing in local um manufacture of these types of nets reduces those transportation costs that are associated with carbon emissions and so there's quite a lot of interesting kind of ways you could really shift the industry to help reduce your carbon footprint and to, to sort of recover plastics from the environment and those kind of challenges that I think are, are sort of all associated with with vector control. Um, so yeah, that's some, some things you could think. Thank you, that's uh, uh, wonderful there because it's nice to sort of have all of the different perspectives um, relating to what was the a quite focused original question. So I just want to join two questions together for um, Adrian relating to, uh, it's been touched on, but the uh, safety of nanoparticles, specifically immune response. So Marco has said, is there any side effect of immune response triggered by the nanoparticles? And um, uh, that's Marco Bryones or Bryones. Uh, and Charles Bangham, how widely are the nanoparticles distributed? Do they go into the CNS? Um, and what are the side effects in vivo? Yeah, so that's definitely something we need to study much more. So we just started with uh, in vivo trials. So we looked at, at organs, uh, slices to see if there's any, any issue, but we didn't see anything. But we haven't done any broad like distribution study yet. So that's something that will have to come and see exactly where the particles go. But very typically, we are going intravenously. So then most of the particles are ending up in liver and spleen. That's very typical for, for nanoparticles. And that's how they're eliminated from the bloodstream, at least. But again, as I said, it's, it's a, a lot of, of work you need to do in this area, and that's something if you start and finding something that is is doing the job, then of course there's lots of more things that will have to come, and that's what we need to study uh, in much more detail. Okay, thank you, Adrian. A question for Calvin: uh, Is it known if the natural animal hosts of African trypanosomes restrict iron availability 
as part of their response to infection by, for example, hepcidin expression? Um, well, we know half of the, the, the question. So we know that in the natural trypanosome infection, there's significant breakdown of red blood cells, and this leads to ion deprivation. But also there is significant increase in erythropoiesis for red blood resynthesis, um, red blood cell resynthesis, and this leads to increased iron levels. So we know that trypanosomes experience both iron deprived environments and also survive in excess iron environments. Now, whether they modulate hepcidin, expression of hepcidin is currently unknown. And so that's the third part of our research, which we've just started with um, Kit Matthews over in Edinburgh, treating um, mice which are infected with trypanosomes with hepcidin, and then um, looking at the, the response, both at the parasite level and at the host level. So we don't really know if they modulate hepcidin expression or not. And that's what we are currently doing um, at the moment. Okay, so we're just going to finish with the final question for Chris. It's got a number of uh, thumbs up on it. And apologies to those of you who put questions on the chat line. Thank you so much. But we, we haven't got time to go through all of them live, I'm afraid. Um, so it's on my screen. It might not be the most thumbs up, but it's easiest for me to see at the moment. So it's anonymous. Um, it's saying with a handful of vaccines already in use and many more in development, how many head-to-head -head comparative studies are you hoping to undertake? In particular, will your choices reflect the developing evidence around the degree of vaccine waning, if at all possible? Yeah, it's a great question. I think you know head-to-head -head comparisons are, are one of the real potential strengths of doing these studies because they can be small and because you can really test the, the products against each other since you're using exactly the same virus strain dose and, and inoculum method. Um, the, the issue is always going to be capacity. So these are inpatient studies and, and uh, we just don't have the capacity to do a lot of these, these types of trials. Um, so I think our approach at Imperial is to focus on um, areas of our particular scientific interest, which will mainly be to, related to mucosal immunity. So we're particularly interested in uh, vaccines or interventions which can reduce viral shedding from the respiratory tract, the nose or the, or the lung. Um, and so that's probably the area that we're going to prioritise going forward. But as I was saying in my talk, I think that really the vision is to increase our capacity in the UK and globally. Um, it's interesting to think about how the pandemic is progressing at different rates around the world and, and how studies can be designed differently with the local populations and the pandemic you know, progress and environment in mind. And so um, you could imagine different questions being asked and different needs being addressed. Um, if we could establish these models more widely. And, and I think that, again, the vision is to develop a, a sort of global network where we can conduct multi-centre trials and try and involve as, as many vaccine candidates as we can accommodate in those, um, in those uh, facilities. Okay, thank you very much, Chris. Thank you, everyone, for responding to the questions. A very uh, lovely integrated discussion, I hope, and also reflecting diversity of the centre, but uh, sorry, of the Institute, but, but hopefully indicating how so much research is interrelated. And the, obviously, the platform of the Institute of Infection is going to allow and stimulate um, a lot more collaborations. So thank you very much for to the speakers. We now have a break of about an hour if everyone would return at uh, 1.25 for the start of the afternoon session. Thank you.
So good afternoon. Welcome back, everybody. We have another very interesting session for you with a, a number of uh, exciting speakers. They're all fairly short talks, so please continue to put your questions in the Q&A window and we'll deal with them in the panel session at the end. So without further ado, please let me introduce Professor Graham Cook from Infectious Diseases, who's going to talk to us about how do we eliminate viral hepatitis. Thanks, Nilly. Uh, we got there. So um, thank you very much to the organisers uh, for the invitation to talk today. Uh, and uh, thank you for the invitation to this overall launch of this exciting initiative for the uh, new institute. Um, I'm going to talk about some of the work we've been doing related to the challenge of eliminating viral hepatitis. And I think now more than ever, ever we realise the multidisciplinary nature of what's required to tackle these big challenges. I'm just going to touch on some of that, so partly around clinical trials, but particularly on some cross-faculty collaboration, which I think is helpful. Um, for those less familiar, then viral hepatitis uh, brings together a number of viruses, but two of those, hepatitis B and hepatitis C, account for most of the mortality we see globally. And we did some work some years ago now uh, with the Global Burden Project trying to estimate this, and it's very clear that viral hepatitis is one of the leading causes of mortality. Yeah. And what this figure shows you is, is the numbers of deaths each year in different parts of the world. There's about 1.2 1.3 million in total at the moment and hepatitis B and hepatitis C account for over 95 percent of those and, and you can see uh, the high burden particularly in Southeast Asia and, and the fairly similar distribution in that region uh, that is attributed to either of these viruses. They're both quite different in terms of their biology um, but the common point they have in common is that it is liver failure, cirrhosis uh, and liver cancer which leads to death. And if we look very briefly at the trends over time, then in contrast to TB, HIV and malaria, where we've seen declines in mortality over recent years, the trend for hepatitis B and C is the opposite and is predicted to increase further. And we could maybe discuss this later, but there really hasn't been similar attention or investment to hepatitis as there has been to some of these other equally or similarly important infectious diseases. Um, and we do have some tools that we can use to tackle these. So. Uh, I'll focus today particularly on hepatitis C, but for hepatitis B in particular, there's a very effective vaccine and I have colleagues in hepatology and public health who are working a lot on that particular area. Uh, for hepatitis C, we don't have a vaccine, uh, but we do have treatment and that changes what we can do uh, in terms of a public health response to, to combat viral hepatitis. Treatment itself has transformed hugely in the last few years. So uh, only eight years ago, the treatment of hepatitis C was, was quite long, six to 12 months. It involved injections of interferon with quite nasty side effects and combinations with other tablets, which also had toxicity. Uh, and cure was far from guaranteed for patients undertaking these courses. But really, in one of the most uh, transformative changes in medicine in the last few years, we now have at least four different combinations of tablet therapy, which are much shorter, eight to 12 weeks, have much better toxicity profiles and a much higher probability of curing infection. So not only has this transformed outcomes for patients, but it's transformed our thinking about the condition and what can be achieved in terms of elimination. And some of the questions we've been interested in from the point of view of trials is how we best use these treatments, and in particular, which patients we can cure with very short courses of therapy, which may be cost effective in some settings. Um, and one aspect of this work has been looking at the different genotypes of virus. And so um, this map shows you the relative prevalence of different genotypes in different parts of the world, um, the colour representing different genotypes. And I'm just going to talk briefly about genotype 6, which is relatively uncommon globally, but it's the pink area in Southeast Asia, which is the region where it's more common. Um, and in the development of these drugs in recent years, there's been relatively little attention on genotype 6 because it isn't found very commonly in, in the wealthier economies. Um, and so we partnered up with uh, the MRC Clinical Trials Unit and a Wellcome Trust major overseas program in, in Ho, Ho Chi Minh City about four years ago. And we now have a program running of strategic clinical trials in a region which has got a very high burden of disease. It does have access to generic medications, um, but we're trying to understand which are the best combinations and how best to use them. Uh, and what I won't go in detail about these trials now. We've got our first uh, publication out recently from the pilot study funded by um, some use, uh, GCRF money, uh, and that shows that we can give a relatively short combination of therapy to patients with advanced liver disease, 
and achieve very high cure rates. And we now have a large strategic program ongoing. Um, but what I'll focus on a bit more is some of the collaborations internally and, and the work related to this um, in relation to the multidisciplinary approach to elimination. And one example is in the biology of the virus. And this is a study we did on the back of a previous trial uh, in different genotype of infection. Uh, where in over 500 people we did detailed chromosomal typing across all the chromosomes of these individuals and sequenced the virus in, in totality and asked the question about how variation in the human genome affected variation in the virus and these stronger lines represent those associations. For those familiar, and we heard a bit yesterday about the genetics of infection, uh, we see a clear association between MHC variability uh, and, and variability in the virus. Um, but surprisingly, we also found an area in a different chromosome, chromosome 19, which seemed to be associated with, um, with, with, with the variability in the virus too. And that gives us a different insight into how the virus and the host interact. And this is an area that we're going to be looking at more in future uh, and looking in particular at the other genotypes of infection. Um, and I'll just, in the second half of this, just touch on some of the cross-faculty collaborations that we've had. And I think one of the great strengths of working at Imperial and the sort of work that the Institute can foster are these, the, are these kind of collaborations. And for me, the trials that we do sit at the centre of lots of different as aspects of work that span engineering, medicine, business school, School of Public Health and our Public Health England and our uh, trust partners. Um, and one of those collaborations in particular was with the School of Public Health and, and Tim Hallett's team uh, and others in medicine. And what we looked at here was some modelling work to try and understand which interventions were going to be needed to achieve the hepatitis C elimination targets. And if we look at this uh, along the graph here, then over time we're predicting how many deaths we expect to see from hepatitis C under the current status quo. Um, and what we really want to do by 2030 is to get to the WHO target of a 60% reduction in mortality. Uh, and we can see that if we improve prevention through blood and needle safety and the provision uh, to those who inject drugs of harm reduction, uh, we can make some progress, although it takes a long time to do that. We can increase that. We can increase progress more quickly if we can offer the newer therapies that I discussed earlier, earlier in infection. Um, and one of the questions that we've worked on with the business school, and you'll probably hear some of this from Marissa later, is, is about policies that can improve access to treatment. So in particular, voluntary licensing, which is a means of allowing originators to um, support development and manufacture of generic medications in low income countries, and which has been very effective in, in achieving access for HIV and some progress in terms of achieving access for hepatitis C. And then finally, so if we really want to hit these targets on the red line, we need a very big increase in testing through the communities. And um, I think that over the last few years, I've had a very productive um, collaboration with Chris Tumazu through bioengineering. And one part of this quite complex challenge is the diagnostics themselves. And I think we've seen in uh, recent year, recent months in particular, an increasing recognition of, of the importance of diagnostics and in particular simplified diagnostics. And they're a relatively neglected tool for tackling infections as a whole. And we've been working for some years on various technologies, including this one on the left, which is a, a USB stick based diagnostic that we originally developed as a way of detecting HIV viral load and now been working on for hepatitis C. And although that's still some way from the clinic, I think this has allowed us over the last 18 months to pivot very quickly into other rapid technologies and the success of getting COVID nudged to the clinic really was built on the infrastructure that was there through collaborations between engineering and medicine and there are many other examples of this too. Clearly, problems like elimination of any infection are complex, and I think we all appreciate it needs a multidisciplinary approach. We've pulled together um, some some couple of years ago now where we thought things needed to go in, in the context of viral hepatitis and brought together clinicians and technologists and public health people, including uh, those with expertise in finance, to try and understand what the priorities needed to be at national level, international level and in R&D. And I think for those interested in this particular problem, I'd point you towards this document, which is which is fairly weighty and has a long list of recommendations at the end of it. I'm just going to finish by focusing on one of those uh, and really just to highlight the importance of one of our partners, you know, which is the, the trust locally, which bears the college's name. And within the clinic there, we have a cohort of patients infected with HIV and hepatitis C, where we've had a really focused effort to scale up treatment in that group. And what we've seen here over the last 
three or four years, there's a very substantial reduction in the numbers of new infections we're seeing over that period of time. And through the British HIV Association, we've set a number of targets with the concept of microelimination, where we can define a small subgroup of patients in a very specific way uh, and measure our progress against targets. And we actually had an aim of, of treating 100% of patients who had co-infection by April 2021. We almost met that despite the pandemic. Uh, and I'm pleased to say that our last patient, I think, has started on treatment last week. So we've, there are very substantial gains that have been made locally in terms of elimination. And I think we need examples like this at, at many different levels, many different settings as part of this overall initiative uh, towards achieving elimination goals globally. Um, you can get a sense that this is extremely collaborative. There are lots of people involved here. I couldn't possibly do justice to, to naming them, so I won't. But I thank everybody who's been involved in this over the last 10 years or so. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you very much, uh, Graeme. That was very, very uh, interesting. I hope we'll get some questions coming through. Uh, our next speaker is Matthew Child from Life Sciences, and he's going to tell us about fantastic beasts and how to kill them. OK, everybody, so thank you ever so much for the invitation to speak today. Um, it's it's really exciting to be a part of this institute launch and so really the work i'm going to be talking to today has has been driven by a, a very talented phd student in my lab henry benz who is now uh, in the process of writing up his thesis and um, to start off with let's think about what fantastic beasts we're interested in as a lab uh, we're actually particularly interested in these ape complex and parasites and so these parasites uh, are form of broad phyla that include the malaria parasite and then also the parasites responsible for uh, cryptosporidiosis and also toxoplasmosis. So for us, toxo is our parasite of interest and it's, it's a pretty astonishing parasite in that around about 30% of the world's population is or has been uh, infected. So you're talking about um, about two and a half billion people and, and really think about how that infection affects um, our biology is, is still a kind of great unknown, I would say, in the field. So there are no real effective vaccines um, in humans. There are some available for, for livestock. Uh, typically, the infection is held in check and isn't an issue. But if you're immunocompromised, it, it is a big deal. So uh, during the 1980s HIV, uh, the AIDS pandemic, um, toxoplasmosis was the leading cause of death for people with HIV. So current drugs are, are, are pretty not awesome would be a, the best way to say it. Um, they're very, they're kind of, there's a lot of toxicity issues and um, there is increasing prevalence of some drug resistance occurring. And so one thing we've started to think about is, is other drug options. So covalent small molecules have really kind of come back into the clinic. And this is being principally driven through the um, market success, really, of these oncogenic kinase inhibitors that target uh, reactive cysteines on uh, specific oncogenic kinases, so such as uh, fafnib and ibrutinib. And so these are covalent small molecules. They attach to a target. They don't let go. And over the past, uh, say, 10 years or so, um, we've really seen an acceleration of these hitting the market. And I think if you're interested in this, um, Amgen just recently got their uh, FDA approval for a uh, molecule called Lumacras, which it targets the G12C mutation on uh, KRAS, um, which is associated with uh, lung cell carcinomas. But they're really an untapped resource for antimicrobials. And so one way you can kind of go about starting to look for targets for these covalent small molecule inhibitors is to actually say, OK, so how about we take our proteome of potential targets and we try and profile um, which uh, amino acids on decorating the surface of proteins are reactive and could be targeted with covalent small molecule drugs. And so you can kind of profile a proteome with a small molecule that will react with, say, in this instance, a cysteine. And then with quantitative proteomics, we can discover these reactive amino acids that could be potential druggable sites on new potential targets. And these chemistry, these probes are now available for a range of different amino acids. So you can actually profile within a proteome um, a range of different surface displayed amino acids. So cysteine, serines, lysines, there's a whole suite available. And, and the number that are kind of coming online is, is really accelerating at this moment. And so with our interest being toxoplasma, we decided to, to give this a go. So we profiled the cysteines, reactive cysteines in toxo. And um, I'm going to kind of not 
dwell too much on the methodology, but broadly you take your proteome and you treat it with two different concentrations of your probe of interest, a low concentration and a high concentration. Uh, with, the, with the underlying uh, rationale being at a high concentration of probe, you're going to hit all of your reactive cysteines. At a low concentration of probe, you're going to highlight and or react with very um, the more reactive subset. And then with a quantitative mass spec approach, you can actually combine those samples and compare them side by side. And that allows you to really uh, get a sense of cysteine reactivity. We did this with TOXO and we identify uh, a broad spread of cysteine reactivity. And these are just your protein hits ranked by um, the cysteine on them and the, the relative reactivity of that cysteine. Um, and what we see is we see a range of reactivity and that, this is not surprising. So because of the specific nature of the chemistry of that cysteine side chain, the amino acid environment smiling on the protein will affect its reactivity towards your chemical probe. And this is what makes you more or less reactive for a specific covalent drug. Uh, looking at this reactive subset in a little bit more detail, we see proteins you might expect to see. So um, proteins that we know are reliant on reactive cysteine mechanisms and then some kind of slightly strange ones such as this myosin protein. But ultimately you then have this list right so you have this list of proteins which you know you can hit with a small molecule inhibitor but which ones are actually the most promising and so this is really uh, I would say a major bottleneck in terms of prioritization of targets for drug discovery pipelines and so we decided to tackle this head-on um, and come up with a new way to do this because typically Typically, the way you would do it is you take a, a protein of interest, such as this hypothetical protein. And then over a period of time, you would, once we've identified that this has a reactive cysteine, we then have to show we can knock the protein out, identify a phenotype, and then in the background of a conditionally knockoutable gene, reintroduce a uh, wild type protein, show we can rescue the phenotype, and then start to introduce mutations of this cysteine. So really to try and get this idea of, is this one particular reactive cysteine important for protein function and would therefore be an, a very good drug target? This is a very slow process and you're talking at least probably it's six months if you're lucky. And so to get at this in a, a better way, we decided to try and uh, address this by looking at these lists of proteins um, in a more systematic fashion. So rather than cherry picking out targets that we think would be promising, instead saying, okay, cool, we have all of these reactive cysteines, can we actually directly identify um, which ones of these cysteines are contributing to protein function and which ones are therefore um, your kind of optimal drug targets? And so the way we do this, uh, the strategy we came up with is we would use a, a CRISPR based approach. So we use a targeted um, nuclease that we send to a specific reactive cysteine in the genome of our parasite. And then in that same um, transfection, we provide the cell with multiple options for uh, repairing that deletion of that cysteine. Sometimes they can repair with a wild type and then other cells will repair with a different range of mutants that we can introduce. Now, we're working with essential proteins. So if we introduce a stop codon, the parasites die. In the presence of a wild type uh, codon, the parasites should survive. And then we can really assess what's happening when we introduce these different mutants. And we grow these two um, after the transfection. We have our range of mutants. We grow them competitively. And then you can imagine that if you are a wild type parasite, you'll grow normally. If we've introduced the stop codon and knocked out that gene, affected the gene product, parasites will die. And so then you can get a sense of whether or not your protein is um, functional or non-functional. And then according to a next-gen sequencing readout, so a quantitative sequencing readout, we can estimate the, uh, or kind of actually quantify whether or not a, a given site is contributing to protein function. And so we did this with a, a well-characterized iron sulfur oxidase. This works pretty well. And we can show that with this essential cysteine, regardless of the mutation we introduced, the parasites are non-functional. With the myosin light chain, we know these two cysteines are non-functional for the protein, but they are reactive. Likewise, we can generate these data and show that if, regardless of whatever mutation we introduce, the parasites are absolutely fine. So this was really promising. And then we've recently kind of gone on and done this with our whole subset of um, reactive cysteine containing proteins. So this really now serves us as a way to triage um, straight off the bat which ones of these are interesting not only because the cysteine is reactive and therefore potentially a good uh, targetable uh, target for covalent small molecules but that are also um, essential for the function of that protein and we see some loss of function mutants gain of function mutants and some non-functional and it's, it's pretty exciting for us at this moment. Um, 
we see, like I said, some deleterious and gain of function. And what was interesting is when we really boiled down into these data, what was kind of surprising is we see this enrichment in um, protein translation in terms of proteins coated with or decorated with um, reactive cysteines that are essential for protein function. And so looking into this in a bit more detail, um, these protein translation associated cysteines were decorating the ADS ribosome subunit. When we looked at these again, some of these was conserved um, with our related parasite, Plasmodium falciparum, but not with humans. What was kind of neat is that we did a very, very kind of quick and dirty experiment with, uh, in collaboration with Jake Baum's lab, where we said, okay, so cool. So if these cysteines are important for protein translation apparatus, potentially if we treat um, parasites with a cysteine targeted small molecule, can we see that this would actually affect protein translation? And this is indeed the fact. So we did this um, with an in vitro translation assay where we're actually assessing the capacity of a parasite lysate to produce protein. And we could actually see that with a small molecule, a very highly reactive cysteine targeted small molecule, we're able to actually um, negative kind of inhibit parasite translation. And, and kind of what's pretty cool for us is we don't actually have any effect on the human um, translation. So we're pursuing this a little bit more now in the collaboration with uh, our colleagues up in Dundee to look at more drug-like molecules. But I think uh, like what I hope I've convinced you about is, is really the need for us to be able to prioritize these targets is to have a more efficient way of looking at drug targets um, for the future. And I think thinking about the chemistry of these amino acids, not only as, as kind of druggable sites, but also for post-translational modifications, I think it's a really interesting uh, avenue for both drug and biology discovery. So it's system agnostic, independent, let's say, and we believe we can actually apply it to a range of different disease contexts now. And so with that, I'll just leave uh, with the acknowledgements as I think I'm probably running right up to time. Um, particularly just mention the cross-departmental um, collaborations with Ed Tate, who's co-supervising the student with me, Jake Baum's lab, Jeff Baldwin, and then around the world. Thank you very much. Great. Thank you very much, Matthew. And again, uh, to the audience, do please keep uh, your questions coming in. Our next speaker is uh, Rachel Edgar from Infectious Disease. She's going to talk about biological timing, homeostasis and viral infections. So over to you, Rachel. You just need to unmute, Rachel. Apologies. Hi, everybody. Uh, many thanks for the invitation to speak today. Um, I'll start with a seemingly simple question. Uh, what actually determines how many new virus particles are produced from an infected cell? I'm sure you're aware that each virus has a replication cycle of horrible complexity, but there are some commonalities. Uh, Hi, Rachel. You've gone on to mute again for some reason. Oh. There you so, go. Perfect. Right. As I was saying, so um, there are some commonalities such as co-opting the protein synthesis machinery, but also the innate response of the cell is critical, be it by mounting antiviral defences via interferon induction uh, or in fact um, uh, cell death, which really does put a dampener on the production of new virus. Uh, under physiological conditions, uh, the um, Cells have an intrinsic mechanism to keep track of time, and these circadian clocks cause daily rhythms in cell state. This might seem like the opposite of homeostasis, uh, where the cell tries to keep conditions relatively stable. But over the last 10 years, we've amassed evidence that a key function of biological timekeeping is to keep all of these different homeostatic processes within a toler tolerable range. And given the breadth of circadian regulation, uh, it wasn't a big surprise when we showed that the outcome of virus infection depends on the time of day, both in cells and mice. And this has now been shown for many different viruses. Uh, today, I'll just introduce some of our projects and hopefully illustrate how looking over different biological timeframes is a physiologically relevant tool for exploring host pathogen interactions. So starting with interferon, we initially observed restriction of viral growth in cells that lack a key circadian component, a cryptochrome, shown here in red for herpes and flu. And uh, multiple omics analyses of these cells showed significant enrichment for type 1 interferon pathways at both the mRNA and protein level compared to wild type. Essentially, they're in a permanent antiviral state. 
But under physiological conditions, cells constitutively secrete low amounts of type 1 interferon. And this is really important for expression of all of these sensing and signaling intermediates and enabling cells to rapidly respond to incoming pathogens. And it's primarily driven by NF-kappa B and C gene signaling. So why might chronic cryptochrome disruption, a circadian gene, lead to higher baseline levels of interferon? Well, cryptochrome knockouts have disrupted protein homeostasis, and each cell contains substantially more protein compared to wild type controls. Now, proteostasis is regulated by the integrated stress response, whereby phosphorylation and inactivation of the key translation initiation factor EIF2-alpha uh, halts global protein synthesis to give the system time to recalibrate. And we hypothesize that overactivation of the integrated stress response in cryptochrome knockout cells leads to an increase in baseline interferon via as yet ill-defined pathways. And so to test this, we uh, blotted wild type and cryptochrome knockout cells for phos phosphorylation of EIF2-alpha, the marker for activation of the integrated stress response, and also uh, key antiviral components, Rig I and STAT1, as a proxy for baseline interferon expression. And as predicted, the cryptochrome knockouts have higher baseline levels compared with wild type. And when we induce the integrated stress response via tunicomycin treatment, wild type cells phenocopy the cryptochrome knockouts with regards to Rig I and STAT1. So is baseline antiviral state rhythmic over 24 hours? Uh, we looked for oscillations in all three markers in mouse lung harvested at different times of day and observed significant variation over time. So we do think that antiviral state depends on biological time and that this, this is linked to circadian regulation of protein homeostasis. Investigating protein homeostasis further with our collaborators in Cambridge, we observed a circadian rhythm in cytosolic protein abundance, shown here in red. Now, such large changes in protein concentration in the crowded colloidal cytoplasm present cells with a problem. They need to maintain their osmotic potential and prevent any deleterious movement of water across the membrane. We found that cells solve this problem by exporting potassium, sodium and chloride ions as protein concentration increases, then importing them when protein concentration is falling. And so over circadian timeframes, changes in cytosolic protein are osmotically buffered, if you like, by reciprocal movements of ions. As a consequence of this, at certain times of day, uh, 36 and 60, um, the uh, cells lack the osmotic buffering capacity to accommodate new protein when translation is stimulated via serum. And this restriction is equivalent to the control here in gray, where the serum signal to synthesize this protein has been abrogated entirely by taurin-1. In the context of infection, uh, a lack of osmotic buffering capacity would either severely limit accumulation of viral proteins or disrupt osmotic homeostasis and kill the cell. So I got to thinking, are there any other ways that cells could buffer their osmotic potential against such a rapid onslaught of new protein? And thinking about the solvent here, water, in the crowded cytoplasm, there is really limited free water, the bulk sol solvent shown here in dark blue. And most water is in a more structured or cybotactic form, hydrating individual macromolecules and phase separated domains, shown here in light blue. Upon a hyperosmotic challenge, water leaves the cell and the ratio of structured to free water increases, and that should increase the osmotic potential. The reverse happens upon hypoosmotic challenge, where water enters the cell and increases the available bulk solvent. I hypothesize that cells might mitigate an increase in water potential by shifting macromolecules into phase separated biomolecular condensate, which should require fewer water molecules to hydrate them and therefore liberate structured water to reduce the osmotic burden. Conversely, decondensation would increase structured or cybertactic water and mitigate the effect of a hypoosmotic challenge. Taking this idea further, the amount of water required to hydrate macromolecules in cells is hypothesized to increase as temperature decreases, affecting the structure to free water ratio in a similar way to a hyperosmotic challenge and the converse for a temperature increase, which should mimic a hypoosmotic challenge. So we made several testable predictions. Firstly, if restoring osmotic homeostasis is indeed a primary driver for phase separation in cells, then either a temperature a decrease or hyperosmotic challenge should increase biomolecular condensation, and a temperature increase or hyperosmotic challenge should lead to decondensation. 
And we've shown this in many different ways now, but here we used a well-characterized fluorescent reporter of phase separation, FUS GFP, and microscopy with microfluidics. So starting at a normal isosmotic medium in 37 degrees, if we drop the temperature to 20 degrees, we'd predict an increase in condensation. And this is what we see. If we then switch to hypoosmotic medium, we predict this counteracts the temperature drop and that the reporter should decondense. And this occurs rapidly. If we go back to normal medium, we'd expect condensation to happen again, which it does. And finally, if we increase the temperature back to 37 degrees, we'd predict decondensation back to baseline, which also happens. Now, these findings have many physiological implications, but perhaps the most striking example is on cell viability. So uh, we, here we subjected cells shown in blue uh, to 24 hours at zero degrees C. And I hope you can see that in normal medium, uh, this extreme cold shock unsurprisingly kills the cells. But if you place the cells in hypoosmotic medium, you can actual, actually rescue viability. So in summary, osmotic buffering capacity constrains protein synthesis and phase separation can rapidly buffer osmotic challenges and temperature fluctuations. And we were just starting to explore the consequences of these biophysical phenomenon on a viral replication and particle assembly when COVID hit. So my final slide is a translational application of our work using osmotic disruption to inactivate airborne virus particles. We reasoned that non-toxic agents could disrupt glycoprotein hydration shells and therefore interrupt viral infectivity if they accumulate at high enough concentration within respiratory droplets. So low levels in the air, high levels in the droplet. And to test this, uh, we borrowed a piece of kit from the Barclay lab next door, the virus transmission tunnel, which I love, um, where you can nebulize virus and flow it over plates of cells at different distances with or without our aerosolized osmotic disruptors in the exposure, exposure tunnel. Uh, here are some exa uh, plate examples showing a clear decrease in infectious flu when it encounters an osmotic disruptor in the tunnel. And if you quantify this over many runs, you see consistent and substantial reduction in flu transmission using aerosolized osmotic disruptors. These are also effective against SARS-CoV-2 and every other virus and pseudovirus system that we've tested so far, including HIV, Ebola and all of the SARS variants. And we really hope that this can be developed into a safe way to reduce respiratory infectious burden in clinical settings and beyond. And this is a, a call out really, if you have a respiratory disease model um, or expertise in engineer, aerosol engineering or any clinical containment of infections or any other relevant field, then we'd absolutely love to collaborate with you. Um, so I'll leave it there and just to acknowledge the people who made this work possible, in particular, my brilliant postdoc Christine Stiles and the Barclay Lab, and also my long term collaborators at the LMB in Cambridge. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you, Rachel. Uh, next up, we have Nuria Oliva Jorge from Bioengineering, who's going to talk to us about nanotechnology enabled gene therapy for infection. Over to you, Nuria. Thank you. Let me just um, share my. OK. OK, so um, thank you, everyone. Um, thank you for the invitation uh, to present today at the launch for the Institute of Infection. And um, I'm going to I'm going to talk to you about um, nanotechnology enabled gene therapy to treat infection. And because this is uh, I'm from bioengineering, it's a little bit of a different talk. I thought I would start by introducing myself first and what we do in the group. And um, I'm an organic chemist by training, and uh, I specialized in bio nanomaterials for healing and drug delivery during my PhD. And I also uh, took uh, medical school courses and did clinical rotations to understand uh, the unmet clinical needs and how to um, uh, sorry, develop my biomaterials and nanomaterials to, um, you know, sort of like bridge the gap between uh, bench top and that side. And with all of this, Yes, I came to Imperial as a postdoc fellow uh, to work in Dr. Anquist's lab in DNA nanotechnologies to, um, to heal broken bones. And I also um, worked on um, sort of like increasing my my skill set by learning about medical technology startups and how to bring technologies to the market. And with all of this, I am now an Imperial College Research Fellow in the Department of Bioengineering, where we are working at the intersection of biomaterials, biology, and medicine to uh, treat human disease and promote healthy aging, mostly 
within the area of digital uh, engineering and regenerative medicine. So uh, just, uh, you know, like, like uh, by, I am by no uh, stretch of the imagination and um, an expert in infection. But I do recognize that a lot of the technologies that we uh, develop in my group and in the group of bioengineering can be leveraged to treat infection. And so this is uh, what I want to talk to you today about. I want to tell you about one of the projects that we have in our group uh, where we are developing wound dressings to deliver gene therapy to treat chronic wounds, which are wounds that uh, just won't heal. And they affect over 1.2 million people in the UK every year. And they, uh, they cost the NHS uh, almost six billion pounds annually. And because of our lifestyle choices and the, uh, the fact that we live in an aging society, these wounds are actually increasing at an alarming rate. For instance, between 2013 and 2018, they increased by 93%. And the problem is that there's no good way of uh, healing these wounds and they get easily infected. And uh, in fact, the last evidence summary from NICE um, revealed that there is not enough evidence that advanced antimicrobial uh, wound dressings, which are the gold standard to treat these wounds, have any effects on healing. And so in my group, we decided to tackle this from a different perspective. And so we took a step back and looked at the biology behind chronic wounds. And uh, this is one of the many studies that have been conducted over the years, but basically the, the, what the, the take home message is that uh, fibroblasts are the cells that are responsible for the wound healing process. And if you take fibroblasts that are right here at the edge of a chronic wound, uh, not only do they look very different than healthy fibroblasts, but they also have an inability to close wounds. They lack, they have impaired um, proliferation and migration compared to healthy uh, fibroblasts. And when you look at their gene expression, you very quickly realize that a lot of genes are either under or overexpressed compared to healthy fibroblasts. And so, uh, it begs the question, can we use gene therapy to restore healthy cell expression? And um, so, I mean, this is like an easy question, but the problem is that there are certain limitations when it comes to delivering genes uh, to our primary cells. While it's relatively easy to deliver genes to, let's say, cancer cells or immune cells, primary human cells are actually pretty tough to uh, transect. And so the uh, gold standard right now, the one that has the, the, the method that has the highest transfection efficiency is called electroporation, which is a physical method by which um, you apply an electrical field to cells and you open micropores that allow the, allow the entry of genetic material inside cells. Um, and while this works very well, um, it's not very translational, so it's not really, it doesn't have a clinical application. Uh, if we want to look into other um, ways to deliver gene, uh, genetic material that is more translational, we've now all heard, you know, through the COVID vaccines about viral vectors. Um, which basically what we do is we take uh, viruses, like lentiviruses, adenoviruses, and take advantage of their machinery to introduce RNA or DNA inside of cells. The problem with these is that they're immunogenic and it's not very easy to control which cells um, are being uh, transfected with these genes. Alternatively, we can use non-viral carriers, which again, we've all heard now about liposomes through the um, COVID vaccines. Also, polymeric uh, nanoparticles are another uh, option. These are non-immunogenic and they use endosomal pathways to enter the cells. The problem is that their transfection efficiency is a lot lower than those of viruses. So this is one of the limitations that we're working with. The other one is more related to the wound healing process that, as we all know, takes days to weeks. So ideally, you want to deliver these gene therapy over time in a sustained manner. Because of the uh, localized nature of wounds, we can do this with biomaterials. Biomaterials have been used and developed since, you know, 50 years ago, Langer seminal paper um, showing that different biomaterials, different polymeric scaffolds could deliver uh, proteins, of, or, you know, therapeutic uh, proteins at different rates. Uh, we now know that we can use biomaterials and we can tune their properties to deliver therapy locally in a sustained manner. And myself, in my, during my PhD and my postdocs, I've uh, worked a lot with delivering nanoparticles from um, hydrogel scaffolds, uh, by, in which I, by altering the properties of the scaffold, I can deliver the nanoparticles and hence the therapy at different um, uh, uh, rates. So with all this in mind, then we thought, okay, the best way to treat these chronic wounds using gene therapy is to um, uh, develop a, an injectable material, an ideally injectable because we would apply it in the wound and cross-link to fill these very irregular chronic wounds. 
and will be loaded with nanoparticles that can be delivered over time and we can control this delivery rate based on the material properties and these uh, nanoparticles would then deliver the right genes to fibroblasts to promote proliferation and migration in close chronic organisms. Um, so to test this hypothesis in a proof of concept, what we did is we deliver, uh, we loaded these nanoparticles with messenger RNA encoding for green fluorescent protein because it gives a very um, straightforward output whether or not we're transfecting cells, which is green fluorescence. And we tested many different formulations. These are just three of them compared to a positive control that's commercially available and a negative control, which is nothing. We do nothing to these cells. And we'll, you know, in iterations later, we th we found these nanoparticles that we call C6H C6 um, that have very high transfection efficiency of almost 80% of the cells are transfected with very low toxicity. And once we had these particles, that so we overcome the first limitation, we can actually transfect primary cells with very high efficiency. We moved on to um, developing our hydrogel scaffold where we could control the pore size. And by controlling the pore size, we have control the release. And uh, you can see in here, this is a three-dimensional rendering of the hydrogel and you can see these dots are the nanoparticles, they're homogeneously distributed, they're stable in the hydrogel, and we can deliver them over time. In this particular formulation, it takes about 10 days, but we can control that, we can make it longer or shorter based on the um, scaffold formulation. And then uh, the other very interesting thing about putting these particles in scaffolds is that we can actually um, keep these particles stable for much longer. So you can see here at 24 and 48 hours, uh, particles that are uh, free in solution, the physiological conditions start to leak the genetic material, uh, because they start to degrade, but when we put them inside the hydrogel, they're stable for much longer. And from a previous study, we're now going uh, going to go into in vivo with this, but we know from previous studies that we can deliver these nanoparticles loaded with genetic material in vivo and they have an effect over time. Uh, so it's a translational platform. So um, the, the interesting thing about this platform, this na nanoparticle uh, technology, is that it's not limited to messenger RNA. We have delivered uh, plasmid DNA and going for GFP and luciferase. We've delivered siRNAs. We're currently working in collaboration with Dr. Anquist, um, delivering microRNAs to uh, help uh, heal diabetic food ulcers with funding from the British Skin Foundation. And also, this is not uh, limited to fibroblasts. We some published data from my lab where we've actually shown that we can transfect with uh, this type of technology other cell lines like chondrocytes and keratinocytes, which are notoriously difficult to transfect. And we can do this in an in vivo setting too. So this has a lot of uh, translational potential to actually make uh, um, you know, many different um, gene therapies in vivo. So by now, hopefully I've piqued your interest and um, and and you know so understanding that we can we have a lot of potential with this platform, and especially in the wake of COVID-19 and with the approval of mRNA vaccines, it opens a, a window of possibilities to actually deliver many more mRNA therapies and vaccines for other viral diseases using this platform technology. And the main advantage that we found is that we've got data showing that our mRNA is stable for months at four degrees using these particles, which is an advantage over current vaccines that are currently being used for COVID. Um, and then uh, moving more on to like the dermal um, you know, like, uh, field, um, we know that we can transfect both fibroblasts and keratinocytes, which are the two cell lines, uh, the two cells that are present in the skin mostly. Um, and for instance, when you have chronic wounds, uh, one of the issues too is that it's, uh, they get infected very easily. So we could actually transfect the cells not just to heal better, but also to um, express antimicrobials so that we can fight infection as we help and heal. But also we can think of uh, vaccines with, for viruses that affect that infect these cells, for instance, herpes or HPV. So with all of this, I'd like to acknowledge my collaborators and my team, especially Tony, who's done uh, basically all of the work on the wound dressings and the funding sources that currently fund my lab. And with that, thank you for your attention and I'll be happy to take any questions later. Thank you. Thank you very much, Nuria. And we do have questions coming in. Do please keep them coming in. Uh, our final speaker before we go to the panel session is uh, Tiago Costa from Life Sciences, who's going to talk to us about architecture of a bacterial DNA transfer nanomachine. So over to you, Tiago. Thank you for the invitation and um, 
and for giving me the opportunity to share our unpublished data on the architecture of a bacterial DNA transfer and nanomachine. Uh, we know since the 50s that bacteria can transfer DNA among among a population. This was the, the basis of a Nobel Prize from London, Berg and Tantun back in the 50s. However, the technology to look with uh, magnifying glasses with uh, atomic resolution into the complexes that um, are behind this uh, transfer of DNA uh, haven't been uh, available so far. So. With cryo-EM, we can now uh, look at these complexes and look to the to the to the atomic details of these very uh, complicated um, uh, nanomachines. So, gram-negative bacteria can assemble a large variety a variety of bacterial uh, secretion systems. Um, that can deploy um, different different types of uh, functions in the bacteria. Uh, here you have um, a wide range of double beam, double membrane spanning bacterial secretion systems. Uh, you have the type one secretion system or R&D pumps that are uh, able um, to secrete um, uh, antibiotic. Uh, uh, drugs and um, once the bacteria is uh, in contact with uh, with those uh, compounds type 2 secretion systems that allow the bacteria to secrete toxins to the extracellular space type 3 secretion systems that um, enable the bacteria to uh, 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 secrete um, effector proteins into the eukaryotic cells and hijack particular pathways so that the bacteria can uh, survive within the host. Type 6 secretion systems, but, uh, the bacteria uses this to kill off uh, other bacterial uh, competitors and, it is to, and to, to help to establish the, 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 the bacterial niche. Uh, the focus of my lab is to study uh, the type 4 secretion systems and type 4 secretion systems uh, are the most widespread uh, secretion system in bacteria. You can find them in gram positive and gram negative uh, bacteria uh, and they de de deploy a wide variety of functions in, in bacteria. They are involved in the conjugation, which is the the uh, unidirectional transfer of the DNA from donor and recipient cells. This is a very important process because this is how antibiotic uh, resistant genes are transferred between bacteria with among a bacterial population. The type 4 secretion system are, are involved in uh, DNA, DNA release and uptake uh, to and from the extracellular environment. They are important for injection of effectors into uh, eukaryotic cells to mobilize um, DNA into the nucleus of uh, plant cells and to hijack specific pathways that allow the survival of intracellular uh, pathogens inside of the host. So, as, as I said, we knew that the conjugation for uh, now 70 years, and we all have uh, seen this or uh, uh, an image like, like this in our first year of our college studies, where we represent that the F plus cell is able to engage F minus cells, uh, and therefore uh, uh, bringing the two cells in close uh, proximity upon retraction of the F pillus, and this initiates then the transfer of DNA uh, from the donor to the recipient cells. So in my lab, in my lab, we try to understand a very fundamental question, which is how the DNA is transported from the from a donor to a recipient cell via a conjugative uh, type four secretion system. You know uh, now that there are four main sub-assemblies on this very complex nanomachine, we, we have this uh, conjugative pillus that is able to extend and, and retract, an uh, outer membrane core complex, an inner membrane complex, and several ATPases that energize the system, uh, thereby 
uh, helping in the secretion of the DNA in, from the donor to the recipient cell. Recently, we started to obtain the first a glimpse into the into the structure of this uh, machine, we have obtained a negative uh, strain um, uh, structure of the complex on a, a rather low resolution. There is tomography data also on the on the same complex, um, and we have obtained a high resolution structure of the F. Pillars. This was a rather uh, unusual uh, structure because unexpectedly it was not only made by uh, protein, uh, protein, but uh, a protein phospholipid complex. And this complex and, and this particular phospholipid was very, very specific because it created the correct electrostatic environment within the channel so that the DNA could travel uh, from a from a donor to the to the recipient cell. Since maybe twenty years ago, we know that three of of these of the proteins that in, that they are encoded on the type four secretion system are um, assembled in the in the outer membrane. Uh, so what we did was to to take the three genes that encode for these the three proteins and express them heterologously, and we, after many months of um, of a biochemistry, we were able to purify the intact complex made by these uh, three proteins, uh, and when we we image them by uh, negative, negative strain microscopy, microscopy. We can clearly see these very beautiful round shaped uh, complexes with a defined symmetry. So the next step was to take this complex into the cryo EM and solve this, uh, the structure by single particle analysis. And I won't go into the details of or on the technical aspects of the of the data proce processing, but we have obtained this very lovely two uh, D class averages where we could see a thirteen fold symmetric um, object. What what we thought it was only a, a thirteen fold symmetric object by looking at the two D class averages, but uh, for our surprise, when we solved the structure. Of this 2.1 mega, megadalton uh, complex, we actually uh, observed two different symmetries within the same complexes. This is a very, very unusual um, configuration for, um, for a, a complex where you have two different symmetries within this very large assembly. So we could see that the complex was formed by two concentric rings. Uh, uh, the outer ring with a C13 fold symmetry and uh, the, the inner ring with a C17 uh, 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 fold uh, symmetry. The, the whole complex is shaped by 69 copies of the proteins in total, where you have 26 molecules of, uh, of track K in two different uh, conformations, and I will tell you about the uh, the details in, in the next slide. Uh, 26 copies of, uh, of TRAV that shape also the, the outer ring, and then 17 copies of uh, TRAV in the, in the inner ring. When we, when we looked to the, um, to, this, uh, to the asymmetric unit that forms either the uh, outer, uh, outer ring and the inner ring, we can clearly see that the, the, we have two uh, conformations of the, of the same protein. We call it TRAK1 and TRAK2. The TRAK enter in news domain, um, they, they are pretty much the, the same. However, the C terminus uh, domain um, is able, or the two, the two C terminus domains are able to clamp the TRAV. Uh, C terminal domain forming this uh, very long belt around the, the complex holding it uh, together. Um, in the, in the in, inner ring, however, you do have uh, the TRA B 
protein, which is uh, formed by a very large beta barrel uh, protein with two half helix uh, protruding into the into the exit of the of the channel. These half helices are very mobile, uh, allowing the opening and closing of the of the channel. Uh, this is uh, uh, so, so the connections between the, the inner ring and the outer ring um, were not um, were rather were rather interesting to, to look at. When we when we look into the, the details between these two uh, rings and the connections made by, by the protein that that uh, links them together, we can see that there are this this complex. It's very um, it's very flexible, so there is almost no connections between the inner ring and the outer ring. So, which made made this complex a very very uh, dynamic complex, capable to undergo conformational changes and rotational movements between the the two rings. So, we speculate that these rotational movements could play a role. In the in the FPLUS extension and uh, retraction, uh, the reconjugation, and we came up with a model where the outer membrane complexes assemble at uh, at the outer membrane. Uh, the inner membrane complex assembles after in the in the inner membrane. The FPLUS um, polymerizes as an helical uh, filament. The, the complex opens in the in the third in the in the most um, uh, uh, upper part of the of the B and allowing the the pillars to extend and uh, retract um, during uh, conjugation. So this, and I would like to finalize by acknowledging to the people involved in the, in this project. And this was the the main project of my PhD student Imani Amin. She was uh, the driving. Uh, force of the project, also to other members of the Costa Lab, uh, MRES and the undergraduate students that directly or indirectly contributed to the project, my collaborator uh, Aravinda Nilangovan, and also the funding bodies of the project. Thank you. Great, thank you very much. So we'll now move into the panel format and we've had a lot of interesting questions come through in the Q&A um, channel. And so I'm going to kick off and we'll work around our speakers and um, they can have a question in turn. So first of all, uh, there's a question uh, for Graham, which is, about how can the risk of reinfection be reduced since hep C infection rarely induces sterilizing immunity? Yeah, no, it's an interesting point. And I think as, as the questioner, the questioner recognizes, um, hepatitis C infection and in, in natural infection doesn't induce a sterilizing immunity uh, by and large. And of course, when we're thinking about vaccine development, but then the challenge of replicating what biology can do is hard enough, and when biology, when when the natural biology doesn't achieve sterilizing immunity, developing a vaccine is even harder. So, the answer to the question depends a little bit where we are at the moment. Reinfection is a real problem, um, and it's clearly a bigger problem in parts of the world where there's a higher prevalence in the background population and there's ongoing risk behaviour. So, in some parts of the world, the answer to that will be focusing on reducing exposure and risk through clean uh, clean needles and and uh, blood product testing, for example. Uh, in our own setting, that's much more about reducing risk from injecting drug use um, by providing clean needles and so forth and, and providing education and support for people who are injecting and also for some high risk sexual practices. And then part of the answer is also about reducing the background prevalence. So I think as I showed you at the end of what I presented, um, we're seeing a, a decrease in the prevalence of hepatitis C in many communities. And of course, for the same exposure, that gives you a lower risk of getting reinfected. So I think all those things are important. And clearly what we would like is a vaccine and um, there are challenges to doing that. I, the biological challenge is, is clear, um, but I think the technical challenge of creating a vaccine is not necessarily the greatest hurdle at the moment. And I've certainly had conversations with Robin Shattuck about this. And I think our feeling was that the, the market challenge and, and, and the financing of the vaccine and who was going to pay for it is the bigger obstacle. I think there is a clear 
value in having a vaccine. And I think there will be some, some ways of achieving that. But actually, one of the more interesting challenges at the moment is that we don't have a very good way of testing one. So I think once you start to once you start to get rid of the high transmission populations, actually, where do you do your efficacy studies? Um, we don't have a good animal model access anymore with, with chimpanzees, for example. And actually, there's a quite an interesting discussion that's quite live at the moment, which we've been trying to have for some years, and it's kind of coming to fruition with some interest from the NIH about human challenge studies. I think the idea of giving uh, hepatitis C to humans seven or eight years ago was mad, um, and it was and it was widely felt to be. Um, but with the change in treatment um, and what's achievable, I think it's a much more realistic proposition. There's an interesting review of this uh, last week, in fact, in the New England Journal for those who are interested. And I think um, human challenge as an area is an area that we're really interested to develop across Imperial uh, through the Institute, but also through organisations, the, the departments uh, and the BRC. And I think this is something that we're looking at again quite seriously as to what it would take to do that. So I'm not saying we will do it, but we're certainly having an active thought about that. And that might be a way of reducing the barriers to, to, to developing a vaccine, I think. Great, thank you very much. Yeah, very interesting. Um, a question from Matthew, which is about your, your mutant panel that you use to uh, assess the cysteine function. Why did you choose the alanine, serine and tyrosine as, as the, the, the amino acids, I guess, that are, are in your mutants? So I think uh, generally alanine and serine are chosen because they're, they're considered to be small and likely to affect kind of protein um, structure. But what, what we were really hoping was um, to be able to leverage that NGS, the next-gen sequencing readout, where we have kind of a quantitative readout of how an individual mutation is affecting a protein function in cells um, to, to, to kind of get deeper data. So rather than just looking at these standard mutations, we, we actually opted to introduce that tyrosine mutation. So we did some meta um, analysis of uh, PPI destabilization data. So protein protein destabilization mutations that have been profiled um, in various uh, cancer data sets. And there seemed to be, uh, well, there is, I should say, the, the most frequent mutation of a cysteine um, when it is a destabilizing catalyst classified as a destabilizing mutation was to a tyrosine. And so this is this is why we chose tyrosine to include in the panel as well. Um, it's a more radical substitution, as you might expect. We found it was typically more deleterious to protein function. Um, we have done some analysis. It doesn't look like that's simply due to changing protein stability, uh, which is which is kind of cool. Um, so that that really is what was underlying the uh, the, the choice of those mutations. Great, thanks. Um, and we've got one for Rachel, which is about the um, osmotic disruptors. You know, do you think they could be put into an aerosol spray form and used on things like aeroplanes or, or on the underground? A bit like sometimes you see the insecticide that they use depending on where you're traveling. Uh, yes, that was a kind of uh, one of the reasons we started testing them is that, uh, yeah, they they definitely could be. And uh, they're, because they're non-toxic, of course, it reduces the risk to whoever is disinfecting or cleaning down. Um, and uh, it would also help with, with you know, turnaround time, because obviously once you disinfect something using something really nasty, then, uh, yeah, you uh, you have to leave it for a, for a while before you can, you know, reinitiate human contact. Um, so, yeah, that's one of the key advantages. And that's, well, we, we hope to test that um, in, in some form of setting, um, you know, within the next year or so. Exciting. Thanks. Um, <laughs> Nuria, one for you, which is, what's the potential for identifying predictive biomarkers for chronic wound microbiomes to serve as risk factors and guide treatment by informing patient specific tendencies of infection? So I suppose each of these um, patches that you can apply can be quite patient specific. So is there a way of using biomarkers to help you design the, the therapy? Oh, well, that, that is a great question. Um, we ideally we would want to use uh, you know biomarkers for you know basically in, in this case like the questions about um, um, microbiome and definitely microbiome you know affects the healing process. It's another you know another um, avenue to take with this platform. Um, but yeah, I mean we are uh, for instance like the the. Uh, collaboration that we have with uh, Dr. Amquist and the department, we're actually looking, it's not microbiome, but we looked at specific microRNAs that are 
um, you know, that are predictors or that are, that are spe specifically expressed in fibroblast isolated from their big foot ulcers. And this is what we're giving these patients. Right? We, we're actually looking at markers that, you know, basically predict how well, uh, you know, a wound will, will heal to actually, you know, like basically deliver that. And yes, ultimately, I mean, in this case, you know, this is not personalized. It's just something that happens with most, uh, you know, like a diabetic uh, food ulcer cells. Uh, but yeah, I mean, definitely we could go into a personalized treatment where like we look at a particular microbiome and we we'll see, you know, what are the what are the key um, things that are, you know, under or expressed and try to like basically um, like modify it or, you know, tune it to, to help heal. So yeah, I mean, that's, it, you know, it's, it's, it's a possibility, yes. <laughs> Great, thanks. Um, one for Tiago, which is, you know, now that you have sort of uncovered the structure and the function of the DNA transfer system, what, what might be some of the implications for infection and dealing with infection? Right. So, so, so the, the, the infection in terms of infecting a, a, a eukaryotic cell, um, there are other type for secretion systems that can uh, do that function. This system is very specific, it seems so, for the conjugations, for the, only the DNA transfer between donor and recipient cells. So this, this rotational movements that the complex can undergo is to accommodate to the extension and retraction of the, of the conjugative uh, pillars. I don't think uh, that the infection you will have this because the target is a is a is a completely different uh, is a completely different cell. Okay. However, there are uh, very uh, very important translations applications for these complexes. I um, Oxford Nanopore utilizes an outer membrane uh, complex in their uh, sequencing um, uh, system. So there's a there is a very big potential for all these auto-membrane complexes to be utilized as a, as a tool for um, DNA sequencing. Thank you. Rachel, there are quite a few questions for you, so I'll, I'll pick one. The first one is a bit about the fundamental biology, which is, you know, whether there's a selective advantage of diurnal variation in protein synthesis, or is it just an epiphenomenon that results from an underlying diurnal change? Um, that's a great question. So uh, we think it is um, uh, because protein synthesis is, you know, one of the most bioenergetically expensive processes that occurs in cells. And um, obviously most proteins act in complexes and you need all of the subunits to have a functional um, unit. And so by having kind of a translational burst at one particular time, uh, then you kind of ensure that you have all the subunits there so you would minimise, uh, you know, misfolding and, you know, having to degrade individual subunits like orphan subunits. And actually we, we showed this entire process in yeast, which have shorter oscillations, so um, not 24 hours, but shorter metabolic oscillations. And there we find that yeast, have, uh, they sequester and store resources until it gets to a point where they have enough and they have a big translational burst, which is osmotically compensated by the movement of ions. And then when they run out of either resources or osmotic buffering capacity, that translational burst stops. And this only happens to yeast when they are under conditions uh, where resources are really limiting. So when it's bioenergetically limited. And so we think the same thing is happening, uh, is a primary function of circadian rhythms in mammalian cells. Yeah. And another one for you. It's whether you expect similar diurnal variation in response to replicating and non-replicating viral vector vaccines. Uh, the short answer is yes, but for, uh, and in different ways. So for the non-replicating ones, um, you have rhythms in, in most facets of your immune response. A lot of this work has been done over the last 10 years by uh, uh, people in Manchester like David Ray and Andrew Loudon showing that um, your immune response to pathogens uh, does vary um, over, over diurnal cycles. Um, for the replicating ones, it's going to be an interaction between the um, internal circadian rhythms of the host cell in which it's replicating and then the response of the um, 
uh, the uh, circadian response of the immune response. So, so this is it's going to be harder to predict what would happen with those. But I would imagine that, um, yes, we will see differences in responses. Um, and it's actually a really good way to um, uh, look at this problem uh, and extrapolate the uh, intrinsic uh, cell circadian rhythms uh, uh, from the immune system rhythms uh, by using a, a non-replicating versus replicating vaccines. Great, thank you. I uh, want for Matthew. So Matthew, you might have seen the news about this um, company uh, which um, was just purchased recently where the principal IP was the use of AI for screening potential um, new therapies. And I was wondering for the kind of screening you do, would AI be of at all use? Oh, where do we start? Um, I mean, there are these these kind of massively complex libraries now, so like kind of virtual libraries of billion member um, studies. Um, I, I guess uh, potentially, um, I mean, the, the modeling that we've done in terms of protein structure um, has has shown it's very, very hard to predict a given cysteine, whether or not it will be, firstly, whether or not it'll be reactive. And then secondly, what actually will be the outcome when we integrate a mutation, um, which then makes, uh, which then makes the use of the AI tricky because your learning sets are suboptimal. Um, I mean, I, I think in terms of uh, using um, these, these massive libraries as a way to better investigate chemical space, um, around a specific uh, amino acid is, is, is pretty cool. And, and one thing that we're kind of doing along those lines, but in a more natural fashion is to say, okay, so if you imagine your amino acid is actually kind of presenting chemistry to the environment, right, as part as its side chain, if you um, switch out for different amino acids, what you're actually doing, you're sampling different amino acid side chain chemistry. And so you're kind of exploring chemical space um, naturally. And so we've now shown that we can not just introduce those, say, three mutations, we can actually introduce all natural um, mutations at any given site of interest. And so that's we're kind of probing it that way. We haven't gone into looking at it with any AI approaches yet, just because I don't, I don't feel confident that we have good training sets. Thanks. And yes, I mean, I think that that, that makes enormous sense. Otherwise, it's it's. Um you know, you're just wasting a lot of computational effort and time. Um, one for Nuria, which is a, a more general question about gene therapy rather than your specific technology, which is around how can issues of gene therapy, such as its irreversible nature, potential effects on the gene pool, informed consent or lack thereof and risk of harm be overcome? Well, that's that's a great question. Um, I'm afraid I don't have a good answer for that. Um, <laughs> It, uh, it definitely is an issue. Uh, there's no, uh, you know, there's no established policy. I, I feel like it's something that it needs to be discussed between policymakers and scientists and whatnot, like how do we move forward? Um, and definitely it is a problem when we're talking about, you know, plasmid DNA that can insert itself into our DNA and basically stay there in, as a germline. Um, but when we look at, for instance, messenger RNA, then we have a different um, sort of like discussion. And uh, because messenger RNA is now sort of like something that we are, we have approved, right? Because of COVID, um, then we've got a different discussion that it's already approved, there's a precedent. And also it doesn't really insert into your DNA. It just does what it needs to do and it gets degraded. So uh, definitely it's uh, uh, the, the, the issues that apply to the, well, we like the, the typical gene therapy with plasmid DNA doesn't apply to mRNA therapies or vaccines. So um, I, I I believe that, you know, it depends. I and mean, some things obviously you, you have to do with plasmid DNA and some things you have to do with messenger RNA. But um, the ones that I've showed today and all the data I've showed is related to messenger RNA. And as such, it's, uh, it's safer and it doesn't really uh, have that irreversible nature. Um, how how so, is that yeah. understood? Is that distinction understood? So the fact that it, it can't incorporate itself into a genome and so on is that is that something that's generally easy to explain when you talk about your technology? Um, I mean, it's something that it's definitely um, it's not understood by the general population because that's one of the reasons why people started to 
have a lot of um, you know issues and you know be scared about vaccines and whatnot uh, is because you know like all of a sudden you're delivering genetic material and that makes people a bit um, uneasy and definitely this means that the general population does not understand the difference between the plasma DNA and the messenger RNA and siRNA and micro RNA you know and all the differences and the risks that each one of them entails. Um, so I, I think that's maybe that's the where we need to begin and we need to start by um, making people understand what the differences are between the different types of gene therapies that one could get. Thanks. Um, Graham, there's, a, there's, an, a, there's actually a comment in our Q&A from Charles, one of the co-directors of the Institute, and I'll, I'll read it out because you probably would, might like to comment on this comment, where he says that he believes that true sterilizing immunity is a very common outcome of either natural infection or vaccination. This is demonstrated by the upturn in antibodies and T cells that's seen on reinfection. The important point is the immunity diminishes disease and onward transmission. So just curious as to how you see that playing out, maybe if you were able to, well, either in terms of reinfection or, or in terms of vaccination for hep C. Yeah, I think the point Charles is making is that it, it's uncommon. Um, and I think that in terms of hepatitis C, then we do have some evidence that re-exposure and reinfection when it occurs is associated with some mitigation of, of that infection. So although the infection becomes established, there is an increased chance, for example, that it can clear spontaneously more commonly. Um, about 25% of infections will clear spontaneously, and that may be slightly higher if you've been at least recently infected and possibly if you've had previous infection longer ago. So I think it's that kind of more subtle immune response, which might be might be something that we can leverage in terms of improving what the natural response to infection is and of course in the context of covid we've all been very familiar now with the concept that actually the value of vaccination is not so much about preventing infection completely it's about preventing what happens after that infection and that uh, decoupling from uh, from symptomatic infection with severe disease and hospitalization which has been so important in tackling COVID-19. So so I think I think that's true and I think that that, um, that thinking about sterilization well, sterilizing immunity as, as a concept is not necessarily that helpful in, in, in that respect. Again, that's a, a it's quite a complex message to get across, isn't it? Because I think it's a nice thought, and I suppose people experience with some things like MMR that might be more exceptional rather than than the rule. Yeah, and I think we saw some. I mean, we heard yesterday about the importance of communicating with the public clearly around some of these issues, and it, it is difficult. And I think we saw some confusing messaging last year around comparisons between COVID-19 and measles, for example. Um, and even now, as the general population is much more familiar with the aspects around COVID-19 vaccination and what that means, I think there still is still is some misconception amongst people who, who sort of understand quite a lot about what being vaccinated means, what that means for being protected from infection, and what that means for the risk of transmission, which is not widely appreciated i think it's it's filtering through slowly but there's still a mis misapprehension that you can be vaccinated and, and won't infect other people um, which we know is, is not true um so i think there is a really important issue around communication and i think as, as, as nuria was saying as well i mean i think around nucleic acid technologies there's an interesting piece of communication that we need to take on with you know in those who don't want to have RNA vaccination, for example, there are some some misunderstandings about what RNA vaccination involves that we could probably a, a, a address more clearly. Um, and I saw some interesting communication this week around the new antiviral that's being developed and trying to explain to people that actually it's not that different from an RNA technology in a sense uh, in terms of what's being delivered as a as an antiviral. So uh, I think these are all areas where uh, you know it. it it is difficult to communicate clearly um, the messages that we need to get across, but it's important that that's done. Excellent. Um, I think Charles would like to, to to respond, and I think it's quite reasonable to to give him an opportunity to speak, um, and then we'll probably wrap up. So over to you, Charles. <clears throat> Thank you very much. That's that, very kind. And just very briefly, I think Graham has put it extremely well. But uh, this is something that I've been trying to persuade people of for many years, that immunity rarely, what I really mean is I don't believe that sterilizing immunity exists. And I think it has taken, as Graham said, COVID to convince a lot of people of this. But it is still, as you say, Neelay, a very difficult, a very complex matter to get across. 
but people still write papers on sterilizing immunity. And recently I did a very brief literature search to just try and see if I could convince myself that anyone had really demonstrated it. And the clearest demonstration I saw was in an animal model of influenza virus infection in mice. And what they showed was, I think it's even in the title of the paper, for sterilizing immunity against influenza, um, T cells play an important part. Now, if T cells respond, that means that the virus has infected, which by definition exactly. means it's, it's, it's not systemic there. already by then. There's a sort of contradiction in terms, even in the title of the paper. So thank you, Graham, I completely agree. Wonderful. So th I think a, a, a massive thank you to all our speakers, really exciting and diverse range of topics and very indicative of, uh, in each case, the collaborative nature of the work that is happening already in the nascent institute and certainly what we would like to see a lot more of going forward. So again, a, a big thank you for all of you and we'll now come up to a, a short break and then we'll move into the fourth session of the launch, which will be chaired by Professor Jonathan Weber. Uh, thanks very much to our audience for those great questions as well.
Good afternoon. I'm John Weaver. I'm Dean Faculty of Medicine at Imperial and uh, really enjoying this fantastic seminar series this morning and this afternoon. So I'm really pleased to say that uh, Charles and Jacob shared save the best till last and this session looks to be absolutely outstanding with a series of terrific speakers. So um, without further ado, what I'd like to do is to introduce the first speaker of this last session, Professor Robin Shattuck. Robin, who will be very well known to many, is Professor of Mucosal Immunology, Department of Infectious Diseases in the Faculty of Medicine, and uh, has been an active vaccinologist now for uh, well over 20 years. And Robin, let me hand over to you for translating early vaccine research into development. Thank you, Jonathan. And I hope everybody is able to see the slides uh, clearly. Can you see the slides? Great. Well, um, good afternoon, everybody. Um, I'm going to give you a short tour around uh, the type of work we do in terms of taking things vaccine concepts from the bedside uh, into clinical trials and how that has changed really over the last uh, 18 to two, 18 months to two years. Um, and the exciting place that I think um, Imperial can have in terms of trying to develop new vaccines and solving some of those very difficult targets that have been refractory to conventional vaccine development. And when we think about vaccines, we need to remember that typically these take a, a period of several years to develop um, and are extremely expensive. And so this is really a, a picture, a snapshot of the process that need to go through. And what I hope you will see immediately is that in the discovery phase, you have many candidates, but actually uh, most of those will fail and very few actually end up as licensed products. You can see the time frame of discovery to a licensed vaccine is uh, seven to 15 years yeah. and in the region of a billion dollars. Um, and so uh, that really means that it does need large funding and, and, and uh, pharmaceutical support. But it's this discovery phase that's most important because that transition yeah. from preclinical into clinical is usually the highest bar in terms of financial investment. And so people are increasingly wanting to look at how to make the process faster, but also reduce the risk of failure. Um, and it's in this place uh, from discovery into translation to humans that Imperial is best placed to accelerate the process and it reduce risk of late stage failure. That's not to say that Imperial is not associated with late stage trials. And one of those would be, uh, for example, the PrEP back -back trial uh, that's being led by uh, Professor Jonathan Weaver. Well, I want to start off with um, thinking about a very complex uh, pathogen that I've been working on for a number of years and, and many people at Imperial have been in studying, and that's uh, HIV. One of the biggest problems with HIV is understanding how to elicit protective neutralizing antibodies. And what is uh, quite challenging is that in uh, terms of natural infection, we only see about 1% of infected individuals going on to make uh, neutralizing antibodies that can hit the majority of uh, circulating strains of HIV. It takes them a period of several years to elicit those antibodies, and by the time they've made those responses, their virus has already escaped. And so the challenge for us is actually to go for something that only happens in a very low percentage of individuals and takes years to occur and come up with a vaccine regime that can be uh, driven in a period of months and work in 90% or greater of individuals. And to do this, it really is pushing the, the boundaries of vaccine development um, and challenging the way we do business. Well, we had already uh, thought about this approach and had been focused very much on manufacturing. And this is a, a theme that will recur uh, throughout my talk. The ability to make vaccines is one of the ways in which vaccine discovery can be accelerated. And so working through uh, the large uh, European program, the European AIDS uh, Vaccine Initiative, 
uh, coordinated by Imperial College and working with a company called Polymune in Austria, we worked out how to make uh, recombinant protein vaccines faster, quicker, and in uh, small batches appropriate for early discovery clinical trials. And what that allowed us to do, showing in the, in the top part of this graph, is take uh, eight new uh, vaccine constructs into clinical trials, run through the uh, uh, Biological Research Center here at Imperial um, for a, a relative affordable cost. And in the same time period, uh, the bottom bars represent the different vaccine HIV vaccine constructs that have been taken into early phase trials in the US. And what I can tell you is that by concentrating on the vaccine uh, design of the trials and their production, we've been able to put more things into clinical studies at a cost that is 20 to 50 times below what uh, it has cost uh, to put the other immunogens into a clinical evaluation in a US setting. And so we're already uh, looking at how to accelerate the discovery process by uh, making that transition from the bench and into the clinic a more uh, quick um, and efficient and cost-effective strategy. But that also needs to be matched by developing the right tools for studying the vaccine outcome. And of course, we throw a whole host of different uh, immunological assays at these, but I just want to uh, focus on one approach um, that you've heard already a little bit from uh, some of the previous speakers today. And that is the ability now to study in very fine detail uh, the B cell response to these vaccine candidates. And so we can now isolate B cells that respond to the vaccine using some very nice uh, flow cytometry techniques that we've developed. This allows us to uh, then uh, grow out those B cells using uh, very new conditions that have been developed by uh, Costas in our, in our group and screen the functional activity of those antibodies to see in the context of viruses, whether they neutralize viruses or in the context of uh, larger bacterial pathogens, whether they can bind uh, block infection or cause uh, direct destruction of bacteria or viruses. And why is that important? What it allows us to do is then to understand exactly what the small fraction of antibodies that can uh, block infection are targeting on uh, the infectious pathogen. And that uh, information allows us then to improve the vaccine itself using structured design approaches so that we can come back with vaccine strategies that rather than eliciting either infrequent antibody responses in terms of the number of individuals or the quality of the response uh, with a vaccine that is far more effective. And this has proved really important in terms of strategies moving forward. Um, and a number of people, both in my group and supported by Paul Kellum, have been looking at both the process and the bioinformatics uh, around uh, this type of approach. Well, of course, that's what we were doing during COVID-19 and our HIV trials are still going on uh, despite the COVID-19 pandemic. But what we saw in, co in the last uh, 18 months was an extraordinary game change in terms of the time to go from discovery into uh, licensing a vaccine was short change to a very short period. And that was done uh, by not uh, omitting any of the steps or reducing the number of individuals in those different trials, um, but by throwing uh, significantly more money over a much more condensed period. And typically uh, those vaccine approaches that are now being in, used in the UK, each uh, invested between two and eight billion uh, dollars in their investment. Um, and so it's uh, a significant undertaking and a fantastic outcome that we have now a number of vaccines shown to be very effective against COVID-19. Well, of course, in some ways, we were lucky with COVID-19 uh, for two reasons. First of all, a lot of basic science had to, understood that the glycoprotein of coronaviruses is relatively conserved and again, using structural biology can be positioned 
so that it's a very stable target for inducing neutralizing antibodies. But at the same time, a number of new technologies were ready to go. And I'm not going to talk about the uh, adenoviral vector technology from Oxford, uh, which was also very important and remains very important. But concentrating on uh, the new RNA platforms, um, these have proven to be extremely durable um, and effective in a pandemic setting. And shown in this diagram on the uh, left hand side, you can see conventional RNA approaches where they encode in what's known the gene of interest, uh, the sequence for this spike glycoprotein. protein. And then the self amplifying approach that we've been use, using that also encodes the glycoprotein, but has uh, a protein machinery that when it gets into cells, allows the RNA to be amplified um, to a thousand fold, um, increasing the amount of protein expression um, to induce an immune response. And, and why does that make a potential difference? It means that with self amplifying RNA, you can use much lower doses for your vaccine than you can with conventional RNA. And that's important both in terms of safety, uh, the number of doses that can be manufactured and the, their potential use in combinations. So the beauty of the process is that in fact, it is a synthetic process. You're working with genetic code. You're making your vaccine in a synthetic uh, reaction and then uh, formulating it using uh, some of the nice structures that you heard from uh, two of the speakers earlier in the day to produce your vaccine candidate. And that means it can be done uh, in a very small scale. That's important. Um, and it also uh, reduces the cost. So just to give you uh, our own example of how quickly that can move, we were able to go from uh, downloading the sequence of that glycoprotein to designing a vaccine to constructing it in the laboratory, to testing it in, in uh, cell lines and animal models and moving into a clinical trial within a period of a few months. Um, and that shows that this technology has really changed the speed at which things can move. Um, and I think that that will open up the way we start to think about discovery of new vaccines in the future. Well, of course, one of the critical things that, that allows us to do such an, an approach uh, at Imperial is the use of the Imperial College Research Facility. Um, and our coronavirus vaccine studies were led, led by Katrina Pollock um, and the very dedicated team there. Um, and of course, the uh, very uh, generous volunteers who came into that study. But that ability to ha be able to translate uh, ideas from uh, conception and move them into clinical trials is really dependent on having that vibrant um, and accessible clinical research facility. So I think we will see now a step change in the way we start to develop vaccines, particularly vaccines against more complicated pathogens. So in many ways, we were lucky with COVID-19 because it was a relatively easy to neutralize virus. If it had been more like HIV, we would still not have a effective vaccine. But it does mean now that we can actually produce uh, vaccines using bench top machinery um, in a very relatively small space um, at a relatively low cost and move these into clinical trials um, to evaluate the immune response. And that really, really um, synergizes with some of the talks you heard earlier about studying natural infection and human challenge studies. And putting those all together, it means we can now do very deep dive into molecular characterization of the antibody response also the cellular response and use that to then iteratively uh, design better vaccine candidates um, and produce better uh, immunogens. Now the costs of doing this uh, a, a, a year or so ago would have been in the millions and now we're reducing it down to probably uh, less than a million to be able to close the cycle and we hope to move that further. Now the output of that is Robin, we'll we'll take better time. vaccine better vaccines, better therapeutic antibodies, and that allows us to put things back into infectious challenge studies, and also utilize those antibodies for therapy, and you think about genetic approaches to uh, deliver antibodies, uh, as well as thinking about using them as, recomb uh, as recombinant proteins. And that really shows you how 
um, just uh, working through the Imperial Vaccine Research Network, of which there are many uh, different parties, uh, we can translate vaccine concepts from the bench to the bedside. Thank you. Robin, thank you so much for that um, spectacular account of um, progress over the last 18 months, really, with the mRNA self amplifying RNA vaccines. Um, I now invite our second speaker of the afternoon, who is Miss Kenny Malpartido Cardenas from the Department of Electrical and Electronic Engineering at Imperial. Um, come give her presentation on molecular diagnostics for infectious diseases. Kenny. Hello, good afternoon. I hope everyone can see my slides. Uh, so good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Kenny Malpartida Cardenas. I'm final year PhD student at the Center for Bioinspired Technology at Imperial College London under the supervision of Professor Pantelis Giorgio and Dr. Jesus Rodriguez Manzano. And I'm very glad to be presenting today about my work on molecular diagnostics for infectious diseases uh, using microchip technology. So uh, infectious diseases are one of the leading causes of morbidity and mortality, and one of the best examples is COVID-19. This is in particular uh, highlights uh, the crucial role of diagnostics to control, identify, and reduce the spread of, of the disease. Molecular diagnostics uh, could be defined as the application of molecular biology techniques to detect infections at a genomic or proteomic level. And one example is PCR, polymerase chain reaction. Conventional workflows and the one that we are currently using in our group uh, rely firstly on the extraction of nucleic acids through a sample preparation from samples such as blood or swabs. And secondly, nucleic acid amplification, which will be by PCR or LAMP. And thirdly, the detection, which could be optical, such as fluorescence based or colorimetric, or as in our case, using electrochemical sensors uh, by microchip technology. So the, the nucleic acid amplification method that we used in, in our group is LAMP, low mediated isothermal amplification, uh, which in contrast to the well-known PCR, it is is performed at a constant temperature of about 60 to 65 minutes and results, results could be obtained in less than 30 minutes. It is highly specific and sensitive and in more detail it commonly uses between four to six primers and amplification occurs at this, this temperature thanks to the strand displacement ability of the polymerase. So in overall, all these advantages uh, make LAMP very suitable for point of care applications since the thermal cycling is not required, reducing the complexity of, of the whole hardware that is, that is needed. So we combine LAMP with our lab on chip device to amplify and detect a target of interest such as uh, the pathogen that causes malaria or COVID in the palm of your hand. So this, this platform has been developed in our group and it's composed of a platform unit, including a temperature controller, all based on electronics, a disposable cartridge uh, with microchip sensors and a micro microfluidic chamber where the lamp reaction is loaded. The platform is connected via Bluetooth to an Android application to visualize the results in real time and localize uh, where the test has been performed. In addition, the data can be recorded, uh, leading to the first generation of digital diagnostics for point of care. The, the microchip is based on CMOS technology, which uh, the sensor area are being uh, ISFETs, ion sensitive field effect transistors that measure the pH changes. So the way it works is that uh, when nucleic acid amplification is occurring in the lamp reaction, protons are released. Then the pH of the solution uh, is decreased and therefore this pH change is what is measured with our ISFET sensors 
giving a sigmoidal signal uh, when the target is detected. So combining uh, this lamp uh, chemistry and lab on chip technology, we aim to meet the reassure criteria. So the lab on, lab on chip technology offers affordability, user friendliness, robustness, is equipment free, deliverable to users, and the lamp chemistry is very sensitive, uh, specific, and rapid. So now I would like to present two study cases. One uh, for the first one being diagnostics for human malaria. So as previous speakers have mentioned uh, today, malaria is one of the most threatening infectious diseases. It is a mosquito-borne disease caused by plasmodium pathogens. And there are several human infective plasmodium species, as you can see here. Uh, being plasmodium falciparum, the most dangerous and commonly found. Nevertheless, it's also important to diagnose non falciparum malaria, which is currently misdiagnosed because of the lack of tests and therefore cases might be underestimated. So I have been working on the development of a panel of assays to detect all human infective malaria plasmodium species in less than 20 minutes with high sensitivity and specificity. As an example, um, we have developed a plasmodium falciparum specific assay and demonstrated its translation on the lab on chip device showing the suitability uh, uh, compared to a conventional fluorescent based instrument. And then another rising challenge with malaria is the emergence of artemisinin resistance, which is the frontline treatment for malaria infections. This means that infected people are not responding to the administered drugs. And this is um, because there is a mutation in the DNA of the parasite, which relies on a nucleotide change from T to A, for example, in this case. And that means that the patient may not respond to the, to the treatment. So based on, based on LAMP, we have developed a method for the detection of mutations, which can discriminate samples containing one base per change. This method um, has been applied for detection of drug resistance. And as we can see here, we can have three different cases and we are able to detect the parasite that responds to the drug being the wild type reaction targeting the wild type allele or the parasite that is resistant to the drug which harbors the mutant allele. And again, this has been uh, translated to our lamp on chip device, uh, giving us similar results to a conventional fluorescent based instrument. So to finalize another study case, it has been the, the application to the detection of SARS-CoV-2. We designed a lamp assay targeting the engine um, with high sensitivity and specificity. And we evaluated its performance with a cohort of 183 clinical samples. And results showed a fantastic correlation with PCR, as seen in the last in the right graph, uh, giving us a sensitivity of 90% and a specificity of 100% within less than 20 minutes, with an average time to positive of 13 minutes, in fact. And finally, we demonstrated the detection of COVID-19 with our lab on chip platform using a subject of 34 samples, a subset, sorry, of 34 samples. And as shown in the box plot, and there was no significant difference across the, the instruments. So to conclude, um, we are working towards the integration of our sample to answer diagnostic device. And for that purpose, we are developing rapid low cost extraction methods and also the incorporation of lyophilized reagents to avoid cold chain. So to summarize, um, diagnostics are key to effective management of infectious diseases. Molecular methods are the most promising tools currently. Uh, lab on chip technology based um, uh, on electrochemical sensors in combination with LAMP will fulfill the reassured criteria from the WHO and we have demonstrated its implementation and also its fast adaptation from malaria to COVID-19. 
So um, lastly, I would like to acknowledge um, everyone at the Center for Biosphere Technology, my supervisors and all the collaborators and the Faculty of Medicine, Life Science Departments uh, who have made this possible. Thank you very much for listening. Jenny, thank you so much and spectacular timekeeping. It's really amazing to see how your technology is coming along and uh, I look forward to hearing questions about it later. Let me just remind everyone who's listening to this that the Q&A is open. Please put questions in the Q&A now and we'll come back to it, the, um, the question session we've got after the last speaker, uh, after Faith Ozier has spoken last in this session. But without further ado, um, I think it's pretty obvious to anyone who's been queuing for petrol this weekend that infectious diseases have an impact on the economy. And um, so it's very timely to invite Professor Marisa Moraldo from the Business School here at Imperial College to talk about the economics of infectious disease. Marisa, welcome. Hello, thank you very much. Can you see my slides? Yes, perfect. So it's a great pleasure to be here today. Um, we're going to do a different science from the flavor that we have <laughs> heard so far. So I'm an economist at the business school. And today I really want to give you an overview of the type of research that uh, myself and my group, um, we do. So um, uh, my research really evolves around, well, in a nutshell, uh, we, we look at uh, the economic determinants of decision making of individuals and organizations in, in healthcare systems um, to understand how we can leverage those factors to um, develop policies and interventions to promote uh, public health uh, globally. And so my research really evolves around three areas on the supply side, economics and policy of innovation, uh, how policies and shocks impact organizational performance performance, but also on the demand side, uh, the behavioral determinants uh, of decisions. So on the first topic, as Robin uh, quite eloquently showed, you know, it's it, the, the development process of an innovation. It's very long. It's very complex. It starts with basic research all the way up to the, um, the diffusion of that innovation uh, to, um, to the population. So it's adoption in scale. And yet, from an economic perspective, we know very little about uh, the R&D processes, how those decisions are taken, as well as once an innovation reaches the market, how it's adopted and diffuses to scale. And in particular, how those, um, how those decisions are shaped by incentives and policies. A lot of my research evolves around that. To give you an example, we have built um, uh, a large data set where we track all uh, products and inno innovations uh, in the R&D pipeline from early discovery all the way to market launch at global level across all diseases. And one of the questions we pose ourselves is to try to measure inequalities in innovation across the different disease areas. So we did find, and this is not novel, that we, we found a mismatch between disease burden and pharmaceutical innovation. Um, but when we start zooming into the different disease areas, we find that there are some asymmetries between the, the, the levels of inequalities. For, for example, for communicable diseases, we found a disproportionate concentration in high burden disease diseases. Um, when I mean disproportionate, it means that there is more, but actually the, there's not, the, there's more than the fair share that those diseases would uh, uh, require if you uh, take into consideration the, the, the relative burden um, uh, of those diseases and you compare it with other disease areas. When you zoom in into the different disease areas, you find that there is a lot of um, heterogeneity in the level of inequalities. For example, for neglected tropical diseases, we found that drug innovation disproportionately favors lower burden diseases, while for things like cardiovascular diseases, there's disproportionate concentration, so a huge inequality um, uh, towards higher burden diseases. In the second area of research on policy shocks and organizational performance, um, we are really interested in trying to understand what affects the, uh, uh, the performance of organizations, healthcare organizations, um, for example, extreme events like the pandemics, the COVID pandemic, and how we can leverage policies and regulations to mitigate those uh, negative impacts on performance. So um, one example of that research, and this was done in collaboration with the School of Public Health, we are interested in identifying the causal impact of the H1N1 pandemic on um, hospital, uh, uh, hospital admissions, as well as cost to the healthcare system. 
And what you find that I show here in this graph is that, of course, there was there's a substantial impact on admissions, excess admissions and costs during the pandemic, but also there is an even larger effect on the post-pandemic period, okay? So just positing that we should keep an eye on after the pandemic is gone on the consequences for the system. A much more recent uh, effort, and I have a disclaimer that this is actually led my, co my colleague Katarina Hauk at the School of Public Health, but it's a very good example of the co how we collaborate across the different faculties, the business school and the School of Public Health. We have developed an economic epidemiological optimization model, uh, Dedalus, that really uh, integrates uh, a dynamic model of SARS-CoV transmission uh, with so epidemiological model with an economic model that factors 63 uh, sectors of the economy. Um, that uh, reflects the sexual heterogeneity in transmission, but also the economic interdependence between the sectors. And we did this because we really wanted to inform policy on what sectors of the economy should be closed during the pandemic uh, to um, balance the economic losses, if you want, with the public health losses. So within that model developed uh, a range of optimal control strategies with the objective of minimizing the economic impact uh, of the lockdowns on the economy. And we found that our solutions would uh, have led to an economic gain between 163 billion pounds to 205 billion pounds compared to a blanket lockdown of non-essential activities is over six months. Now, these, um, this model, this tool is, is being used by WHO to support low and middle income countries to, to, to mitigate the impact of the pandemic, but also uh, by the G20 higher level independent panel to calculate rate of uh, return on investment on pandemic uh, preparedness. Another very good example, and this is collaboration, it was led by us, but it's also collaboration with the School of Public Health and also some computer scientists, where at the beginning of the pandemic, we, we really, um, you know, uh, after realizing that there was a cancellation of a lot of elective procedures, actually almost elective procedures um, to give priority to COVID patients, we thought, well, can we do it better? Can we develop a framework that helps policymakers prioritizing at national level which patients should be seen in hospital? So we developed a linear programming uh, uh, model to optimal schedule uh, elective procedures and allocate hospital beds across all patients or, or suffering from all types uh, of diseases and with different care needs for both planned and emergency hospital care. And um, we we found that you know if our model if we would be deployed in uh, in England it would have uh, saved an extra in the worst case scenarios of our modeling an extra five almost five million years of life could have been gained if it would have been deployed. Our model is open source and it can be used for by any policymaker um, uh, internationally. Last but not least, the last area of research that is more on the men's side is on the behavioral determinants of decisions. So a really interest in trying to understand what determines behaviors, individual behaviors, and how we can leverage those um, uh, factors to design behavioral interventions to promote, um, to mitigate healthy, risky, healthy, uh, health and healthy behaviors, basically. And I look at the range of behaviors, um, but relevant to today, for example, the uptake of vaccination on the population side, but I also interested in trying to understand clinical decision making. So, for example, when innovations are out there and available, it takes around 15 years for them to be adopted to scale. There's a lot of heterogeneity in decision making on the clinician side. So this is a lot part of our research. A good example of the first type of research here was this piece of research that we did also in collaboration with School of Public Health, where we model individual uptake of uh, flu vaccines. And then we deployed um, an intervention, a behavioral intervention, a social norm intervention by which we communicated to individuals uh, the coverage rates of the, um, the people meaningful to these individuals. Uh, we varied the, 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 the social norms, so these coverage rates. And our, uh, our objective here was to try to understand what would be the optimal coverage rate. And what we did find was that um, the effectiveness of such an intervention, uh, of course, varies depending on the level of coverage rates uh, of vaccination in the population. Uh, but there is this trade off uh, in individuals choices between having this pro social behavior that is doing like others. So if you know everybody's vaccinating and I should vaccinate, but then that effect somehow diminishes as coverage rates um, increase and a sort of, if you want more self interest and individual uh, motivation that is a free riding effect kicks in, meaning that the effectiveness of these interventions diminishes 
as coverage rates increase. Importantly, we found that the effect of this type of interventions is really individual specific and it depends on the individual perceptions of the risks of infection and coverage rates, positing that if we want these public health interventions to be uh, even more effective, we need a, we really need them to, to personalize them to uh, specific individuals that is to some extent at odds with many uh, policies that we have in health systems. And this line of research of personalization of behavioral interventions is a much larger research agenda that we have in my group, but also in collaboration uh, with uh, the, the Faculty of Engineering. And that really stems from the realization that we take so many decisions in each day and our decisions are impacted by such a broad range of factors that are so unique to each individual and that the, um, in order to change behaviors, we really need to um, uh, personalize uh, these interventions. So just to uh, finalize, um, our research um, is really, there's really a strong commitment from us for policy impact. That is what keeps us motivated to work. Uh, so we really want to improve population health globally. Um, I didn't, don't have space to put all the collaborators here, but this is really an effort of collaboration across the different faculties. We collaborate a lot with the Faculty of Medicine, with Public Health, with Epidemiology, with, with Engineering, the Faculty of Engineering at Imperial, but also we collaborate a bit more broadly with policymakers, practitioners, industry, pop population and academics uh, internationally. And we do a bit of everything. We do modeling, empirical work, interventional studies and qualitative research. Thank you very much. Marisa, thank you so much. That was terrific. And let me just remind people again, any questions, just shove them in the Q&A and we'll pick up them. I'll try and pick up all the questions that are coming through and we'll have plenty of time for questions at the end. Um, so without further ado, let's turn to the penultimate talk. So I wake up to Radio 4 in the mornings and if there's going to be an article on COVID on Radio 4, as often as not, is Peter Openshaw who's delivering uh, the information in a in a timely and sensible way. So it's a pleasure to welcome Peter, who's Professor of Experimental Medicine and National Heart and Lung Institute in the Faculty of Medicine at Imperial, and uh, long time respiratory virology immunologist. Peter. Well, thank you so much, Don. We, I thought that as we come towards the end of the day, um, it would be appropriate to just share some um, some some thoughts about pandemic responses and the way in which um, many of us here at Imperial have been involved in in um, providing advice to to government. Um, can I just check, John? Uh, is this in the correct mode? Am I presenting full screen? Yeah. Okay. Great. <clears throat> so, by way of introduction, I I've, I've been involved for maybe about 20 years in various committees that have advised government. <clears throat> Most prominently recently, this committee called Nerve Tag, which I'm sure you're all familiar with, new and emerging respiratory vir pathogens. You know, so we basically scan the horizon and, and look what's coming coming along. Um, been in many other advisory committees in roles within Imperial um, <clears throat> and um, I'm just seeing if I can put a, I can't see how to put a pointer on, um, <clears throat> but um, and also, you know, promoting the use of human infection challenge in order to investigate um, the the pathogenesis um, of, um, of of different infectious diseases. And I, I just mentioned that, <clears throat> you know, I think having a role in advising government or in um, working at Imperial is by no means <clears throat> excludes you from being involved with industry. And I think advising industry is often really um, interesting and important because it does lead to actual um, developments that are benefit um, to patients. So does the government think that infectious diseases are important? Well, certainly it does. This is a version of the National Risk Register for Civil Emergencies, um, where we've got relative li likelihood on the bottom and then we've got the relative impact on the vertical. And you can see that top right is pandemic human disease. So it's been appreciated for a long time in government that, um, that these diseases are really important. 
However, many people who are in government, many people in parliament, don't have much of a science background. Um, this, this, this figure has actually improved over the past five years. It's come up from around 10 percent. But there is, a, I think, a great need really to have people who are in government, in parliament, who do have more of a science background. So if any of you coming up through the system have any inclination to be elected as a member of parliament, you know, please do consider it. It would be really good to have more people with science background. But there are in the UK um, some really good ways that you can try to influence government, particularly through this expert advisory network um, system that I'm rather surprised to say we uh, isn't really um, much in evidence in many other countries. So it is something which is particularly good in the UK is that there are these very good um, established advisory networks that have been that have been set up. Um, so this is an, an illustration illustration of of how the cycle of um, policy development occurs um, produced by the um, by Go Science by the Government Office for Science and you know interactively with people in um, in Parliament in Westminster in policy um, scientists are able to develop the um, science around various issues and to promote the use of scientific evidence in policy. And I think the, the principles on which this is this is done, you know, mutual respect between government and scientists um, and <clears throat> um, and the, the building of trust and the um, and the system of advisory committees and councils and maintaining open lines of communication is all really um, important and very well developed in the UK. And I think it's important also to acknowledge that you know, scientific advisors um, remain free from, from political interference. I must say that I've never felt interfered with by politicians at all. Um, we're free to publish and to continue to do our research and to communicate um, our advice including through the media and I think sometimes you know the Today program can be a very good way of reaching ministers um, so it doesn't the way in which you communicate your science doesn't all have to be through these sort of official channels um, but using um, the media is a very good way of, of getting the message out. Um, so did we have a plan? Well we certainly did have have lots of plans so this is going back to 15, 20 years ago. This was an example of the plan that we had going into the 2009 influenza pandemic, um, where we were uh, looking at different phases of preparation, of containment, and then uh, finally treatment, assuming that it wasn't going to be possible to ultimately contain um, a pathogen. So the idea of containment was really to slow the spread and blunt the peak and therefore lessen the um, the the surge impact on the National Health Service. So very familiar sort of concepts. Um, obviously, the preparations that were in place for influenza are not exactly those that you would put in place for a coronavirus, but certainly there were um, pandemic places plans in place. So we've got these two different pandemics that we've um, that we've been living through over the past um, the, the past um, 10 years. So influenza, you know, very different strategy in terms of how influenza evades the immune system compares to, compared to coronavirus, but essentially two, two different respiratory pathogens um, with, with contrasting needs. And during the last pandemic, we, uh, we led a national study called Mosaic, which I'll tell you about briefly, um, and were part of this new study called ISRIC 4C. So I think, you know, Mosaic was a great collaborative effort. I think it established a way of working that has really put us in good stead during this current pandemic. So it was um, one of the, I think, earliest attempts at trying to put together a broad collaboration. And it was no mean feat, I think, to get um, to get agreement from so many different groups of investigators around the UK. Um, and the hospitals, 11 different hospitals, to contribute to this very large effort that we um, developed. 
um, which ultimately recruited relatively few patients, 255, um, and um, but but really was a way of testing out all of these different ways that we had of trying to work out what was going wrong with the patients with severe disease. So um, so we really you know learned a lot from that mosaic exercise. And one of the things that we learned was, you know, don't have a standing start. So this was one of the most famous charts, really, to come out of the Mosaic grant, which was the time span. You know, it took us roughly six weeks to get the grant in. Uh, the referees were quite fast. Then there were all sorts of legal agreements during the summer, um, and we almost missed the, um, the, the second wave. So what about coronavirus, you know, how did this help us to respond to COVID-19? Well, so working with Callum Semple and Kenny Bailey, you know, we did a very similar thing. Um, having learned so much from Mosaic, we had all the protocols in place. We had um, sleeping protocols. We had legal agreements in place. We were ready to go right from day one. And as a result of fever feverish activity, in the days and nights um, that we were bracing ourselves for the for COVID-19, we managed to get everything set up and managed to recruit right from the very start. And as a result, um, this uh, Isaric 4C study has now accumulated almost a quarter of a million patients in UK hospitals, many of them with a lot of uh, biological samples, which is which will allow us to unravel a great deal about the pathogenesis and also to provide uh, really timely um, um, updates to uh, to policymakers, to planners and to government about what's going on. So in terms of what's been achieved by ISRIC, you know, because of this flying start, um, so vast number of, <clears throat> of cases um, have been have been collected, a lot of samples. Many of these samples have been passed out to collaborators and other institutions, not only in the UK, but elsewhere. Um, there's been a lot of sequencing, both of host and pathogen, and all of this is now being fitted together in order to provide a really comprehensive picture of, um, of COVID. And all this time, <clears throat> we've been able to provide um, updates to those in Whitehall and those making policy. I would say, that how this policy lands depends very much on on who um, who it lands upon. And just to give <clears throat> give a quote from the newspapers today. So this is Sajid Javid saying, "I'm a minister. I'm entitled not to listen to them." So I think you know, thinking back to the days when it was Gordon Brown, I think Gordon Brown was very responsive to um, scientific advice that was being delivered. Uh, Matt Hancock, I think, also. Was, uh, was was really um, interested and receptive, um, but it does absolutely depend on who has to then evaluate the advice, you know, what effect it has. So I think, you know, in, in conclusion, you know, we can contribute a lot. Imperial does contribute a lot in terms of, you know, providing an objective evaluation of, um, of the science that's out there, you know, assimilating all of the studies into a bigger picture and presenting it to government in a way that um, that they can consider and you know maintaining credibility and being realistic about what you can achieve in this way um, is um, is really important and I, I do think that it makes a, a big contribution to the national effort and has raised the profile of science in the UK very considerably um, during this time of COVID so thank you. Fantastic, Pete. Thanks so much. And uh, keep those questions coming into the Q&A. We've got quite a lot to get through, but please bring in more. And um, without further ado, I'd like to welcome Professor Faith Ozier to give the final talk of, uh, of the afternoon. Faith is a professor of malaria immunology and is currently the head of the Human Immunology Laboratory at IRV, the International AIDS Vaccine Initiative at Imperial College and physically based at the Chelsea and Westminster Hospital. So I'm hopeful, Faith, that we'll get your slides up. 
Yes, my slides are going to find the right screen. Uh, beg your pardon. Fantastic. OK. Have I got full screen? Not yet. OK, one second. Um, it's just loading up. Um, it'll come up in a minute. OK, am I there? You're not on full screen, but I think face is best to just to get going. OK. Have you got it now? Not on, not on full screen yet, no. OK. That should be there now. It's better. Just just go for okay. it. OK, OK, I'll, I'll push on. Um, so um, it's a great uh, pleasure to speak to you this afternoon. Um, my name is Faith Ossia. I'm the executive director of the IRV Human Immunology Lab. Um, and I'll be speaking to you today about have you lost my slides? No, we, we've got your slides. OK. Uh, I'm afraid I have a technical hitch here. OK, Melanie, can you take over and show the slides? OK, Faith, we will try and. Um, try and replace them. OK, Faith, they're up now. OK, fantastic. I apologize. So uh, yes, my name is Faith Ossier. I'm the executive director of the IRV Human Immunology Lab. Um, and given my prime time location in the program, um, presentation number 19 out of 19, I thought I would walk you through um, IRV, um, who we are. We were formerly called the International AIDS Vaccine Initiative, and that's now changed and we're simply called um, IRV. Um, next slide, please. And so uh, the mission of IRV is really to translate scientific discoveries into affordable um, and globally accessible public health um, solutions. And I just want to emphasize that we are a product development partnership um, and we're really focused on once um, discoveries have been made in the lab, then we want to translate those discoveries into things that can get to clinic in similar ways as was described uh, by Robin. Next slide, please. Um, so we work across six impact areas. Um, one is HIV vaccines, and I'll, I'll show you a list of them um, towards the end. We also work on monoclonal antibodies against HIV. We work on TB vaccines. We've got some candidates in the pipeline. We also work on emerging infectious diseases such as Lassa, Ebola, and Marburg. Um, and we've also began a program looking for monoclonal antibodies for snake bite. Um, we use our internal expertise to support product development um, for our partners. So if you have a product um, that's not one of our priority areas, 
we have a product development center that can facilitate and support um, that product development. Next slide, please. Um, and so IAVI brings together um, in-house researchers. Um, this is really where discovery, partnerships and access meet. So we bring together partners, um, researchers in infectious and neglected diseases, public and private partners, and we work together with local communities. And our main products that we are interested in and that we promote um, and take through the development pipeline of vaccines and antibodies, and really the effort is to make them affordable and globally accessible. Next slide, please. Um, so we've got a discovery and development network. Um, this is a monoclonal antibody. I'm going to talk about it later in a coming up slide. Um, next, please. Um, we join forces with public and private partners. Um, and I think the thing to emphasize is that we work in areas for which there is no market insensitive, in, in, <laughs> no market incentive. Um, and uh, with a focus really to make things affordable um, for the people that need them the most. Next, please. Um, and we work hand in hand with local groups so that we can understand the need. And here the point is that you can develop a fantastic product, but if people are not willing to use it, then that product um, will sit on the shelf. And so we work with the local groups to understand their needs. Um, and advanced pathways to enable affordability and access. Next slide. And so um, here's our global scientific reach. We've got these labs um, around the world. We're over here in the United Kingdom, but we've got discovery labs um, in the United States, in India. Importantly, we also have clinical research centers in Africa and in India that are indicated on the map. And this is really critically important because for the infections that we work on, um, the burden of disease is high in these low and middle income countries. And we do a lot of work in country and uh, we are able to do that through partnerships that we've established with clinical research centers. Next slide, please. Um, this is really the meat of my presentation that we are really exemplar in interdisciplinarity and that's why I think being part of the Institute of Infection um, is really fits in with our ethos. Um, we do discovery science which brings together traditional things like immunology, molecular biology, epidemiology, vaccinology, structural biology, all that kind of thing. We bring those um, together under the bucket of discovery, but then we also combine that with um, clinical development. So we do preclinical trials um, to promote, to support a product um, through the pipeline. And we go through from phase one all the way to phase three. Um, we conduct um, laboratory assays to make sure that the products that we're studying are um, meet regulatory standards for the FDA, for the EMA, etc. Um, and so that's a great um, demonstration of interdisciplinarity moving from the bench through clinical trials and finally to regulation, um, which I've mentioned already, and access, making sure that the products are fit for registration and making sure that the users at the end um, are able to take up um, and utilize those products. So there we also engage in social science research that really um, looks at uptake um, of products. Next slide, please. And uh, one thing that I really like about IRV is that we embed capacity building in all the stages of development um, that I've described before. And so we're supporting the development of scientists, of institutions, of infrastructure, that would enable um, products to finally get to the clinic in people. Next slide. Um, here's our pipeline. I'm not going to belabor this, but it's to give you a flavor of the sort of things that we're working on. We've got uh, vaccines uh, and monoclonal antibodies for HIV, which are these first two rows over here. 
Um, beneath that, we've got viral vector candidates for the emerging infectious diseases. That's what's primarily indicated here. And we're also looking at um, tuberculosis vaccine candidates. So I'll be happy to discuss this, but uh, given the time of day, I won't belabor this. Next slide. Uh, and just to finish, I want to say discoveries are not enough, inventions are not enough, and goodwill isn't enough either. If you want to change lives, you need to change the rules, and I believe that the Institute of Infection gives us the perfect opportunity to lay down new rules through interdisciplinary science. Next slide. Uh, just thank you to our donors and thanks for listening. Faith, thanks so much and well done with the slides, Melanie. Thank you for that help. And what a great way to end the, uh, the symposium, the talks on the symposium. So I'm going to sort of throw this open to the panel now. I hope I can get the panel up on uh, so we can see all the presenters. And um, I'm just going to pick out some of the questions which have been posed in the Q&A. And um, I'll start, Robin, with you, if I may. And um, it, it's around the mRNA and asking the question, um, do you think there's going to be a difference in durability of the mRNA responses compared to perhaps more conventional or the, live vi or the viral vector approaches? I think that's a great question. And the short answer is we don't know. We're still following that out uh, with time. Um, there seems to be quite a sharp drop off initially, but part of that is because the antibody response is so good that you tend to have an initial sharp drop and then a very long tail. Um, at the moment, we don't know how far that tail will go out and where you get to a break point where the vaccine is no longer effective. Hopefully it's going to be a significantly long period. OK, thank you. And um, I'm going to but really a question I think to everybody on the panel that was raised first by Marissa, which is around vaccine hesitancy um, or the anti-vax movement, which has been really um, stunningly difficult, I think, to, to get to grips with and to understand how to counter. And it relates to a question in the Q&A um, asked of Peter, which is that the positive science that's been put forward by many of you across or all of you across the panel has been sort of matched by a counter culture coming through social media of, of rather negative messages coming through the sort of anti-science and so i'm just interested in in how you think we're going to approach this um in particularly around vaccination so can i turn to marissa first and then i'm going to come on to peter OK, thank you. So, of course, you know, decision making is complex, as I tried to pitch today. And I think there's, you know, as this hesitancy is about many different things. And I think first is trying to understand why people are not vaccinating um, and so we can better support them. I think to answer the, the other question, I think in that process is really crucial that we work with the population. We, you know, we have a very close collaboration with the population, with the communities as researchers, as well as with policymakers. And I think that's that's the best way for us to be able to um, better understand behaviors, what are the causes, and um, rather than just putting people in a box of you know vaccine exigent people. Um, and that that we may answer. Peter, yeah, <clears throat> well, we obviously thought a lot about this because it's such a major problem. You know, we can do the best science in the world, but if it's going to be undermined by misinformation disinformation you know you wonder what what the origin of, of this is and i think we do need to work with with social sciences in order to try and understand that but also to try and understand you know what are the what are the political forces internationally that may underlie this you know who would have an interest in promoting misinformation that would create such um such um such an, a negative effect when we've actually got such wonderful science out there. You know, we've really scienced our way through this in the most extraordinary manner. And I would say that you know, science has actually done really well, but 
we do need to keep um, keep up the information campaign to make sure that we counter um, false rumours and disinformation, which are so rife. I think it's it's so regrettable that it's become politically polarised as well, and it's almost become a a, um, a mark of ideology to um, to be anti-science amongst some factions in society. It is extraordinary. You look at where Ivan Ekton has got to. Yeah. Um, and just, you know, wonder where this came from. Robin. I think we also need to rem remember that there are anti-vaxxers who are hard perhaps to persuade on a logical basis. And there are many people who are vaccine skeptics. And particularly some communities have been more resistant than others. And as much as I enjoy hearing Peter on Radio 4, I suspect that that doesn't cover the entire population. And I think as scientists, we need to be very much engaged across social media platforms. There's been some fantastic work done in period by more junior staffs. Uh, just picking out one app at random, Leon McFarland from my group has been talking to the Bain community and has been a really good advocate. And it also speaks, I think, that we need to continue to create opportunities for people from all sectors of life to get involved in science because if they don't, if people don't see their, their peers, you know, in, in as science advisors, then they're going to be suspicious. Yeah. Let, let me turn to Faith now. So, Faith, you, the whole day have shown extraordinary technologies that are, you know, ripe to being rolled out to address some of the global inequity in terms of dealing with infectious disease. But as you and others have said, the financial models are not helpful. The, the, the money to do this is just not there. How do you think we can, we can cross that, that barrier? What can we do? What can the Institute of Infection do to start to push these technologies out into lower middle income countries? Um, thanks for the question. Um, I think that the Institute of Infection can can really play an important role in uh, leadership, um, in terms of thought leadership. Um, I think we heard from the, the directors of the Institute of Infection about um, a master's course. Um, I'm a great believer in training. Uh, I'm a great believer that um, people should be taught how to fish and not given fish, um, and I and I really see this as a long-term um, engagement. I think inequity is a societal problem, um, long-standing societal problem, um, affects many sectors, um, and when it comes to vaccines and technologies for science and research, this is just one out of you know big inequity, big areas that uh, where inequity is a problem, and so I think that. Um, you know, one um, can't be naive and think, well, we're going to solve that overnight. Um, and one has to be strategic and think long term. Um, and I think that education is something that really doesn't go wrong. Um, it's not a quick fix. It's something that you do over time. And I think that as a leading university in Europe, um, um, that Imperial can can, can set that standard, can have that leadership um, in offering this type of training opportunities um, that will support people in low and middle income countries to get the knowledge so that they can also um, develop. I think that the model of partnerships and collaboration and interdisciplinarity, I think would also be fantastic to to, to share that model um, with um, trainees from the developing countries uh, because you know they will they will catch it and, and they can also build on it. So I think that establishing the Institute of Infection is a good start and then that the Institute of Infection should be looking outward um, to see how it can support and there are already some good ideas on the table. There are exchange programs that can be established. There are collaborations that can be 
um, made win-win with partners in Imperial, with partners in uh, low and middle income countries. You know, so I really don't see a quick fix, but I think that strategically one can begin to plant those seeds and water them um, that over time reduce that inequity. So in, in the HIV field, PEPFAR and the Global Fund were just spectacular examples of harvesting international funds to address equity around drug access for the antiretrovirals. I sense COVAX and Gavi have not yet got that traction for COVID vaccines. Do you think it's just a matter of time before uh, that happens or it's really highlighting selfishness, isn't it? Yeah, it's uh, unfortunately really highlighted um, nationalism. Um, it's unfortunate, but it's a, it's a reality that, uh, you know, governments are responsible to their people first and to their taxpayers first. It's, it's just an unfortunate um, reality. But I think that um, the good things to come out of it are that it's really pushed the onus some of the onus back on governments, for example, in Africa to really um, step up their, their game in terms of their own investment in research, because in the end, um, they're responsible and they have a part to play and you can't always have your hand out. Um, you've got to ask yourself, well, what can I do? And there's lots that they can do to improve the infrastructure that allows science to thrive. So while it's been a disappointment, it's been actually a great incentive. Um, and I think, you know, now there's conversations at the African Union about vaccine development and, you know, thinking about local uh, vaccine manufacture in Africa, the whole scene is changing in a very short time. So I, I, I take it optimistically. I think that there are good days ahead. And I think that if it gets our African governments and uh, you know, uh, governments in LMIC countries to prioritize research and put more on the table, then, then it's a win for science all around. Thank you, Faith. So we've had a challenging question in, in the Q&A, which is around diagnostics. So how do you really get to grips with the performance of a diagnostic if there isn't a gold standard or a reference standard to work against? So Kenny, that's a difficult question. I'll, I'll ask you first, but I'll share it around as well. Thank you for the question. Um, yeah, so when there are so many diagnostic tests and platforms nowadays, and I think they have attracted a lot of attention, Due to the COVID pandemic, and the best way to have to know the performance is to compare to some gold standard, so such as PCR, which is the the gold standard that we are using right now. So if you want to avoid the the comparison against a gold standard, I think um, you need to have something like digital or like it's a binary output, yes or no, so you can have a Droplet, uh, for, for example, droplet PCR, digital PCR, something like that could avoid the need of a uh, standard core, for example, for quantification because it's uh, binary output. But uh, otherwise, I think it's very important to have uh, a standard to compare to, to have the, the right sensitivity and specificity because that could be also challenging depending on what you compare to, you may have a better specificity or sensitivity and that might lead to then not the expected uh, performance of the test. It's spectacularly difficult getting new diagnostics into <laughs> widespread use and um, indeed the finances of those are also very challenging. But thank you for that. You. Marisa, there was a question from your presentation about whether your model, the hospital utilization model, is generalizable. The not yeah, so not the the one that prioritizes patients to hospital. I assume so. I suppose that's the one. Yeah. So yes, I mean it, it generalizable, but it depends on what the question means. So the model can be deployed in every country. Uh, you need to calibrate it to, of course, to country level data. 
and uh, it relies intensively on the type of data that we have in England, um, that is to observe cohorts of patients and their characteristics over time. But basically, that's it. And then it can be, um, yeah, it can be fed uh, from that type of data to any other type of country. Yeah, and you know, it, it it's it generalizable beyond the pandemic to the extent to which uh, we look at all disease areas. Of course, the model makes sense uh, in contexts where capacity is constrained. Uh, otherwise, there's not much to prioritize. Um, but yeah, it could it could be used, for example, to look at peaks of demand, uh, things like seasonal influences, where we know that you know some care providers are a bit more constrained and decide what to prioritize and who to put on hold waiting for care. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. And so, it's open source, so anyone can use it. <laughs> cool. Excellent. Peter, last week Merck went big on molnupiravir, mm. uh, which they claims reducing mortality by 50% in, uh, in patients with COVID-19. This was a drug that failed a previous phase three trial. I wonder if you'd like to give us some comments on it. Well, it's fascinating, but all we've got so far is a press release. We haven't even got a preprint, so I think we really need to wait and see the data and i think maybe the way they've set up the trial was to um was to give um rapid intervention where there's more more possibility of an antiviral working i, I think you know i'd also like to know a lot more about about safety um i mean this is a pretty fundamental uh, interference with the rna system that they've developed and I'm, 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 you know, I'm surprised it's as safe as they say it is. So I think we need to learn, know a lot more. I think we've all been a bit disappointed by antivirals for acute viral illnesses like flu. You know, uh, oseltamivir is actually a very good antiviral, but has relatively restricted place in the clinical management of influenza unless you start it early and in the right people. So, you know, I think we need we need to go beyond the press release on this one. OK, we'll look forward to, um, to hearing about that. Yeah. <clears throat> um, do you all sense that the. The um, extraordinary amount of science that's been in the newspapers and in the media generally because of COVID over the last 18 months has been overall good or bad for science generally? Do you think it's, it's raised awareness and knowledge? Do you think the funders have really taken attention to this? Or do you think there will be a sort of, um, there, there will be a, a resistance to it? Peter. Well, I think it's been fantastic. I think it's wonderful that the public is so much more alert and educated in terms of science. You know, it's, um, I, I cannot really believe that the downsides are significant compared to the upsides. I mean, I remember 20 years ago, it was barely possible to find any science on TV or radio that wasn't trivializing or turning it into a joke. And actually we've got the plethora of wonderful science communicators now, you know, Brian Cox being amongst them, you know, who are really turning the public on to science in the most extraordinary way. So I, th I think it's good, but I'd love to hear what other people think. No, Robin. I think from the. Robin, then Marisa. You're muted, Robin. Muted. <laughs> I agree with Peter, but I think we need to remember that the, that the media itself can be very fickle and uh, we've seen it turn against science um, uh, and come back again. And I suspect there may be a cycle. Um, but I also think that we need to be careful, particularly in terms of the pandemic setting, in that I already get the sense from uh, people making decisions that they feel that the pandemic is under control and that actually the danger is, um, as time goes by, instead of learning and building on what we've, uh, what's come out of COVID-19, people will relax, uh, the funding will go away, and will be tripped up again the next time around. I'm thinking particularly of comments that Faith was saying about access to COVID vaccines. Well, we've not got it right this time. Uh, we've really got to make sure that everything is there so that the next pandemic, we do get it right, 
or it, it, you know, it's really going to be held against us. And I don't mean against the scientists, I mean against the, the funders and the policy makers. I think that's very disturbing. Marisa? Yes, I was going to say that, yes, I think, you know, the public is much, much more open for science and and that I think it has been positive amidst all the the bad um, uh, media coverage that we have we have observed. But I think also for us as academic community, it has been tremendously important because I, I've never seen, at least as a social scientist, a collaborative efforts to the scale that we have experienced in during the pandemic, where you suddenly go to a room of with 40 scientists that you've never met from totally different areas and we work together towards a common goal that is to improve people's lives. I think that's been terribly uh, important and I think those, you know, the collaboration to that scale will, will last uh, hopefully over time. I think the challenge for funders is, you know, we work to some extent on a reactive mode in many research areas and, you know, funding was channeled uh, because we had an emergency to handle. But I would like to see from funders something a bit more, you know, more blue sky type of funding to, to so that next time we have a pandemic, we are a bit more equipped and the research infrastructure and the collaboration is already there and funded um, to some extent. Look, thank you. And I'd really like to sincerely thank all five of the presenters for this last session this afternoon for a really fantastic session. And I'd like to really congratulate Charles and Jake for a spectacular seminar today and for the introductory comments and roundtable yesterday afternoon as well. So we're out of time for this session. So I turn sadly now to Jake, I think, uh, who's going to give some final remarks. Jake. Thank you so much, Jonathan. And uh, I'm going to get to the specific thank yous um, in a moment, uh, but I wanted to just give a very broad thank you to everybody involved. You know, one of the key ideas we had when we set up the Institute was really to to walk the walk of, of what we wanted the Institute to be right from its inception. And I think today has really been a showcase of that, of the amazing diversity of you know, having ec economists, chemists, engineers, clinicians, biologists, and also many people who we wanted to give a, a platform to, but we just didn't have the time to. Um, so if your science wasn't presented today, that's not because we we don't acknowledge you exist. It's it's actually that we, we we'd love to do these regularly. Um, and in, and you know the the way that scientists across Imperial are rising to the challenges of infection research, and maybe by sort of some weird wordplay in my head, I was reminded of the Challenger disaster um, in 1986, um, where engineers couldn't resolve why this space shuttle blew up. And in trying to address that great challenge, it was actually a physicist, Richard Feynman, who had the uh, insight to really work out what had gone wrong in terms of the O-rings. And it's really that out of the box thinking that we really want to encourage somebody with a different perspective coming into your science or you coming in somebody else's science to really sort of nucleate and crystallize um, new ideas. Um, Adrian Nager earlier this morning said that he typed in malaria and his technology into PubMed and noticed that there were very few papers on it. And I love that idea, that idea that different people maybe are following today or just in general through the Institute will start to word associate in, in ways that, that haven't been conceived before um, to really bring that kind of out of the box thinking. Um, and, and, you know, thinking about Rachel Edgar's talk on circadian rhythms. I mean, I think that opens a, a Pandora's box of thoughts about, you know, how you might want to look at a different infection um, in, a, in a sort of uh, from, from through the lens of circadian rhythms. Um, or maybe you want to throw your desired drug uh, um, to, to the likes of, of, of Anna Bernard or, 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 or Matt Child and think about uh, um, all the med chemistry and chemical biology that, that could be done. Um, or indeed the, the incredible potential of controlled human infection uh, models. I mean, they're extremely challenging to do, very costly, but they're, ex you know, the, the, the reward of being uh, from, you know, immunology and host response is really phenomenal to be able to, to do that under, under control conditions. Um, and, you know, an area we haven't had the, uh, the, the time to showcase today, but is, you know, many of us are sitting on complex data sets and being able to throw um, artificial intelligence, machine learning, or, or just complex mathematical approaches to deal, or, or just mathematical approaches to deal with this complexity of data, I think is really, really important. And that's where having a community with different expertise can 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 really be a, a, a phenomenal sort of uh, gain. 
Uh, and finally, also, you know, to point to the, the way the Institute really hopes to make linkages with other communities. You know, climate came up this morning. Um, there'll be other areas where we really want to um, interact. And I think those are really areas where we, we can grow. So I'd give a big shout out to, to get involved with the community. If you want to be part of the Institute, we, we're, 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 we're definitely inclusive. We really want everybody to be involved. Um, there's a sign up page on the community web page of, of the Institute of Infection website. Uh, you can follow us on Twitter, um, inst under, underscore infection. Um, the, the, most of it um, will be, will be um, uh, most of what we're doing will be advertised through the website or through the Imperial College newsfeed. So, so just to say some specific thank yous, I really want to give a, a, a big thank you to all of our speakers, to all of the chairs. It's been a really phenomenally smooth day um, um, and uh, um, really, really interesting. And combined with yesterday, I think we've really showcased some of the amazing work that's going on in college that we hope will really be the bread and butter of, of what the Institute really, really stands for. I want to say a specific thank you to Sam Phillips, who's really managed the AV amazingly today. Really uh, uh, fantastic. And, and thank you very much for that. To the events and communication team, in particular Christine Taylor and uh, Ellie Evans, have been really helpful in getting us uh, to this point. I want to thank the uh, um, uh, several people who have been manning the Twitter feed today, but in particular John Tregoning and Julia McKinney. Uh, um, thank you very much for keeping our social media presence live. Um, and, and finally, just to thank the, the, the I guess we, we could call them the Institute Nerve Centre team, uh, which has been the, 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 the key people who've really been help, um, uh, helping everything to do with the Institute, but in particular the launch event. And that's Al McCartney, Shona Blair, and, 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 and of course our Institute manager, Mel Bradnam, who's really been, who's really, you know, we should be thanking for today. It's really been her efforts. So I'll end there and I'll hand over to Charles to say a few closing words, but, but thank you again from me for sure. Thanks very much. I'll I'll be I'll be brief. We started off yesterday by saying that the purpose of the Institute of Infection is to foster and promote interdisciplinary research in infection. We knew that many people in college are already involved in interdisciplinary research on infection, but I think even we have been really surprised by the extent of the, the depth and the breadth of the interest in this. And I think this very strongly endorses and reinforces our, our, our mission to set up the Institute to extend and facilitate this and to bring the people together from the different constituencies, the different disciplines. I'd like to add briefly my, my um, uh, thanks and, and agreement also to Peter and to Faith for their positive view on the outcome of uh, the, the effect on science and its ex acceptance by the public. In my view, it's unquestionably been a net positive. I think there have been many surveys that demonstrate this. I think it's also important to remember there has always been, uh, an, for example, an anti-vax movement, even since in Jenner's day, it's been very well established and, and it was known very, uh, it was very prominent in the 19th century. So this is not new. And I think the lesson is, it, this is not a battle that you win and then you convince everyone that science is the best approach to a rational application and learning of knowledge and you then can relax. It's a constant effort that we all have to make and it's really important to make sure that we constantly we do this to the public. And as Faith said, one of the most effective and important ways to do this is education. We need to get them young. If people are educated from the early stage, then it's much, much better and much more effective. So thank you again to everyone involved. I'll, I won't uh, list the people again that uh, Jake has just listed. We went, we, we mentioned them yesterday, but it really is important to uh, understand the amount of hard work that they've all put in. So thank you again to the speakers, chairs and the organisers. And we hope to see you again at our next focus symposium and the seminar. Thank you.